Okay, good morning, uh, everybody online and uh, a few people here in, uh, in the room. Welcome uh, to the second veterinary big data stakeholder forum. So following up on the, the meeting that we had uh, last year, which was the first one, uh, and uh, the developments uh, in between, I would like to uh, open this meeting, uh, looking forward to having a, a fruitful discussions today and some very good presentations. I will brief you on that later. But before we start, I would like to give the uh, floor to uh, Imer Cook, the Executive Director of the European Medicines Agency, uh, who will give her a welcome speech. Imer, you got it. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, it's hardly a welcome speech, but it is a very good morning and welcome to this uh, stakeholder forum. Um, it's really a great pleasure uh, for me to welcome you to this second one, uh, building on the success of last year's yeah, last year's events. And I'm really delighted to welcome all the veterinary stakeholders around this virtual table so that we can resume discussions on how new digital technologies can foster veterinary regulatory activities and, public, and animal and public health. Of course, this year is a big year. The successful implementation of the veterinary um, medicinal products regulation earlier in uh, end of January has allowed regulators to collect and exchange additional data in the area of veterinary medicines regulation, pharmacovigilance, and shortly uh, to be extended also to the use of antimicrobials in addition, uh, in addition to, to um, uh, this, the antimicrobial sales. So it's really a, a very timely opportunity to look at how together we can examine these data and transform them into sustainable regulatory actions with the aid of innovative digital methodologies. I think it's also very important that this event is happening during World Antibiotic Antimicrobial Awareness Week. And while antimicrobial resistance uh, um, is a, a challenge all of the year, it's important that we do dedicate some time to raise awareness of the challenges and to see if we can uh, initiate and uh, uh, discussions to try and combat some of the, the, um, uh, the, the challenges that we see. Um, if we can do that, we will, of course, be able to reduce the emergence of drug resistance pathogens. And in one of the sessions today, uh, you will have concrete discussions on how data can be used to predict antimicrobial resistance associated with specific use of veterinary medicines. And if this is successful, this will be a big step forward for different stakeholders to act upon this, what we call the silent pandemic. And it'll help, it could help enable veterinary practitioners to adapt treatment uh, practices to reduce antimicrobial use or also industry and uh, researchers to invest in developing specific uh, medicines that in, in uh, therapeutic areas at higher risk of AMR. But in order to leverage data analytic method, methods, it's extremely important to mobilize competent expertise from across the European Union and internationally. So I'm therefore very pleased to note the high interest and enthusiasm that this forum has, has raised globally and the variety of stakeholders that are involved. I think we have currently more than 300 colleagues connected, and this includes representatives of the pharmaceutical industry, animal healthcare professionals, academia, research industry, uh, research institutions, regulatory authorities, and other national and international government bodies. I'm really confident that today's discussions, building on the discussions last year, will really pave the way for a fruitful collaboration and set the priorities for cooperative actions. And I, I'm excited to see that this, this discussion is ongoing. So with that, I'll hand you over to back. In fact, uh, I'll leave you in the capable hands of Dr. Ivo Klassen, who already opened this conference. Um, and I really wish you very, very successful discussions. It's, it's an important uh, topic. We're doing a lot here, and we need to do more. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, Emer, uh, for your welcome uh, and, and the kind words and the introduction to today's uh, meeting. I think the, the scene is being set right now. Um, and also, thank you to all the participants that join uh, uh, this second Veterinary Big Data Stakeholder Forum. Um, in the course of today's event, I, I hope we will all together be open-minded in listening to the initiatives on big data presented to our speakers. And I also hope that we've got some time for uh, discussion and, and share views uh, on what big data can bring to us. And last year's event was the first opportunity to build awareness on the use of innovative digital technologies in the veterinary domain and, and to also share ambitions, opportunities for the development of a, a pan-European veterinary big data strategy. And today's presentations and discussions, I hope, will take us uh, from vision to action by, by scrutinizing a set of concrete use cases to guide further discussions on how we can respond to the fast-changing <clears throat> data-driven environment and how to prepare ourselves for the challenges uh, ahead. Today's program is structured around three sessions. <clears throat> the first session focuses on informing on advancement in the area of big data in the medicines regulatory domain in the European Union since last year's event, also involving uh, human uh, medicines. Afterwards, we will explore concrete insights on the use of digital technologies in key regulatory areas, such as veterinary medicines availability, pharmacovigilance, disease monitoring, and antimicrobial resistance. And the real question here is, can big data and advanced digital technologies support the forecast of veterinary medicines availability and shortages, inform on alternative treatment plans, and the need to fill therapeutic gaps? Also, can integration of data increase the efficiency in safety risks monitoring and power harmonization of safety outcomes? <coughs> and can data analytic methods be used to identify emerging threats and set risk management priorities in the area of antimicrobial resistance? And these are some of the questions that we will explore in session two. And I invite the audience to reflect and comment on the benefits, obstacles, and the recommendations that our speakers will share today on how we can integrate big data into regulatory decision making to support the development of innovative, me innovative me uh, medicines and optimize safe and effective use of medicines, because that's indeed what the, the objective is. Last session and final session will be an opportunity to hear from other European and international partners, as well as from academia on a number of initiatives showing the application of digital technologies in cross-sectoral areas, such as food, and feed risk assessment and sharing successful stories from the implementation uh, of the World Animal Health Information System and how digitalization is paving the way for development of a digital global information and alert system for areas such as disease monitoring, antimicrobial resistance and falsified veterinary uh, medicinal products. During session three, we will also hear examples of academia-led initiatives supporting the development and application of data-driven decision-making tools for the benefit of animal and public health. I think we all know that the, the data landscape in animal health is evolving uh, and developing at a very fast pace. And, and the regulatory system needs to evolve and adapt too, so that we can realize opportunities for animal and public health and innovation through better evidence for decisions on the development, authorization, and on-market safety and effectiveness monitoring of vaccines, and specifically for novel uh, products. We hope that the discussion today will further guide uh, the EU veterinary medicines uh, regulatory network to embrace the potential that digital technologies can bring and identifying priorities in implementing specific solutions to support regulatory activities and evolve into data-driven practices. So, I would like to end my uh, presentation by, or introduction by wishing you all productive discussion. And I would like to hand over to Professor Thomas Heber, uh, head of the department at the Federal Office of Consumer Protection and, and Food Safety, BVL in Germany, who will represent the HMA management group in his opening remarks and share his views. Uh, Thomas, I see you online. Uh, you're ready for your presentation, so you have the floor. 
Thank you, Ivo, and thank you, Ima, for the introduction. Also from my side, a very warm welcome to all the participants joining today. It is actually incredible that it's already more than one year ago since the first veterinary big data stakeholder forum, but it is also amazing that what has been achieved during this year in 2021, the veterinary big data strategy was only a draft and the forum was organized to gain more uh, input from stakeholders on the basic ideas of such a veterinary big data strategy. Additionally, it was also used to get fe a feeling on the current status of applying new digital technologies using big data in different fields of the veterinary domain for regulatory reasons as well as in practice and on the ideas as well as implementation of advanced analytics in the veterinary domain. I hope everyone participating last year agrees that the forum was a big success and of course uh, the number, large number of participants underlies this year uh, that this is also probably in line with my recognition. In the meantime, the veterinary big data strategy has been finalized. A workshop has been held in May this year, discussing the next steps necessary for the implementation of the strategy was, and finally, the strategy was adapted both by HMA and by EMA CBMP in June. With the adaption of the, by EMA as well as by HMA, the importance of a joint data management strategy for both organizations was underlined. It furthermore highlights the need to work together in order to start into a new era of veterinary medicinal product regulation. Cooperation and mutual support is mandatory, but not only between EMA and HMA. I want to emphasize that all stakeholders should be ready to contribute to fill this framework of the veterinary big data strategy with more ideas and initiatives, industry as well as academia, other agencies such as FDA, but also stakeholders from domains like EMA Human Division or EFSA or even NGOs. This holistic and overarching approach is also depicted in the agenda for today's meeting. Especially the second session focuses on the next steps on those use cases that might be implemented within the next years. While priorities may slightly differ between different stakeholders, the overall feedback we got from there is a high interest in advanced analytics, optimization of processes and utilization of existing data to prevent any VMP shortages in the future and optimize pharmacovigilance. We will thus improve safety of products, but also further uh, the AMR surveillance and management. And within the One Health concept, also ensure that efficient antimicrobials are still available for future generations without compromising treatment options. This meeting is meant as a kickoff to support the implementation of the VET big data strategy regarding VMP marketing authorizations, pharmacovigilance and AMR management. Now it is our task to make it happen, to work together between NCAs, EMA and all concerned stakeholders. We are trying nothing less than a revolution of veterinary medicinal products regulation Dialogues and open discussion would be of the uppermost importance, but also to have an open mind. We should also be aware that compromises will be necessary and pragmatic approaches will be required. But following the adaption of the EU veterinary big data strategy, it is now time to move from vision to action, as Eva also stated, and we will shall be welcome this forum as an opportunity to discuss share and listen to what stakeholders see as priorities and potential contribution to make this happen. That said, I want to thank Ivo and his team for taking on the task again and organizing this forum, which I am sure will again expand our horizons on what may be feasible in the near future. Now it is a pleasure to hand over to Ivo again and the first session on advancements in area of big data and digitalization. Thank you so much for having the opportunity to speak right here and I'm really looking forward to this meeting. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Thomas, for uh, that introduction and for sharing the HMA vision and, and really setting the ambition for veterinary big data. Uh, I think it's really helpful and it really helps us in 
energizing the meeting today and setting um, the scene and the way forward. Um, before I move on to the, the first session, uh, which I will be chairing, uh, my team has asked me uh, to uh, share with you some housekeeping rules, so that's what I'm going to do now, always the best part of the day. Um, uh, I would like to inform you that all presentations will be made available on uh, the EMA website in due time. Also, the event is, is being recorded, and by participating, you uh, agree uh, with that. If you do not, unfortunately, we have to ask you to leave, and you may follow via the broadcast. The recordings will be made available on EMA's YouTube channel in due time, so to give the opportunity to people uh, that cannot be here today to uh, look at the, the day. If you cannot hear, please leave the meeting and log in again. Uh, make sure you selected the correct audio outputs. Please use the chat to report any technical issues sending the message to the host. And uh, I must inform you that by default we have muted all attendees, but if you ask for the floor, uh, you will be given. Questions can be typed into the chat, located in the lower right corner of your screen. And when using the chat box, please ensure that you send the message to everyone, as we cannot monitor private interventions. At the end of each session, we have allocated time for audience discussion. And if you would like to ask a question, please raise your hand. And if the moderator gives you the floor, you will be unmuted uh, by the host. Moderator will give the floor in a way that tries to balance stakeholder groups and respect time constraints and we may not be able to give the floor to everyone. Uh, due to time restrictions, we may not be able to read your comments during the meeting, but please be assured that we will read them all and we will address them after the event. Um, and if you would like to tweet from the event, you may mention EMA's account at EMA News and use the hashtag uh, VetBigData. Uh, and with that, um, I would like to progress into the first session, <clears throat> which I have the uh, um, pleasure of chairing. And the first speaker uh, in the session will be uh, Dr. Ricardo Carapetto, who will um, inform us about the highlights of last year. Uh, Dr. Carapetto is a veterinarian with more than 10 years of experience in the regulatory field of veterinary medicines. Uh, he combines his work as head of service of Enver environmental risk assessment at the Spanish Agency um, with the participation in the CVMP as co-opted member and in the CVMP Environmental Risk Assessment Working Party, where he is the current chair, and he has been actively contributing to developing uh, the veterinary big data strategy in the European Union. Um, Ricardo, I see you are uh, connected, so I give the floor to you. Welcome. Uh, thank you very much, Ivo, for the presentation and, and for inviting me to to, uh, uh, to make this presentation. And, and, and thank you, everybody, for, for joining the uh, this uh, uh, interesting meeting. Uh, I hope it will be very fruitful. So, so uh, well, my presentation is already in the screen. Uh, what I want to give now is like a highlight of what we have been doing uh, for the last year since we had the previous a forum until uh, this moment in time. So first, uh, um, I wanted to start as a reminder, uh, because maybe some of you weren't there, and one year has already uh, passed on the key conclusions from the uh, previous forum, the first one that we, that we had. Well, in there, we uh, it was acknowledged that the regulatory uh, network had to, to to uh, focus uh, its efforts on the on the implementation of the new veterinary regulation that was uh, um, already mentioned by uh, uh, Emma Cook. Um, 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 that is still the case, but uh, uh, well, the, 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 the field is already more clear uh, because of all the work that has been uh, doing and we are progressing on the implementation, so we are starting to have more um, uh, uh, free time, let's say. Um, also, it was acknowledged that big data was already happening uh, because of the uh, interventions that we had uh, during the, the stakeholder forum. Uh, we noticed that uh, 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 even if uh, regulators don't do anything, uh, uh, this is already uh, uh, happening. And sooner or later, we will have um, 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 uh, dossiers in, 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 on our desks uh, using this new uh, digital technologies, and, and we uh, need to be prepared for, for that. Um, 
uh, it was also uh, recognized and, and we agreed to to uh, proceed uh, in that way to that, that uh, we needed uh, the veterinarians the veterinary domain uh, needs uh, um, uh, uh, a big data strategy um on those days as thomas Peverer has mentioned it was still a draft uh, uh, but we um, have progressed uh, in that in that and in the fall in the in the forum in the first forum um, uh, it was agreed that we should uh, uh, proceed that way uh, and to develop this uh, strategy. Uh, it was also acknowledged that we have some um, um, uh, difficulties uh, ahead that we have to work on, um, uh, as for example, building a data, data mindset and identify expertise. As a, uh, it's not something that has been um, uh, still applied in the regulatory framework, and, and we need to, to be prepared for that uh, by, by preparing first of all, our minds uh, to these uh, uh, new technologies um, and looking for expertise to, to um, uh, be more efficient uh, um, uh, in what we do in the future. Also, um, it was necessary, it was found necessary to, to establish international cooperation forum, uh, speaking with uh, uh, colleagues from, uh, from other uh, regulatory frameworks outside the European Union and uh, usually transatlantic uh, colleagues, but not, uh, not only. Um, identify which would be the governance of all this uh, uh, scheme uh, and identify uh, funding and resources, which is always uh, uh, a difficult but uh, very necessary uh, uh, part of any, any uh, future project. Can we go to the next slide, please? Yeah, thank you very much. So, uh, in the last year, what has uh, uh, happened? Well, first of all, uh, the big data steering group, uh, group uh, uh, has already uh, released and, and approved uh, uh, its new uh, work plan covering the, the, the uh, 2022 to 2025 uh, period. Um, for those of you that doesn't know it, the big data steering group uh, is a group that was uh, initially created for human uh, uh, medicines, but for from the very beginning of this uh, um, steering group and Peter Arlet will uh, tell you something else about this uh, in the next presentation. Uh, from, from the very first beginning of the creation of this uh, steering group, it was found necessary that the, um, the veterinary domain should be uh, on board. And that's why uh, basically I'm here because they, they went to the CVMP, but also the competent authorities uh, looking for somebody to liaise with the um, um, big data steering group. Uh, and there was a, a specific part of the um, of the different topics that they aim to to uh, to or we aim to to develop uh, that is uh, specific for for vets. Uh, this work plan has already been released, um, uh, and uh, well, I just wanted to, to raise the, um, uh, the issues that uh, well, you can see the, the snapshot in the in the screen, but I just wanted to to raise uh, some issues that I think are of higher importance for for us for for the vets. Um, uh, that uh, first of all, we uh, uh, notice that uh, many of the things that are um, uh, on implementation uh, uh, for humans are also of interest for for vets, and we have to look for synergies uh, um, uh, to apply also in our field. Um, uh, we had to to identify the key areas uh, that which which may uh, benefit from from uh, advanced digital technologies. And in that sense, uh, not only those uh, from which we might obtain higher benefits, but also uh, um, uh, taking into account those um, uh, key areas that are more prepared for, for implementation of any of these technologies. Um, and it was found necessary, uh, and I, I think it is uh, uh, important to identify uh, which are um, the, the data sources from which uh, the veterinary uh, domain can, uh, can drink. That is something, as I will tell you now, uh, is also ongoing. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, uh, big, uh, European Veterinary Big Data Strategy, as I said uh, in the last forum, uh, it was agreed to, to, to proceed and it was found necessary to, to uh, have this strategy already in place. And it is now uh, in place. Uh, finally, it was adopted by HMA and, and, and EMA in June 2022. For those of you that are not familiar with the with the terms, uh, HMA is a kind of framework that gathers all the national competent authorities, the, the 
uh, national uh, agencies, uh, authorizing medicines, and EMA uh, uh, is like the uh, coordinating uh, uh, between us and um, uh, at least for the scientific part, uh, and also has the, um, uh, the um, uh, competence in, in, in centrally authorized, uh, it's also competent authority basically. So uh, these are the two uh, um, uh, um, organizations, let's say, that were uh, that adopted the big data strategy. And in that strategy, we defined um, uh, which will be the framework or the infrastructure upon we should build the, uh, uh, the, the, the use of these um, advanced technologies um, for the next uh, five years or so. Uh, for Doing that, we defined in the in that strategy several pillars are the ones that you can see in the, in the screen. First of all, uh, we made like a brainstorming uh, um, uh, of different regulatory business uh, use cases where uh, these technologies uh, could be uh, applied, and they go beyond uh, the regular um, dossier like safety, efficacy, environmental risk assessment, etc., pharmacovigilance, um, and also take into account. Uh, 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 Potential use on availability, uh, inspections, etc. Uh, another pillar is the, the data literacy, um, uh, because um, um, uh, we're uh, or the regulatory agencies have not foreseen yet the use of this kind of uh, um, uh, uh, technologies, and and of course um, uh, we need um, uh, to improve our our literacy on 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 data, um, and uh, uh, and also to uh, try to to find and identify all the uh, expertise across the European Union, so we can, as I said before, be more efficient. And for that, uh, it is mentioned the creation of a, a EU veterinary data hub. Um, the stakeholders are defined, and also the the, the landscape framework, uh, where we give some uh, high level definition of uh, um, uh, data sources, standards, quality, etc. And the uh, uh, last point, but not less of less importance, is the, uh, the governance. All these are the things that are defined in the veterinary big data strategy, which is already adopted, as I said, and it's available for your consultation. Uh, in the, uh, next slide, please. Uh, on training, as I have said already several times, it's uh, really important that we improve uh, 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 the training and we increase the expertise across the uh, regulatory network. Uh, so in there we see that we can benefit from the human side because uh, um, uh, um, there might be assessors at the same level of knowledge and there is a lot to be shared between the two uh, domains. Um, uh, it has been launched a survey or several surveys to identify uh, knowledge gaps from the assessor's view uh, because that is fundamental to, to give targeted um, uh, uh, trainings. Um, and in the EU NTC, this like the, the, the um, uh, well, the place where assessors go to 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 get their trainings uh, that is hosted by the European um, uh, Union or, or the, the EMA, um, uh, it has already been placed a big data signpost as a way of giving us uh, um, a visibility. Um, but for the main core of the uh, uh, training scheme, it is uh, foreseen uh, uh, that uh, an outsourcing. Uh, will be needed, and uh, uh, the big data steering group is working on that. Next slide, please. Yeah, and which is in relation with research programs, uh, the projects. I, I mentioned that we, um, uh, in, as a conclusion in the last uh, stakeholder forum, is that we should look for resources and funding. Uh, and uh, um, I think that the EMA has succeeded in, in that side. And, uh, um, and there, uh, uh, so there is a uh, um, uh, some projects that are ongoing uh, uh, in relation with big data strategy. Um, so it is the procedure, not the project itself, but the procedure for assigning the, the, the uh, project, uh, um, uh, etc., cetera, um, uh, uh, to the contractors uh, is already ongoing, but it will be about data discoverability uh, and future, uh, and, and look for uh, which are the sources that we can use in veterinary domain. And um, uh, uh, another future studies that are foreseen are on metadata analysis and quality framework. And I believe that is uh, that was my last slide. So I think I'm just in time, uh, Chair. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. 
Thank you very much, uh, Ricardo, uh, for a very clear presentation. And um, there will be an opportunity to ask uh, questions to uh, R Ricardo uh, um, after uh, the next presentation. And the next presentation is about um, uh, EMA HMA Big Data Steering Group, which has already been introduced by Ricardo. So thank you for that. It bridges nicely into the, the, the next presentation. Presentation will be by uh, uh, Peter Arlett. Peter is the head of the Data Analytics and Methods Task Force here at the agency, He's the co-chair of the Big Data uh, Task Force at the European Medicines Agency. And since 2020, honorary professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. He has 25 years of experience on drug benefit risk management and delivering programs of major change in regulation and legislation. Um, his experience has been gained through organizations at national, European, and international uh, level. And so he's the right person to brief us on the Big Data uh, Steering Group. Peter, please, you've got the floor. Thanks very much. Thanks to the organizers for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, if we can bring up the slide deck, that would be great. Um, uh, the slides are relatively content rich. I will try and uh, pick out um, uh, the key points for you and uh, make it interesting and, and make it relevant uh, to the audience today. So um, I've been given the mandate to give an update on the uh, EMA HMA Big Data Steering Group work plan. Um, and um, that's what I'm going to do. If you go straight to the next slide. So I'm going to... Uh, take a step back before I get into the details of the work plan and just look at the environment we're in. So with one slide on drivers for change, I am going to show one slide, which is perhaps a, a, a medium term vision on uh, perspectives on clinical evidence. This was drafted uh, perhaps more through a human lens, but I think the perspectives are um, relevant to, to veterinary medicines also. And then I'm going to uh, go into the work of the Big Data Task Force and Big Data Steering Group um, before uh, highlighting the work plan. So let's go to the uh, drivers for change. So if we take a step back and ask ourselves, why are we working on data and why are we working more generally to improve evidence? Um, I think the first thing to say is that on the data question, we have an explicit mandate from the um, uh, Big Data Task Force recommendations, uh, which were adopted in January 2020 and published also in January 2020, the EU regulatory network strategy to 2025 has a key pillar, it's actually the pillar two of that strategy, on data and digitalization, with the recognition that um, future medicines regulation should be data driven. We have a changing policy environment with the legal proposal, particularly with the legal proposal for European health data uh, space. And we are anticipating a revision on the human side of, um, of pharmaceutical legislation with an, uh, uh, a legal proposal um, anticipated for the first quarter next year. But to put that then into the context of product development, um, we hear over and over again that there is a slow speed and high cost of product development um, and that we have a, a continued high level of unmet medical need. Um, and that perhaps is particularly in focus if we look at small populations, rare diseases, etc. Um, we have seen through the COVID-19 pandemic new ways of working. And on the human side, um, the speed at which vaccines reach the market um, the effic uh, effectiveness of those vaccines, the new business processes that were put in place as regulators to support companies to speed up the authorization and then to further enhance monitoring of products on the market. Um, it, it was a, a catalyst for better working and it was very much data-driven working, particularly uh, with the post-authorization monitoring. And finally, um, we believe there's a, an opportunity for greater healthcare data. There are opportunities from data, uh, greater healthcare data access, as well as be better study methods and advanced analytics. In other words, there's more data, there's uh, better methods, uh, and also uh, artificial intelligence, for example, as an example of advanced analytics can um, enable us to do things that we couldn't do previously. Let's go to the next slide. So um, this slide is about clinical evidence. Um, it is, um, if you look at the graphic on the right-hand side, we see clinical evidence as a cycle of planning, collecting data, applying methods to those data, that then leads to evidence which is integrated into decision-making, 
we need to have transparency associated with that uh, evidence generation and decision making, communicate on the decisions made, and then we look, need to look at the impact of the decisions made and then back into a cycle with, um, with um, uh, planning again. Um, so if we set out a vision, maybe with a sort of five-year time frame, we, we would say that we believe evidence generation should always be planned and guided by data, knowledge, and expertise. And it is not always the case today that there is uh, a good planning informed by current knowledge in terms of the design of a clinical trial, for example. Um, research questions should drive evidence choice, uh, uh, the, and that should embrace the spectrum of data and methods. What do we mean by that? Um, there is a, a rather tribal uh, debate that goes on between clinical trialists and observational uh, researchers, uh, which we find profoundly unhelpful. Um, we think that it should be the research question or the evidence gap that drives what uh, data you collect or, or analyze and the methods applied. Some things, for example, the primary uh, definition of efficacy is for certain best uh, demonstrated through a clinical trial, a randomized <laughs> clinical trial. Others, like how does a product um, perform in terms of safety and effectiveness in the marketplace, cannot be addressed through a clinical trial and can only be addressed through observation. Um, so again, the research question should drive evidence choice. We believe that clinical trials remain core, but in order to be driving decisions, they need to be bigger, better and faster. And the experience during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic showed us that in the European Union, there was a, lots of clinical trials on COVID therapeutics, for example, and uh, the vast majority of them were not big enough to uh, drive results. They were underpowered, essentially. So we need clinical trials in Europe to be bigger, better and faster. Real world evidence should be enabled and we believe its value should be established in the different use cases. And this will then be complementary to the clinical trials data. We believe the patient voice uh, should guide every step of the way. Uh, we believe healthcare systems should be supported in their choices. What do I mean by that? If we are designing a, 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 or supporting a company in the design of a, a development program, we need ideally to have a development program that can meet the evidence needs of uh, HTA bodies and, and payers, uh, as well as medicines regulators. And the holy grail would be one united development program uh, informed by the needs of those different decision makers. Um, finally, we believe that transparency is critical to um, supporting societal trust in the pharmaceutical industry, in drug development, and in medicines regulation. And the strap line here at the core of a successful uh, marketing authorization dossier is excellent clinical evidence. So we should put all efforts into uh, driving up uh, the quality of evidence so that it is excellent. Let's go to the next slide. So this is the EMA, uh, HMA EMA Big Data Task Force vision. So the task force did its work between 2017 and 2019. And as I said, its final report and recommendations were published in very early 2020. Uh, the vision was that by delivering a, a vision of a regulatory system able to integrate big data into its assessment and decision making, we can support the development of innovative medicines, deliver life-saving treatments to patients more quickly, and optimize the safe and effective use of medicines through measurement of a product's performance on the market. And that tallies actually quite nicely with what um, um, uh, Evo was saying in terms of different use cases and, um, and, and delivering evidence and, um, and, and establishing the role of big data in those different use cases. Let's go to the next slide. Now, the uh, Big Data Task Force had uh, 10, initially 10 uh, recommendations and the veterinary recommendations were then added as number 11 um, following the adoption uh, of the by the HMA of the uh, uh, vet data strategy um, and they cover you, you can see and I'll, I'll just give you the titles so Darwin EU which is a network of real world uh, data and evidence uh, for human medicines data quality data discoverability or some people would say findability using fair data principles um, skills of the EU network, business processes, the capability to an analyze, and that would include um, raw data analysis, for example, from clinical trials, but also artificial intelligence, increasing uh, the availability of, uh, of, of uh, first league expert advice on data, uh, ensuring safe um, and uh, um, secure um, and ethical data governance, 
collaborating internationally, engaging with stakeholders, and then a, a suite of specific veterinary recommendations. And just to emphasize, some things we do together, human and vet, and some things are vet specific. And I will try and emphasize as I'm going through the work plan, some of the things that will deliver for both human and vet. Let's go to the next slide. So this slide uh, is called Key Achievements in 2022, and I'll just uh, um, give you headlines, really. So Darwin EU um, is a really, is, was, is the flagship, I would say, of the recommendations from that original report. And it said, we need to establish a European network of real world data, as well as the processes um, and uh, methodologies to turn those data into evidence. Um, by running observational studies. And that is now reality. I think at lunchtime today, you will see a press release on the EMA website announcing that Darwin EU is now um, a reality. We have onboarded our first data partners from different uh, European countries, a combination of um, uh, general practice data and hospital data. And we've initiated our first four studies. Just to put this into context, by 2025, um, the plans, um, and the plans are underpinned by contracts with our coordination center, which is Erasmus Medical Center uh, in uh, Rotterdam, foresees 140 observational studies per year delivered through Darwin and delivering for decision making. Let's go to the next uh, slide or the next click. Thank you. Um, data quality and representative, really important work. Um, and I think the highlight that I would mention is that we released in September a draft data quality framework. And that is meant to apply to all uh, data that can be submitted to medicines regulators, both on the human and the veterinary side. It's quite conceptual. It introduces terminology, and you, there's some screenshots on the bottom right of the slide at the moment, um, in terms of how we can conceptualize data quality. And we think it's an important foundation for more specific, domain-specific data quality <laughs> considerations, because then we'll be talking uh, with the same language. We'll be using the same terminology, have a common understanding. Because at the moment, whenever I talk about data, everybody says data quality is very important. And if you drill down into what they mean by that, it's often very diverse as to what they perceive as data quality. So um, an important step forward. I think the consultation has just closed uh, and we'll spend the next couple of months analysing the response before we finalise that. The plan over the next year or two is to then have annexes to this data quality framework that do a deep dive into specific data areas. And I saw in Ricardo's slide data quality um, as a specific point and I put it to you now that we might want to consider having a specific annex on, on data on data or big data submitted in, in the context of assessment of, of veterinary medicines. Anyway, for discussion. Let's go to the next slide. And I click again, yeah. Um, so let's talk about data discoverability. If we, uh, if we want to leverage healthcare data, uh, farm data, whatever it is, we need to know what data are out there um, in order to be, identify the best data source to do a particular study. Also, by understanding the data that's out there, it helps us to interpret studies and study res reports when they come in. Um, and uh, I think we were, the, as far as I know, the first regulator on the planet to publish a list of metadata. Now, um, they are not specific to uh, veterinary medicines, but I suspect the foundation will be common to human and vet. At the moment, I, I, think, it's, I think it's fair to say it's a, it's a human-specific metadata list. And... Um, we have also launched in September a, meta, a, a, a good practice guide for using real-world metadata um, in, um, in medicines regulation. And that, again, the public consultation has just closed and we'll be analysing the results over the next couple of months. We would anticipate, and again, it was in Ricardo's slide, work on metadata in the VET domain over the next couple of years. Um, and maybe we can learn from the human experience um, um, uh, to, to make that uh, uh, an efficient uh, and focus process on the vet side. Let's have another click. What about network skills? Well, again, I, um, Ricardo mentioned this. Um, we are doing quite a lot of uh, training within the network, but given that many of the areas in, in big data are new areas where the, veterinary, where, where the human and veterinary regulatory networks 
have perhaps limited skills in some areas, we have um, launched te uh, public tenders to get external service providers uh, to be providing some of that. Um, we believe that um, starting in the first quarter in 2023, in fact, we have high confidence that starting in the first quarter of 2023, the first training modules will start to be rolled out in different data science and in observational methods, real-world data, real-world evidence. Um, later on next year, we also anticipate biostatistics and clinical trials um, training modules to start rolling out, but that's an, on a slightly slower track. Let's go to the next slide. In terms of EU network processes, the main work over the last uh, year or two has been on real-world evidence, so using electronic health records, using insurance data, using registries um, in uh, regulatory decision-making. We have been running pilots through the different EMA committees on the human side, so the Orphan Committee, the Paediatric Committee, the Scientific Advice Working Party, the Committee uh, on Advanced Therapies, the Committee on Human Medicinal Products, and the Pharmacovigilance Risk Assessment Committee, and all of those work the work plans of all of those committees explicitly have pilots um, are, are using real-world evidence. And essentially, the secret is to identify the, the, the need, the evidence gap, um, identify those evidence gaps that could be addressed using uh, real-world data, and then to run a study, and then to feed the results back into the decision-making. Um, and that's what we're doing. I won't go through the detail, but there are three broad areas that we find in terms of use cases. One is supporting the planning and the validity of applicant studies. Another is understanding clinical context. So if you have a clinical trial in a particular disease, um, does the population studied represent the same population that is, that is out in the European community or not, for, just by way of example. And finally, to associate, investigate associations in, and impact. So um, safety um, causality studies would be one example. Effectiveness of vaccines might be another example. Let's click again. So the EU capability to analyse recommendation is a complex recommendation with subparts. Um, but what I would emphasise a couple of highlights from 2022 is that we have launched a pilot with the Committee on Human Medicinal Products on raw data analysis uh, from clinical trials. Uh, we are planning to analyse 10 dossiers over the next two years uh, where a company with an initial marketing authorization application or an extension of indication submits the raw data from the clinical trials. That's then analyzed um, as part of the, uh, the main assessment. Um, and then we will analyze both the practical aspects, but also the added value, hopefully added value, of looking at the data in addition to the traditional assessment, which would have been based on, on information rather than data. Um, we have had the first um, application um, has come in with, with that pilot and is kicking off right now as we speak. Uh, we are working on an artificial intelligence reflection paper, which I believe um, should be applicable to the veterinary area. Um, we have a really interesting piece of work which has been led by the Danish medicines agencies, which we call clusters of excellence. And essentially it's sharing of good practice between different um, specialist uh, functions within the national competent authorities. And we're also um, working to support various Horizon Europe research projects. And there's a specific um, suite of projects that are just um, being funded now by uh, DG Research of the European Commission, uh, looking at new methods in analysis of real-world data. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, the next area to talk about in terms of achievements uh, in 2022, and this is human specific, is the establishment of a methodologies working party on the human side. For me, that is a huge step forward um, because previously we have had um, disparate expert groups. We've had one on biostatistics, one on modeling and simulation, one on extrapolation, one on pharmacokinetics, and we've now put this all together and filled the gaps on real world evidence and artificial intelligence to have a methodologies working party that can oversee methodologies uh, collect <laughs> collectively. And we believe that's also very important strategically in terms of not having a divided world that is clinical trialist versus observational. Um, let's go to, uh, next click. In terms of governance framework, um, a couple of things to flag. Um, we are reviewing the terms of reference of the Big Data Steering Group, as well as a group called the EU Network Data Board, which focuses, so the Big Data Steering Group focuses more on external healthcare data and secondary use of data. 
Um, and the EU Network Data Board focuses more on substance products, organizations, referentials, and if you like, regulatory process data. Um, and we are we have a mandate from the EMA Management Board and from the heads of agencies to review both of those mandates with a view to rationalization in 2023. That's ongoing. Um, also to emphasize that EMA, as well as the network, is working closely with the European Commission um, in anticipation of a European health data space and in anticipation of new human legislation on the pharma strategy. Um, so that's ongoing. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of international, this is human specific, um, but we had a, a very successful workshop of the International Coalition of Medicines Regulatory Authorities at the end of June this year, looking at real world data and real world evidence. And a statement came out of that, and um, uh, it's it, well, you can Google it, it's on the EMA website. Um, and there are four areas for collaboration highlighted. Um, one is to harmonize uh, terminology, and we believe ICH. Um, would be uh, the place to go forward with that. And whether we need to do something with VICH is, I think, open for discussion. Um, the other is on guidances on good practice um, um, in the area of real-world data, real-world evidence. And again, some of that might be for ICH. And again, we can consider VICH. Two others. One is international collaboration and on pandemic and health crisis preparedness. And the last is on transparency. So publication of protocols and results. You know in the clinical trials area, so, uh, certainly on the human side, everything has to be publicly registered. Um, on the observational side, legislation is not so clear cut. Um, and we believe that um, it would be excellent for trust, but also driving up quality um, if we had all protocols and all results posted in a public register. Um, next, next click. So uh, finally, I won't go into too much detail, but um, we're here today doing stakeholder engagement on the VET side. Um, we are ha we have on the big uh, on the bigger agenda, if you like, on um, big data steering group. We have a stakeholder meeting on the first of December, which will also be relevant to um, veterinary medicines. And I'm sure um, if any of you would like to um, listen into that, and some of you may even want to register and take part in some of the discussions, we're fully open to that. So just let 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 us know. Um, we're also having regular discussions with the industry um, and um, we're posting information for stakeholders regularly through newsletters. Uh, we're nearly done, Evo, so let's just have a couple more clicks. Um, I'm not going to go through the VET recommendations because that's the subject of today, mm -hmm. but um, and give another click. Okay, and click all the way through. Um, and I think in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through this probably. But this is one of those beautiful build-up slides, which if you've got 20 minutes is, is fantastic. But I think we're probably over time. Um, the work plan has been published up, right up to 2025. Um, and I will leave you to look through it. Uh, it but we are going to be continuing to deliver in all of the 10 original uh, recommendation areas be it um, uh, networking to enable access and analysis of real-world data, Darwin EU, data quality, data discoverability, network skills, the process work, the capability work, expert advice, strength, further strengthening uh, governance, uh, further enhancing our international collaboration and stakeholder engagement. One more click. Ah, there you go. So this is, um, yeah, go back, no, it's okay. Go back, go back to, or go forward to the next one, exactly. Go back forward, if you know what I mean. Um, um, so um, I think this is quite a nice slide, and it's sort of my summary slide. Um, if we take a, a, a couple of steps back and ask ourselves, where will we be in 2025 with our transformation to data-driven regulation? And I think it's probably fair to say this is more through a human lens than a vet lens, but there may well be synergies. There may well be points that would apply on both sides. Um, so we believe that by 2025, the use of real-world evidence will have been enabled and its value will have been established across the spectrum of regulatory use cases. We uh, will uh, be conducting more routinely clinical trial raw data analysis to support better regulatory decision-making. Darwin EU as a network will be part of the European health data space, de delivering evidence to support de uh, better decision-making. Data will be discoverable and of known quality and representativeness. And I didn't mention it because I skipped over the planning slide, but we aim at, by the end of next year or at the latest early 2024 to launch a new catalogue on the human side of real-world data sources, 
with quite detailed metadata in that catalogue, and that will be fully searchable. Um, it is in the planning that that will be extended by 2025 to the VET side, and obviously that will require some amendments, probably in metadata fields, but we believe we can use the synergies between the two systems. Um, EU network uh, will have knowledge and experience based on the training that I re referred to. We'll have a suite of EU and international guidelines and standards to help industry and regulators develop and supervise medicines. We will continue to have full compliance with data protection and high levels of ethics in our work on data. And we will be guided by patients and working with stakeholders to deliver data transformation to support the development and use of better medicines for patients. And I leave you with that same strap line that I started. We believe that at the core of a successful marketing authorization dossier is excellent clinical evidence. Evo, thank you. No, thank you very much, uh, Peter. And I, 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 I allowed you to finalize your uh, presentation because I think it does contain, you know, a lot of elements that uh, that we on the veterinary side can uh, can learn from and that we should take into account. Uh, my conclusion uh, after your presentation and also Ricardo's presentation is that certainly on the human side, big data is a f it's an environment that is really fast moving and uh, it is it is recognized by the network and the commission, given also the fact that there is EU funding um, uh, for it uh, available. I, I think we should look at how can we transfer that experience and best practices from the human side where relevant to veterinary use cases, obviously, and that's why we are working together on this. Uh, you mentioned the data catalog, and, and we are working on that to establish a data catalog on the veterinary side, because I think that's very useful, knowing where the data is sitting, how we can, how we can, uh, how we can use them. Network skills certainly is something that we uh, have on the radar as well, uh, which I think need to be developed in parallel with the stakeholders, industry and uh, the regulatory uh, network. Uh, EU health data space, unfortunately, very much human oriented, but I think we need something like that on the veterinary side, so we'll start lobbying with it. But I think the main message here was that it, it, it should bring benefits to patients, industry and regulators. So if I translate that into the veterinary environment, it is indeed, and healthcare professionals, I would say as well, uh, healthcare professionals, um, uh, animal owners, the animals, which are our patients, industry and regulators. And I think that should be uh, the objective because otherwise we would not, we should not uh, invest in it. Um, um, I know that we have a, a coffee break scheduled uh, right now, but I would like to give the floor to uh, uh, people uh, if they have uh, questions. Um, and I would like to uh, start with uh, uh, people connected online uh, first, if there are any questions there. And if we can't see any raised hands, then I see no one uh, in the room. Um, then I would uh, I would like to break for uh, a coffee break and um, invite everybody to be back here in the room uh, at 11 uh, o'clock uh, for session two, which is uh, stakeholders insight on key business areas, which will be chaired by uh, Dr. Sandra uh, Bertulat from BVL. And I will introduce you, Sandra, at the beginning of that uh, meeting. <laughs> Thank you very much and hope to see you all in uh, in half an hour to allow you all a break. Uh, again, uh, good morning, uh, everybody. It's 11, so we would like to start with uh, uh, session number two, the first part of session number two, uh, stakeholders insight on key business areas. And uh, I would like to start by uh, thanking uh, Sandra Bertulat uh, from BVL, who is going to moderate this session both in the morning and then again in the afternoon and give a presentation at the same time. So uh, she really uh, deserves that we are very thankful for her. Um, and uh, Sandra just uh, said to me that uh, her presentation last year was appreciated so much that expectations are really high that she will do an even better job uh, this year. Um, so no pressure here, Sandra. Um, Sandra Bertelet is a veterinarian by training and, and worked in the field of university research for several years, specializing in bovine health management as well as animal reproduction and responsible for a multitude of studies. 
utilizing data from farm management systems as well as advanced analytics. And that is the reason why we've asked her to moderate uh, these uh, sessions and also to give a presentation. She uh, joined the BVL, uh, sort of uh, the Office for Consumer Protection and Food Safety, in 2017 as an assessor and is responsible for clinical aspects of marketing authorization procedures for veterinary medicinal products. So she would be in an excellent position to link big data with uh, actual uh, use cases in there. Since February 2020, she's one out of two veterinary members of the Big Data Steering Group. The other one is Ricardo, that spoke uh, earlier today, um, and responsible for the development of the EU Big Data Strategy for the use of advanced analytics and emerging digital technologies in the veterinary domain. Also, in October 2020, uh, Dr. Bertelot was elected as member of the CVMP Efficacy Working Party. Uh, and with that introduction, I'd be very happy to hand over to you, uh, Sandra, and uh, moderate the session. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ivo. Um, a warm welcome from me also to everyone. Um, and thank you for the praise and beforehand. So now I'm just a bit nervous. No, um, we will start with a with a brief introduction to the session and. Um, um, yeah, I will outline um, the session and um, also present some survey results. Um, why do we have the survey results? Um, and um, as Ricardo um, showed um, in his presentation, the vet uh, veterinary big data strategy was um, adopted this year in, in summer. And um, the next steps um, that were planned um, for the short term phase, there was, um, beside others, the identification of um, uh, further applications for this um, big data strategy and um, to find uh, use cases. So um, uh, going to the next slide. So uh, what we did, um, we identified three key business areas um, that were pharmacovigilance, antimicrobial resistance, and uh, the veterinary medicinal product information. And with these um, three business areas, um, we furthermore were looking for use cases that might be of relevance um, to um, the veterinary domain. And um, now um, the question was, which of those should we select um, and which would benefit most um, to be uh, applied um, in, the, in the field. So um, as it was difficult to decide by ourselves, we launched a survey in September this year um, and asked for the relevance and maturity of those um, use cases. Um, and the survey was sent to different stakeholders and uh, we also got um, some answers. And um, now I want to present those. Um, going to the next slide. So actually, we do not have we did not have too much time for the re uh, respondents. So um, in total, we received forty nine uh, responses um, from the regulatory authorities as well as pharmaceutical industry and from veterinarians um, as the three major um, responders or group of responders. We also got um, responses from other animal healthcare professionals, and um, there were um, some few answers from farmers and from academia. Um, in order to um, get a better overview, we actually were uh, focusing on the regulatory authorities, the pharmaceutical industry and the veterinarians. Um, if we have a look to the next slide. Um, so you do not have to read everything up here, um, as the presentation will be presented, uh, given to you afterwards as well. Um, those are just um, the questions um, or the use cases we presented and um, all the participants were asked to rate those um, on their maturity level. Um, from one to five, and um, to um, give them an order uh, which is the most, um, has the highest priority and which we do think has the lowest priority. So um, for VMP use cases, uh, we have um, those four use cases proposed. Um, one is um, the monitoring of um, active pharmaceutical integrants and VMPs uh, to anticipate shortages. Um, then we have the second um, that saying that um, we may use um, digital technologies to extract clinical particulars um, from the product information and use this um, to, um, dis uh, to um, identify uh, medical needs. So where do we have a lack of products and where um, should it be um, further to, um, to um, invent some new products and also um, to help um, a veterinarians um, to um, decide on alternative uh, treatment plans. Um, the third and the fourth were um, uh, to um, use the clinical particulars um, to identify th therapeutic gaps. 
and um, emerging health threats. Um, so um, that's uh, coming from uh, COVID, um, uh, the COVID pandemic. Um, something like this was done in the human field. So um, this was uh, something we may um, apply for the veterinarians as well. And the fourth one was uh, new technologies, um, like in the last time, in the, la in the, in the, in the not uh, too near past, um, things like genomics, proteomics, um, were uh, developed. Um, we have a lot of loggers um, that could be used to um, to um, gather data and use those uh, data again um, for marketing authorizations, for example, but also um, to define better treatment regime, like intelligent uh, treatment plans um, linked to, uh, to to computer programs. So those were our four um, possibilities. And now going to the next slide was the results. And as I said, we are just um, um, highlighting industry, authorities, and veterinarians. So um, overall, this is the result for um, the priority. Mm -hmm. And here you see um, with, uh, how, how many percent, and yes, I know we are talking about data analysis, and we only have around 20 responses, so <laughs> do not be, um, <laughs> yeah. It's, um, so this is priority one, the highest priority. And um, what you can see is that, um, um, when we go to the next slide, that uh, for the veterinarians, so that's the, the um, upper uh, most left um, of those three bars, um, they have their highest priority or the majority priority is um, a case D, that means um, the new technologies, that is uh, uh, industry, sorry, that's um, what is most important for industry. Um, for the authorities, it's a bit more diverse. Um, we have um, A and B um, with nearly the same priority. So um, the SPCs to um, identify unmet um, medical needs, as well as um, to um, monitor shortages. And uh, for the veterinarians, we have a more or less equal, um, um, you know, more or less equal priority for um, the shortages as well as the uh, um, new technologies. When you uh, have a look on the right side, um, there you have the maturity levels. And as I said, um, Zero says um, this, uh, this uh, use case is not ready to do anything with, so it's um, really immature. And five um, is something like, okay, we can start tomorrow to apply it. Um, but overall, um, all these use cases are similar in their maturity level, at least what the stakeholders consider. And um, it's always in the middle field. So between two and three, it's um, so uh, we are not in, in, in the beginning, but um, we are not, uh, also quite some, um, some time before um, really applying it. That's for the first use case um, for the VMPs. When we go to the next slide, um, you see the second one. So that's the pharmacovigilance. Here we have, um, again, given four, uh, four um, ideas of which use cases could be of interest. Um, so um, one thing is the signal detection. Um, signal detection um, means um, the identification of uh, adverse events. Um, so um, uh, at the time um, they are um, they are allocated by marketing authorization holder, and here the idea is to implement solutions to um, compare those across marketing authorization holders, and uh, the, um, by this um, um, improve quality and um, quantity of data, or quality of results and quantity of data. Um, the second idea is to integrate um, variations and prescription practices and um, those adverse events reports um, to identify trends and um, to use this um, again to, um, to, for example, drive um, pharmacovigilance inspections and um, also to uh, monitor the compliance um, with um, P uh, P uh, pharmacovigilance um, requirements. The third one was um, the harvesting of uh, safety data from different data sources. Um, on the one hand, um, at the moment, we have just um, the signal detections and the reports that are sent by marketing association holders in the past. However, um, there is also a lot of literature um, available and um, that would be um, uh, an idea to um, use artificial intelligence to data mining um, uh, programs to uh, look for um, a safety data um, that are available. And the last one is um, the di uh, use of digital technologies uh, for an automatic safety risk assessment. Um, so that would make it easier for the industry um, to have a single routine surveillance system uh, or tool that um, enables um, yeah, um, to make a more robust decision making and not as much a case by case decision. 
So they, those were the four uh, we had for the um, pharmacovigilance and uh, having a look on the results on the next slide. Um, and going one more. Uh, here it's um, interesting that um, the uh, number 2B was um, getting quite a high priority by all three um, um, stakeholders. So the integration of um, variations, prescription, dependence, and um, um, adverse, event <laughs> adverse event reports um, to monitor the compliance and to guide, for example, uh, inspections. Um, while um, the industry um, also has a high priority for um, 2D, uh, that was uh, the use of this uh, single routine surveillance tool, um, what is understandable because it would make um, a lot of um, things easier for them. Um, for, the, um, uh, for the authorities, it um, is uh, nearly equally spread between A, B, and C. Um, and as I said, um, for the, um, um, for the uh, veterinarians, um, it's uh, mostly um, 2B that is um, of interest. Um, again, for the maturity levels, it's um, nearly the same as with the, with the uh, VMP use cases. That's between two and three, um, but uh, there's not too much um, differentiation between the use cases. And um, all of them are on their way, but there is still um, something to do before we can implement them. And going to our uh, last um, use case group, that's the EAMR. And I will not um, uh, <laughs> read everything here, because so we are just Going to the next slide, <laughs> and one more, <laughs> because as you can see, um, here only two are really of interest um, to um, industry authorities and veterinarians, and the majority or the, the huge favorite is um, 3A, and that says um, to integrate um, the um, use data with other data sources, so to combine databases um, in order to better understand uh, antimicrobial resistance development and also um, to implement risk surveillance and control protocols. So um, yeah, to, to um, develop a tool um, to better um, monitor and manage um, and, um, antimicrobial risks. Um, and just to mention it to uh, 3E here, um, 3E was also um, in favor and here it's interesting because um, there was not much difference between the three stakeholders for both. Uh, and 3E is uh, the rapid diagnostic tests and advanced um, advanced uh, analytics uh, to detect um, antimicrobial um, resistance and so um, to um, support a more um, responsible use. So here, for example, on-farm tests are meant. And um, for those, we need um, standardization and harmonization um, yeah, in order to be um, included. Um, going to the next slide. So in conclusion, what can we say um, uh, based on the survey, what, what information did we get? Um, we presented um, 13 use cases. Um, so for the VMPs, um, the most um, interesting one was to mon for, uh, overall, so uh, regarding all answers, also the one of academia and um, farmers. And the most um, uh, interesting one was the monitoring of available um, APEs and VMPs um, to anticipate shortages. Um, for pharmacovigilance, um, we have the integration of the variation data of the adverse event reports um, to prior uh, prioritize um, uh, inspections and um, yeah, use those data to investigate uh, further, for example, um, misuse. And for EMR, um, it was the uh, integration of different um, data sources and a large um, yeah, data hub um, to manage EMR. So while the priorities for VMPs and uh, pharmacovigilance um, were quite different between stakeholders, um, for EMR it was um, independent of the stakeholder um, what was chosen, um, while um, the maturity level was more or less mediocre, so between two and three, and um, that means that we have a lot of work to do there, but also a lot of opportunities. And um, what we also have is that um, there was no relationship between maturity and priority, so um, it was not... Um, the, the, the decision was not made um, uh, based on what is most mature and um, then it's the highest priority. So um, we are open here um, to decide um, what to what use cases to further. Um, and going to the last slide. <laughs> so um, that was my my introduction to this topic. Um, and based on this um, use cases and based on this um, on this um, survey. Um, we um, chose um, those um, use cases with most interest 
And um, then we ask uh, different stakeholders, um, could you give us your input on this uh, on these use cases? So we chose uh, two for each um, of these three fields, and um, then um, we were very happy to um, to um, acquire um, competent and um, competent um, speakers um, for the session um, that will uh, address those um, use cases. So on the one hand, we have um, the pharmaceutical industry, um, we have the veterinarians that will give their input, we have the animal health care professionals other than veterinarians, we have the academia and the regulators view, and also we have the view from the um, FDA, um, from the American uh, Veterinary Medicines regulators. And with that, um, I will <laughs> hand over to our first speaker, um, which is uh, Rick Clayton. Um, Rick Clayton um, is connected already, perfect. Um, Rick Clayton is having a degree in applied biology and a diploma in marketing, um, marketing. He has worked for the European Industry Association, the Animal Health Europe, A AHE, uh, since 1997. And while his background is um, the development and registration, he nowadays is uh, responsible for su supporting the smooth running of regulatory systems by furthering the dialogue with the European institutions and the regulatory network. And with that, um, I will hand over to Rick and um, the floor is yours. <laughs> That's great. Thank you very, very much. <clears throat> and good morning to everybody. Um, so in, in a moment, I'm going to take you through the uh, uh, Animal Health Europe view on where we are. But first, um, thank you for the opportunity to contribute today. Um, this is a very interesting topic. Uh, I also want to give a big thanks to the Big Data Steering Group. Um, you've, you've seen from the slides from Ricardo and Peter, they're doing a fantastic job making great progress. And um, from Animal Health Europe, we are doing our best to follow that with interest. Um, and I do attend all the big data steering group stakeholder meetings, and I am passing the information on to our membership. Um, I may not get much response from them at the moment on this topic, because although there's big interest, um, it, it's not currently a priority, as I will explain uh, as I go through my slides. Um, and also, uh, congratulations on the veterinary big data strategy, which was launched, published in June. Animal Health Europe firmly supports that, um, particularly uh, with the first identified priority of focusing on implementing our new regulation. So you have our full support. So let's go on to the uh, the next slide. Now I've called this an introduction slide, but it could equally be a conclusion slide. Um, but I wanted to be up, up front that Animal Health Europe member companies are definitely interested in this area. Um, th there is a lot of potential going forward um, and it's already happening, as everybody has said. But it's not a current priority. We haven't got the headspace at the moment to fully engage on this topic because we are fully occupied with implementing our new regulation. That is turning out to uh, be a bigger job uh, than perhaps uh, people anticipated. Um, so there's a lot of additional work there. So. Um, apologies for that. It's challenging times at the moment for us. So let's go on to the next slide. Um, because I wanted just to give a little bit of background, and I've got two slides on background, and apologies to Ilaria for this, because um, I know she wants me to get on to the, uh, the pharmacovigilance use case. But for us, this is important to explain um, to all the stakeholders who are on the, uh, on the call today who may not fully appreciate where uh, industry is at the moment with this. So we are in the process of implementing our a new regulation, which requires a, a lot of IT infrastructure, three interconnecting databases, and all the processes that have got to go along with that. Um, and the objective of 
the review of the legislation was to try and reduce some administrative burden, or one of the objectives. And the the belief is that if you have more efficient IT supported processes, then you can reduce the administrative burden for both regulators and the marketing authorization holders. The current status <clears throat> in this first year of operation um, is quite challenging, and we are facing significantly more admin burden than even before. Um, <clears throat> and we are we are hoping we will get through this period um, into sunnier times, but at the moment, um, it, it's uh, it, it's as I said, it's a difficult period. So that's probably why you have me talking to you today and not a farm conditions expert, for example. They simply did not have the, uh, the space in their agendas to, uh, to contribute. Next slide. So why did, uh, why did I give you that background? Well, um, the, the priorities, and as stated in the veterinary big data strategy, is to focus on um, implementing and regulation and the basics for regulatory data management. So at the moment, we're not even talking about big data. We're talking about getting the basic regulatory data organized and accessible. And here, <clears throat> the immediate focus has to be on improving that data quality, for example, in the union product database, um, because without it, we don't have the necessary functionality. Um, industry's priorities are business business use cases, if I can put it like that. What we are mainly talking about today is regulatory business use cases. So industry being a business um, is really interested in how big data can bring in innovative new product uh, opportunities. Uh, that's really where the focus is for us. Now, the assumptions on bringing new IT solutions through uh, in our new veterinary regulation was that it would bring efficiencies and reduce admin burden. At the moment, that is not the outcome we are seeing. Um, now, when people talk about the use of big data, again, the assumption uh, is that it will bring benefits and support regulatory decisions. I think that's absolutely true. But the reason I'm giving this background is that currently industry feels it has had its fingers burnt to some extent um, with the current IT uh, promises. And therefore, we may at the moment be taking a slightly cynical view on whether um, future uh, promises will deliver on on bringing efficiencies. So apologies for that, but that's simply where we are at the moment. So if we move on to the next slide, <clears throat> this is the uh, the use case uh, survey that was just mentioned. Uh, three main business areas, and on the screen you'll see the priorities that were selected by all the stakeholders. And next to that, you can see the priorities that were selected by Animal Health Europe. And you'll see there are two differences. <coughs> Excuse me. Everybody's well aligned, as was mentioned, on antimicrobial resistance. Um, the two differences you see there, that will be because the ones that industry has selected, the 1D and the 2D, will be more attuned to bringing benefits to industry with more efficient regulatory processes. So although we understand the value of the other regulatory use cases, and you see I use the term regulatory use case, they're not necessarily of direct benefit to industry. We definitely support these because they bring indirect benefits of a more efficient regulatory decision making. Um, for example, for, for farm covigerants, it's big interest in this, but it's not a direct uh, benefit or, or uh, a priority for industry at the moment. 
if you just click one more, um, as I mentioned, industry's priorities are really focused on the business end of things. Um, but on the regulatory side, we are very focused on bringing efficiencies to reduce administrative burden in the regulatory processes. That is our top priority. Our other priorities lie in the area of innovation. And if you look at the EMA, HMA, veterinary big data strategy, you'll see that it does touch on this area, uh, but later in the document down to, um, I think, chapters seven and eight, for example. Today, we are only talking about chapters one, two, and three. And so that's how we fit in. But we are definitely interested in how real world evidence can support product development uh, and monitoring. So let's move on to the next slide. This is just a chapter slide, if you like. I'm now going to talk about the use cases on pharmacovigilance, and I have one slide on innovation because that's where our priority is. So the um, <clears throat> top priority was 2A and the pharmacovigilance use cases, and that's to implement a solution which compares signal detection outcomes across marketing authorization holders, ensuring quality control, and obtaining harmonized safety outcomes. So industry can very strongly support this. Um, it will improve the quality and the consistency of safety assessment of pharmacovigilance data. Very, very important. And the other one that industry chose was a 2D. And why did we choose that? Well, if, if you look at the wording of this, and, and I think this was mentioned earlier as well, um, you will see it's because it has the potential to reduce workload uh, for marketing authorization holders through automation and increased efficiency. So you see where our focus is. Whereas 2B, it's not on the screen, um, that was the second prioritized item in the pharmacovigilance area. That was all to do with compliance, uh, pharmacovigilance inspections, and, and things like that. So although it's important, um, I'm sure you might realize that's not necessarily a priority for industry. This is a priority for uh, inspections and compliance. So let's move on to the next slide. Um, as I said, I haven't got any pharmacovigilance experts available to talk to you today on, on this, but let me give you some general statements uh, on what Animal Health Europe really supports, and that is initiatives that improve safety through more efficient pharmacovigilance procedures, which is why um, 2A came out on top with us as well. Um, we are very interested in, in bringing efficiencies to detecting important signals, but with the least administrative burden. So we need, we need to focus our efforts on really picking up the right signals and not get lost in the woods with um, lots of you know, all the other background noise. We also support initiatives that prioritize the basics required by Regulation 2019-6, our new regulation, and, and I've already stated this. Um, but at the moment, we are still bedding in all these new procedures that we have to deal with. Um, both industry and the regulatory authorities are very busy with this. And because of that, um, it's quite difficult for me to get any reflections out of our pharmacovigilance experts on future possibilities and future topics. Um, they simply haven't got the headspace, if I can put it like that. So if we move on to the next slide, and this is my last, um, uh, sorry. This is, I believe this is my last slide. Um, so industry is very interested in data supporting investment decisions. So what products are needed? Also data supporting product development and, and registration. So real world evidence. This really is a topic we want to explore. 
data capture, digital data capture, alternative data sources. And these have been bit, uh, commented on uh, by Peter during his presentation. So we, we are want to be in that game, most definitely. Um, behind that, there will be the, uh, the challenges of understanding not only data quality, but also how we validate these new sources of data. Industry is also interested in data supporting product use and benefits in the marketplace. So as the, have the products led to a reduced disease burden, for example, what is the impact on antimicrobial resistance? How have we improved the health and production efficiency? Have we brought animal welfare benefits? Um, and we, we hope that this will bring some positive impact to how products are assessed, assessed through the benefit risk. And there is a benefit risk guideline to health assessors um, published by the Committee for Veterinary and Medicinal Products. We take a keen interest in this guideline, as you can imagine, uh, and we hope that uh, uh, big data will bring some, some benefits in that area. Um, <clears throat> so this talks to thinking about good clinical practice trials and validation of real world evidence approaches to support the indications on the label. And with that, Scott, I thank you and I thank the audience for listening. And I, I hope um, I've given a clear picture of where industry is. I apologize, I was not able to bring much detail around the pharmacovigilance use cases, um, but we are keen to contribute once we are through the current uh, challenges of implementing our new regulation. Thank you. Um, thank you, Rick, um, for this um, all by critical presentation. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so um, I have the chance to, to answer first. <laughs> so um, actually, um, I think we all understand that um, with a new um, VET regulation, there are all, already or there are some challenges. Um, that are there for the industry, but also um, I can say from my side for the regulators as well, <laughs> and we are working on it. Um, but what I want to stress is that um, all by this is a time um, where a lot is transitioning and a, lo a lot is um, changing. Um, such a pro uh, process always um, also offers a lot of uh, possibilities and opportunities um, to improve and um, to make more fundamental changes. And um, I think, or I think we think, that um, this big, big data topic, advanced technologies, um, digitalization, will all, um, also offer a lot of chances. And um, we all should keep an open mind on it, uh, about it. Um, and um, yeah, there are hurdles um, that we have to overcome. Um, that said, um, you said um, that um, the um, that um, we did not um, follow the priorities um, that. Um, the, uh, that Animal Health Europe uh, would have uh, chosen for pharmacovigilance, for example. Um, first of all, I want to say that um, this was an overview. It was a, a survey that was available, I think, for four weeks. Um, we are uh, collecting answers, and uh, nothing is fixed here. So again, um, this is a process um, where everyone can um, give his input, um, where we can um, change um, the future together. <laughs> so. Um, the, the decision is not made, and um, this is also why we're having this forum here, uh, to get input from industry, from other stakeholders, and then um, decisions will be made, and um, we will further this process and um, look um, on which, um, which use cases are more uh, promising and which use cases are followed first. So um, just um, to, to give a, a brief um, response to your presentation. But um, now um, we are open for questions. So from the audience, um, you're invited to ask your questions by chat or by raising your hand. And um, we have five minutes now, and then we have a round table after all we have, uh, have heard all the presentations. And it's my prerogative to give the first or ask the first question to Rick, um, because you said um, 
so, uh, that um, your members are interested in big data, but it's not a priority at the moment. Um, what do you think? Um, what incentives uh, would be necessary for your members um, to um, more welcome this topic, big data, uh, digitalization, new technologies, um, and um, yeah, increase the priority? Um, would it be um, more helpful for you to have a more guideline, more... Um, yeah, more written down. I know that the FDA, for example, they have a guidance document for implementation of big data for uh, for um, studies, for marketing authorization studies. Would that help or um, do I need another incentive? Um, and what could it be? <laughs> thank you. Sandra, thank you for the question. And <clears throat> let me say we were pretty aligned on the ranking for the priorities for pharmacovigilance. We also chose the first one, um, and I simply explained why our second ranking um, came out for industry. <clears throat> I do not think industry necessarily need motivation and incentive. We are very interested in this topic, and we do see the possibilities that it can bring. All I've been saying is that it's not quite the right moment for us to actively contribute. So I think our incentive really would be to get the current implementation of the regulation done, running well, embedded in, and then we can turn our attention to future topics. I don't think we need guidelines at the moment. We are actively following what's happening um, on the human side. There are plenty of very important basic guidance coming out there, such as on data quality uh, and how you how, uh, and best practice for handling metadata, for example. Now, I might circulate though I have circulated those to our membership, and I get no replies, simply because. We are entirely focused at the moment on implementing our new regulation. We haven't necessarily got the right expertise either at the moment. We are developing that. <coughs> Excuse me. We have set up a digital and big data working group. So we are making efforts in this area. But if I look at the composition of that working group, it's largely business people. So within companies, um, any expertise there is, is usually in the business environment and not the regulatory environment. So for example, if I circulated that survey to these people, they would perhaps not relate fully to the regulatory business cases which is why at the moment uh, we might be getting low responses from the veterinary medicines uh, industry. And by the way, I call ourselves veterinary medicines, not veterinary pharmaceuticals, because in fact, vaccines is our largest product category, single category at the moment. So I, I honestly don't think we particularly need incentives. We want to get on this train. But it's just not the right moment. Thank you. No, I have to thank you um, a lot for this um, explanations. Um, that said, um, are there any more questions from the auditorium? I don't see any hands raised, Katharina? No? Um, okay, so I would think we would move on. Yeah, if there are any questions arising during the next presentations, we will come back to them in the open discussion at the end. Um, thank you, Rick, a lot for this presentation and for giving your input. Um, and so we will head on um, to uh, head on um, to the other end of the veterinary medicine, and that's the practitioners. Um, and I may introduce our second speaker, um, that is Despuina Iatridou <laughs> from Greece. <laughs> I hope the name is right. Um, she is a, po a senior policy officer from the Federal Fonder Federation of Veterinarians of Europe, um, FVE. Uh, Desperina is also a qualified uh, veterinarian in Greece and she did her PhD at the Ghent University. And um, after several years in the field, uh, she, she joined the FVE team in Brussels.
And since June 2022, she represents the Veterinarians Organization in the EMA Management Board. Uh, Deswina, the stage is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sandra, and uh, thank you for uh, this invitation to FE to participate and join this uh, uh, discussion. As said, from uh, our side, uh, I would like to share with you uh, some reflections. Again, we don't have uh, very much uh, information. Um, we are also exploring this area as profession. Um, and uh, I would like to share them, especially with regard to um, availability monitoring and unmet uh, needs and alternatives. So, uh, as I said, this presentation is, uh, includes some general reflections about the use of digital uh, technologies and also uh, provide some data about technologies in the EU and how new technologies could help uh, um, mitigate uh, this and uh, the same for uh, the med medical needs. Um, for those ones that they are not uh, familiar for a fee, uh, with a fee, I would like to about 300,000 uh, through their uh, national associations or chambers, uh, 45 uh, members, uh, national associations are members of FE in 38 European countries. And additionally, FE embraces also four sections, each one of which represent a vital part of the profession, namely the practitioners the hygienists, the veterinary state officers, and the veterinarians working in education, research, and industry. Um, FE strives to enhance animal health, animal welfare, and protect the environment by supporting veterinarians to deliver these uh, services. In that respect, embracing new technologies and preparing the profession for that uh, is uh, in the our core priorities uh, within our uh, strategy. So, our planet uh, faced a crisis, a pandemic that forced everyone, so eventually the veterinary profession, to find ways to continue business. Uh, so, uh, Everything went uh, online, quick sharing of information and all kind of communication became remote. Uh, the use of digital means exploded. And even for a veterinary consultation for veterinarians in many cases and the use of telemedicine increased. So everyone became familiar with these new tools. So, um, this, uh, the use of such tools have been explored so far, um, but uh, were not very much integrated in veterinary practice. Um, so, uh, big data were also collected, and uh, we have the example of the uh, European surveillance uh, monitoring of consumption of antibiotics in Europe. So. We have already some examples um, uh, to, to see. So having this experience, uh, veterinarians see more opportunities in using these new technologies, for example, for monitoring uh, the market with regard to increased availability and forecasting shortages, or to identify treatment gaps uh, and alternative uh, options for treatment or to improve adverse events reporting and uh, signal detection uh, with regard to pharmacovigilance. Before looking into these potentials that these new technologies bring, let me share with you some information about the state of play uh, currently with regard to shortages in EU. So recently, FE collected some uh, data from its members via an online questionnaire. 17 uh, European countries replied to this questionnaire, and the results show that shortages in veterinary medicines and vaccines are an increasing problem in almost all of them. 
Shortages are observed for many different categories of veterinary medicines authorized for different species. And uh, at the most important were for vaccines, um, namely for uh, livestock, dogs and cats and equine, and for antibiotics. However, we have to a lesser, a lesser extent uh, reporting um, uh, shortages for non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs and antiparasitics and also some other medicines like anesthetics, for example. This is a detailed list with all the responses per country, and I'm not going to uh, go over it in detail. It is just to visually present uh, the extent of the problem currently in Europe. What is, however, more interesting is that uh, many of these shortages are critical, especially the ones referred to uh, vaccines for several species or uh, the ones for narrow spectrum or lower classes antibiotics. Uh, like penicillin, amoxicillin, and tetracycline. That means that veterinarians in these countries and in these cases, they have to use higher class antibiotics, not because they necessarily need it, but just because they are not available. Another uh, important um, result of this uh, question was that the majority of uh, uh, veterinarians in countries, in, in the majority of countries, they reported that it's difficult for them to get uh, reliable information about durations and reasons for, of, for the shortage or uh, alternatives that they can use in, in, that, in those cases. So only four countries were able to uh, reply that they can find easily this information. The situation was more difficult when they were trying to uh, find an alternative uh, from um, another country of the EU or the, the same product for another country for the EU. Only two countries responded in that case that they are able to do it easily. So further than the temporary shortages, um, there are also other uh, needs that um, are not covered well at the moment, like, for example, for minor species and small markets. And um, I quote here the uh, example of aquatic animals, which are many species, but usually are referred all together as one species called fish. And uh, FVE, a few years ago, together with a large consortium of stakeholders, has made a gap analysis and uh, presented already results showing the gap uh, that exists currently in treatment uh, of certain diseases for those animals. Another important tool in veterinary practice is diagnostics and sensitivity testing. FE had a few years ago collected data on the use of sensitivity testing and, and uh, the needs uh, by the veterinarians. Following, however, the adoption of the new regulation, which calls for more testing before prescription, FE launched a few days ago a similar survey among veterinarians looking in addition to potential shortages observed in the EU countries. So far, about 250 veterinarians have replied from 11 countries. The very preliminary results show that veterinarians report lack of availability in different species. And I present here uh, results from uh, six countries that they have reported that they see uh, such shortages, uh, mainly in diagnostics related to companion animals. Another interesting preliminary result of this survey has to do with easiness in performing such a test. And um, in this survey, we asked for, um, uh, for information, for replies about the easiness in having rapid or on-site diagnostic uh, uh, tests, uh, in-house or external tests. And uh, from the replies we, that we have received, we see that diagnostics uh, 
it's uh, rather easy to, to do uh, either on site or uh, externally. However, this is not the case for sensitivity testing, and that is uh, an important first uh, um, observation uh, to, to keep in mind and to see how we can help with it. So, um, monitoring of availability and uh, of, sort of medicines availability and forecasting of allergies are important not only for the obvious reasons, namely to ensure animal health, animal welfare, public health, food production, but also it provides, as we see it, um, opportunities for addressing regulatory issues and uh, facilitating availability of products throughout the EU. Also, uh, we see that maybe it can solve issues with to needs for imports for third countries. Recently, FEE um, became aware uh, about uh, an important shortage for another minor species, namely for uh, vaccines in minks, uh, that it's an important problem for certain countries and uh, for which it seems that we, uh, we need to uh, have a mechanism uh, and maybe new technologies can help to facilitate availability in such cases. So, veterinarians feel that digital tools could provide opportunities uh, for real-time monitoring of shortages or um, uh, by establishing a harmonized framework for collection of data. Rick also mentioned in his presentation how important it is to collect um, quality data and also um, having a framework that somehow connects all the IT tools that we have and uh, avoid uh, uh, duplicating the work. Enhancing communication is very important. Uh, we veterinary feedback need to uh, have an easy reporting uh, um, mechanism. Um, so um, these uh, tools can help us uh, to uh, help with better communication and also can help us uh, bringing together a network uh, with the engagement of all stakeholders. So, um, unmet, with regard to unmet needs, yes, uh, alternative treatments and diagnostics, it's already mentioned. Um, the needs for minor species, uh, it's mentioned. And um, this is why veterinarians uh, see that new technologies can support the identification uh, of um, the kind of reliable diagnostics and sensitivity testing that we need to develop um, for identification of alternatives to using antibiotics. We see that also can help for um, um, addressing some of the requirements of the new regulation, like uh, the SPC harmonization and optimization of doses and regimes. It definitely can help for forecasting and uh, preparedness, and uh, therefore for uh, um, assisting and supporting the decision making uh, whenever there is an emergency. Uh, it, they can help also for easy pharmacovigilance reporting, and this is not an exhaustive list, it's some first reflections about uh, the opportunities. Um, so, uh, veterinarians would like to be part of um, uh, this exercise and uh, look into identification on the right needs, they have to be a part. We would like also to see some um, a more integrated One Health approach. Many of the causes of shortages are common with the healthcare sector, so many of the solutions that they have been developed well for us. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. And um, uh, however, we have to be careful.
burden or high cost for the users. And we need to ensure that um, we provide um, the right framework to work with it uh, and an ethical framework. Uh, and I'm referring mainly to how to handle uh, data, like uh, addressing data ownership uh, and data management. We need a validation of analytical methods and forecasting tools uh, before they, they are uh, available for use. Uh, we need also to ensure data protection uh, and so on. So uh, this is my last slide. Uh, I put some uh, summary uh, together on what we need, where we are, what we could do, and there are only reflections to start this discussion. Uh, so we need to um, certainly enhance uh, available uh, pharmacovigilance reporting and communication uh, as well. Where we are with this, I think that the new tools that have been developed, like the Union Product Database and the Utra Visualance Veterinary Database, um, it's a very good start and can help with this. However, we need to work more to make these uh, tools more uh, handy to link databases so that uh, veterinarians can get the information they uh, need easily. And eventually, we see that the Union Product uh, Database can serve also for reporting pharmacovigilance, uh, not reporting, but finding um, information about uh, pharmacovigilance and finding information about shortages. And in case that we have a shortage, finding information about alternatives and how uh, to proceed with this. Uh, we need also to uh, bring a sustainable uh, system and a network that everyone is engaged. I think what we do today, uh, and it's a process that has started already uh, a few years ago, uh, it's important. However, we need to, to do more. We need to uh, engage more all policymakers and regulators and stakeholders uh, to uh, create uh, robust and reliable work um, so that uh, we can use it. Um, we need uh, new technologies and uh, to be validated before their use. We need to um, identify areas where these new technologies could, could be helpful. Um, and also with regard to uh, the new regulation, I mentioned already the SPC harmonization. Uh, and of course, we need to see how we could use these technologies to identify uh, any unmet needs. Uh, ethics and uh, security, uh, it's very important. The veterinary profession knows and works under a, a strict deontology, so it is part of our uh, let's say, uh, job. So we would like to see uh, the same about the use of digital tools in practice, and uh, we need such a framework to uh, work within. And uh, finally, uh, we need uh, uh, to enhance the use of existing resources, so we have to see what has been developed uh, the human healthcare sector goes sometimes a bit ahead of uh, us, so maybe we can see um, uh, whether we could uh, join them and uh, make use of the same tools without duplicating the work. And uh, with this, uh, thank you for your attention. I think it's the, this is my last slide. and. Um, I'm at your uh, availability for more questions. Um, thank you, Amal, um, for this presentation, Espina. And um, I really like the second to last slide you had um, because um, you showed what is already achieved and um, you furthermore um, highlighted um, what, what is the task ahead and uh, not so much the problem is ahead, but um, what we should do in the future. So um, I like this attitude a lot. <laughs> Um, that said, again, we are open for questions. Um, so far, I don't see any hands raised and nothing written in the chat. Ah, okay. Um, yeah, we have the one from James, um, but I will, will um, put it um, to the round table because it's going to Rick Clayton. Mm -hmm. And we have um, 
Ah, now we have a second one. Um, so, um, James, are you online? Um, could you raise your hand? Then we can put you on speaker. That's easier if you ask your question. Okay. So, again, sorry. <laughs> Katarina is the master of. Sorry, James, I just lowered your hand instead of a mute you. Can you please raise your hand again? Thank you. Oh, good. Thank you. There's just a. I'm so far away, it's probably a delay. No, I was just asking, uh, the question was that to, to F, F, uh, FBU, if they've got any suggestion on where we should focus, where the focus should lie in relation to facilitating adverse event reporting for veterinary professionals in the field, mainly. Because we've, we've discussed previously about investing in digital reporting tools, but should we bypass that and maybe, because we're talking about big data, should we even start investing into the data capture tools, which in Great Britain, where I'm originally from, as in there, looking into that at the moment, looking at uh, both on the human side and, and particularly on the veterinary side to capture data so it alleviates the active reporting that vets have to do, which is obviously a burden for them. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if that has been discussed within FBE and in, relation, and, and in, in collaboration with vets in the field where, where the priority should lie to facilitate reporting. Thank you. That's all. Yeah, thank you, James, for this. Um, uh, question. Yeah, actually what it is important for uh, veterinarians is indeed to be able to report without uh, uh, very much of an uh, We have seen all a survey that we did a few years ago that uh, administrative uh, burden for reporting back an adverse event, it's uh, too much for a veterinarian. And veterinarians want to treat the animals, not to do paperwork. So um, in the tools that can easily um, help veterinarians to easily report back, it's very important. And another aspect that is also very much important for the veterinarians, it's to know what their report is done. So um, to see a feedback from their reporting and to, to know as much as possible uh, information about uh, the, uh, the input that they have provided and what is the case for this with the particular product. So let's say, yeah, enhancing uh, communication back and forward, it's the main priority of FE. James, does it answer your question or do you have any more? Need more feedback. And maybe if I can uh, add something more, Sandra, I think it's also critical that we facilitate this, um, uh, let's say, this easy reporting, because now in pharmacovigilance we have a signal detection system. So eventually you need quality data in order to have uh, this signal detection and have um, the the flag coming up, uh, it's time you have a problem. If you don't, if you have under-reporting, um, the, the system will simply not work. Yeah, I, I, I can totally agree with you. Actually, I had a, had a related question, but because we are running out of time a bit, um, I was asked to ask it later in the round table, so you can prepare, there's coming something on pharmacovigilance reporting um, your way. Um, because now we are heading to our third speaker in the session. Um, the final presentation in this first block will be held by Dr. Janine Wiegel, Wiegel? Um, trying to do it on the, the Netherlands way, um, from GD Animal Health. Um, it's a company covering laboratory services as well as research and uh, providing independent consultancy. So uh, she, is re um, she is representing the stakeholders um, that are animal health care professionals other than veterinarians. Janine um, studied veterinary medicine with a focus on livestock and public health um, before starting at GD Animal Health um, as a poultry veterinarian and uh, she was giving or is giving advice to veterinarians, farmers and other professionals in the poultry industry. In 2019 she got a master's degree in avian health and medicine from the University of Georgia and now she will um, present her view on um, our use cases. Thanks Emil. <laughs> Okay, thank you for the introduction, um, and I'm very uh, happy to be able to present here, to have this opportunity. Um, I would like to 
show you something that we do in the Netherlands and it's focused mainly on poultry uh, as that is my uh, area of expertise. So if you would go to the next slide, please. There the chickens are already. Um, we will talk about the data collection and analysis uh, that we do in the Netherlands and the lessons that we learned from that. So to the next slide, then I can show you um, what we do is a combination of uh, several data sets. We do trend analysis for poultry diseases, which is based mainly on monitoring data. We analyze the antibiotic use in poultry flocks on the data set that is the central registration of antibiotics. And I will go into a little bit more detail in the next slides and um, the antimicrobial resistance, which is based on the MIC values of pathogenic bacteria. So really veterinary pathogenic pathogens. And I will turn off my camera. Turn it on. Okay. Um, so the trend analysis of poultry diseases. Um, here you see how we report it back. Um, it's reported every three months. Uh, actually, this year is the 20 year anniversary of the monitoring we do as it is now. Um, but we already started uh, many years ago for other poultry diseases like um, the poultry salmonellas. Um, the origin of the monitoring data is based on the laboratory data that we collect at GD, but also at external laboratories that is shared with, uh, with GD for analysis. Autopsy data and contacts um, like phone calls and farm visits that are really uh, question based. Also, we collect farm data from private uh, practitioners like farm visits where they collect the clinical signs and the diagnosis that they make at the farms and their own autopsy data. And those results are presented back to the government and the industry representatives. So the next slide. What we can do with all the data is we can an analyze the trends that we see in several um, areas, like intestinal problems and respiratory problems. And there you can see the percentage of flocks. Um, in poultry, we all always talk about flocks, and that is really um, all the birds that are present in one house um, with the uh, intestinal problems that they are uh, registered with, and that is based on antibiotic treatments. And there you can analyze it over time. We also compare years um, if we see a seasonal influence and um, act based on that. We also do that for the respiratory and for general disease problems and for poultry. There's also like first week problems. And we also can um, uh, divide it up to the um, different parts of the sector. So this is for uh, broilers and we already divided it up to uh, slower grow growing broilers and regular growing speed broilers. So to the next slide. So based on those diseases that we monitor, we can also do um, specific pathogen monitoring, the prevalence and incidence of uh, specific pathogens and look at the geographical sp uh, spread based on the laboratory data that we collect. So here you see a map of the Netherlands and where we see several IB viruses, so the coronavirus of poultry. Um, which strains are present in the Netherlands. You see that in some areas we detect more that are the poultry dense areas in the middle. Um, and also to the south is a more poultry dense area in the Netherlands. And there we can also detect more um, diverse strains of this virus, which is very interesting for the industry um, to base their uh, vaccination schedules on. And on the right, you can see the um, a phylogenetic tree of the virus, and there we also look for um, if they are starting to migrate more from the strains that we have detected more. So if there are more mutations prevalent, and if they are settling, or if they are just passing by. So to the next slide. The antibiotic database that we have uh, in the Netherlands is um, present for several of the major livestock species. So for ruminants, we have two databases. For uh, meal, uh, meat calves is different than for um, the milk producing sector. 
we have one for goats, for pigs, for poultry and for rabbits. And I would go into more depth on the poultry database, which is the central registration of antibiotics uh, database, including all poultry types, so broiler layer, pullets, replacement birds, um, the pedigree levels, breeders and the turkeys. And all antibiotic use has to be registered in that central database, and that is um, a legal obligation. There is a control at practitioner level, so how many antibiotics go into the veterinary practice and go out of the veterinary practice. That is done by the uh, government, the uh, Food and Safety Authority. And there's also at a farmer level a control which is done uh, by the Integrated Chain Control Program. So that is really um, a certifying company that is uh, checking if there is no stock at the farm and if the antibiotics that are used are prescription only. So to the next slide. What we can do with the database is look at the antibiotic use at a sector level. So we have started a reduction program uh, since nine, 2009, and we have seen a great reduction in use since then. Um, the antibiotic use in broilers is the uh, graph on the left. And there you can see that we have achieved 81% uh, reduction overall in the broiler sector. And we um, present that as a uh, daily dosage. So that is a corrected number so that every farm can be uh, compared to each other and to the uh, national um, level, um, irrespective of how many broilers they have kept in that year. We have also recorded the antibiotic use in turkeys, and there we have also achieved a large uh, reduction. Only uh, we can compare that to the numbers of 2011, and we have achieved a 76% reduction. And there you can also see that um, we have divided it up to a, a general antibiotic use level and um, third choice antibiotics, and I will explain that a little bit more. Um, but uh, essentially, it is enrofloxacin use that is separately um, represented from the general antibiotic use to create also a little bit more awareness and more uh, transparency. Uh, what you can see on the right is by combining that databases um, that we have, we have an identification and registration database that is owned by the sector and the antibiotic use database, we can see the market share of the um, subsectors of broilers. So we have slower growing, which has been growing in market share over the years and the antibiotic use in the uh, subsectors. So blue is the slower growing ones and green is the regular broilers. And you can see that we are now at a almost 50-50 market share and that the antibiotic use in the slower growing broilers was really fluctuating a lot in the beginning, but settling more at a low level and the antibiotic use in the regular broiler sector has been going down steadily over the years. Um, next slide, please. So we can further analyze that data based on the specifications that we have in the data sets. By combining those, we can um, uh, detect if the flock that has the linked antibiotic use was either layer or broiler, but also if it was reproduction or if it was in the rearing phase, and then we can present the data like this. So, for instance, I would like you to look with me at the layer um, set of data that we have. Uh, that is the um, layers, and in 2014, they had uh, 0 0.51 um, antibiotic use, the daily defined dosages. And we can see that there was an increase over time uh, in 2000. And one, which is the most recent data that we have, 2002 is not available yet. Um, so in 21, we had 1.32 uh, defined daily uh, doses. And that is a decrease from the last year, but an increase overall. And that we can uh, specify further into first choice, second choice, and third choice. And we also specify the colistin use as it has been uh, gaining a lot of attention due to the resistance uh, uh, pro uh, problems in that field. So the categorization is a Dutch categorization. 
it's not completely in line with the um, World Health Organization or the OIE categorization, but uh, based on the uh, Health Council advice of 2011, and the first choice includes, uh, uh, for instance, thiamulin, but also the tetracyclines and uh, um, penicillins. Second choice is amoxicillin and ampicillin, but also plumiquine and uh, tylosin as a macrolide, and colistin, which is separately presented, and the third choice, which includes enrofloxacin and third and fourth generation cephalosporins, but those are not used in poultry in the Netherlands. So we can use that data um, to further analyze where the focus areas lay. So to the next slide, please. What we also do is further analyze that data um, really into the specifics of the use. So for instance, for broilers, we look at the age of treatment where we can see uh, bulk is uh, used in the first week, which is also um, linked to first week problems, which you can see on the graph on the right, um, where we have treatments due to the clinical problems that are uh, presented, like digestion, locomotion, respiration. And I'm sorry for the Dutch in these graphs, but the report is Dutch as we provided to the uh, Dutch poultry sector. What you can also see is that we can uh, look at several years and can detect if there are uh, rising uh, disease problems uh, linked to that year or if it is a trend that has been going on for several years. So to the next slide, please. So we do not only present that data, but we also um, communicated back to farmers and to suppliers of the poultry sector. So we, um, to the right, you see how we benchmark the suppliers, where you see an average antibiotic use of their customers. So that is, um, for instance, the hatchery or a feeding company. And then we can present the antibiotic use of their farmers compared to uh, the national average. So if they are below or above, and they can take action based on that. Uh, this is for broilers, so we present first week data and uh, the total antibiotic use separately. To the right, you can see the benchmark uh, presented to farms. The, ba the baselines that we uh, categorize them on their antibiotic use are set by the stakeholders, so the government and the uh, poultry sector uh, themselves. You can see the, um, the farms based on their antibiotic use in the first graph. So you see a large bar for zero antibiotic use and then the low users below the orange dotted line are categorized as green. So low using antibiotic um, between orange and red dotted lines are um, categorized as orange. So that is to mention that they should have caution in their antibiotic use. And above red is uh, they should take action. Um, the red line that is uh, solid, that is the, um, um, the line that is set for slower growing and also for the future for regular broilers. Okay, so to the next slide. And here you can see that we present them um, also to the sector for the veterinary practice for the hatchery and the feed mills, and they are separated to slower growing and regular. You can see that there is not a lot of variation uh, between, for instance, um, the veterinary practices. Um, if you look at the top 10 of amount of farms they, uh, they consult to, um, but there is a difference and that can uh, present themselves to take action. So to the next slide. So the veterinarians are presented as their own veterinary practice versus the national picture, which is presented on the left and also put into an overview of the top 10 where they can see their own practice compared to uh, the top 10 of the um, veterinary practices working in poultry in the Netherlands. And also to the next slide. This is how we can present it back to the farm level. So the development in time where you can see uh, for each quarter of the year how your antibiotic use was, so where your major uh, use was, uh, you can relate it back to a flock or to a season, for example, and take action based on that. 
Uh, the substances that you used in the different categories is below that. So green is the first choice, second choice is orange, and uh, red is third choice. You can see that this is for broilers, that third choice is barely used at all uh, at the uh, national level. Then we translate that to a stop sign, sort of, um, where you can see where your antibiotic use is based on the national average and also based in the categories. So you can compare yourself and see how, um, how urgent it is that you take action. And to the next slide. So if you are over the orange or the red line, then there is an action um, that is uh, linked to that uh, categorization. So uh, IKB KIP, that's a Dutch word, is the chain organization, and it is a certifying company that assesses a farm every six months, including their antibiotic use. If the farm is in the orange zone, then they need to produce an action plan uh, that is developed by the veterinarian and the farmer um, together to reduce the antibiotic use on that farm based on the use in the previous years. And if it is red, there's an obligation to um, consult an external supervisor at the expense of the farmer, where we sit together uh, with the farm advisors and suppliers like the feeding company, the hatchery and the veterinarian, uh, which are also benchmarked and then we can together set up a, a plan of action and evaluate that over time. And that's also a legal obligation to do that uh, action if you are in the red zone. So to the next slide, please. Then I also mentioned we have the antimicrobial resistance database. Uh, here you see the results of that, um, that are pathogenic bacteria from poultry. Uh, this is the example for E. coli um, from meat uh, type broilers or meat type birds actually. Um, and you can see that we present the data also uh, with clinical breaking points and we can de detect an evolution in time. So you can see for each antibiotics, there is a MIC value presented how many of the isolates are in that MIC value, and we translate it to sensitive, intermediate, and resistance, and also present the um, MIC 50 and 90 to present a few of the population. And we can also detect trends based on these data. We present it every three months as well. Uh, to the next slide, please. So as I mentioned, um, the monitoring is presented every three months to the sector. And so what did we learn from all this uh, work that we have been doing in this way already for 20 years? Um, monitoring is always done in cooperation with the stakeholders. The participation is based on the benefit and the legal obligation uh, in combination with the commitment. So we see that there is a benefit for the data suppliers as well as that they are legally obliged to provide uh, part of the data. The monitoring data results are presented back to the sector and the shareholders and also uh, the government. But we also present the data back to uh, individual farmers, farm advisors and suppliers, and that provides a lot of awareness and uh, provides a, a reference for um, how they should or could uh, operate. The personal data presentation is done by the stakeholders themselves and not done by the controller. So um, it is a more independent way of uh, present, presenting that data to a farmer, for example. Uh, the methodology, we do it by one central database with all the data. So we have sort of a data warehouse where several databases supply their input to. Um, that is identification and registration, our laboratory information system. Um, well, we also have um, internal like business objects, which are um, combining all that data together with the antibiotic database as well. And they are all put into a kind of like a cube where we can get the data out as well. Um, and that is one of the lessons that we learned that is um, really important that you should be able to combine that databases to 
uh, analyze it correctly. So to the next slide. What we have learned from all this monitoring that we have been doing is um, better healthcare and health status is if we are able to provide that to the sector. Um, we have a lot of results showing for that based on um, avian influenza, on salmonella, uh, but also the antibiotic use. Um, we are able to provide evidence-based evidence veterinary support, as I showed you, for instance, for the uh, viral data that we have. We can create political awareness, um, show the sector efforts to reduce antibiotics, for example. We make it visible and we can make it more targeted. And we can also show that antibiotic re use reduction and pathogen antibiotic resistance do not always go hand in hand. Um, so it's good to separate that monitoring from each other. And we can also work on the consumer awareness. So the quality of the product uh, products can be improved, but also the image of the sector and the transparency of what we of all that uh, has been done in the sector can be uh, um, made visible. So that are the benefits that we have learned from this. And the next slide. But also a large uh, um, part on the needs because we see that per participation is really essential. I already mentioned there was a obligatory part and a voluntary part. And for that, we also see that the translation and um, the reporting of the results is really important to uh, have that participation of all parties. The availability of the data, which I already mentioned, the data warehouse that we have been working with is really um, important in this topic. And that is also um, one of the things that you need is the digital data. And we also see that in the Netherlands, for example, where uh, we do a lot of animal health monitoring, but a large part of the data that is missing is uh, the slaughter results or uh, data from the slaughterhouses because that all that data is not digital yet. So that's not available to combine with the other databases. Um, what's also important for this is the quality of the data. It doesn't always need to be the highest level, but you need to be aware of the quality. Um, we also see that if the quality is higher, there is more benefit to the supplier of that data and the results are um, way more beneficial. So there is a, um, a reason to improve the quality of the data. And also the um, analysis of the data, what we have learned is that it is really important to have an independent source analyzing that data. Um, our company has been doing that for uh, the Dutch livestock sectors for a few, uh, for a really long time now. Um, but it is really important that it is not the, only the government involved uh, to increase the participation of all parties. So to the next. So to sum up the recommendations from what we have learned uh, of the monitoring that we have done here in the Netherlands and then mainly based on poultry, but also a little bit on the other livestock sectors that we uh, have been monitoring is organize the ownership of your data, if possible, by an independent institution. For instance, an institution um, of sector representatives. Um, think about how you combine the databases, so about the structure of the data, um, the input of the data, and identify the needs and wishes beforehand. Uh, you do not need to fulfill all needs and wishes, but be aware of them and how you can maybe implement them in the future as well. Um, Think about the legal basis of your uh, data and of the um, an analysis of the data. So identify obligatory and voluntary data. And think about the benefits for all the parties to increase the participation as well as the quality of your data. So to the next. So that was what I wanted to present to you. Um, also, a big thanks to my colleague, uh, Dr. Ten Fabri, as he uh, presented uh, a lot of these slides for me. Um, as I was on maternity leave, so um, I was not able to uh, create all the data for the presentation. Um, but I'm also willing to uh, 
get some questions now. If there's still time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just a very short time. <laughs> no, um, thank you, Janine, for the presentation. Um, very hands-on presentation. And um, I really um, like that um, you showed that um, how many conclusions could be drawn and um, what improvements could be made. Um, by um, available data and by just using this data because um, I think during the last years we collected data and data and data especially in farm animals um, you know I'm from the bovine sector so there we have a lot of data and unfortunately um, the farmers are collecting this data and they are not using it so um, yes it was very interesting and um, we have time for one question from the audience if um, anyone has something um, to ask now just raise your hand. Um, no hands raised, just in the chat. Um, from Eric, um, he's saying that, thanks Janine, great presentation. Um, could you expand a bit more on the data ownership of all the data collected? That uh, seems indeed an important question. Actually, it's the same that I wanted to ask you as well. <laughs> How are you handling the data ownership? <laughs> so um, yeah, could you elaborate a bit? Yes. Um in the Netherlands, we have a foundation that is um, uh, based on uh, farmers. So they actually own their own data, especially for the antibiotic uh, data sets. Uh, I think that's the easiest one to uh, go into more detail. Um, the data is really owned by the Farmer Association. They also um, uh, present questions for analysis. Um, also, when there's done research done on the antibiotic data set, then they have to um, agree with that. Um, but part of the data is also based on a uh, legal obligation to collect that data. So that uh, part of the data set is separated from the larger data set and presented to the government for analysis. And that are the reports that are presented yearly on the antibiotic use. And that is also the data that is uh, going to Europe for the EMA uh, analysis as well. So um, it's not as simple as it looks, but essentially the farmers own the whole data set and a part of it is uh, also going to the government as well. So I hope that uh, answers the question a bit. Sure, Ivo raised his hand beside me, so I will give the floor to him. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, thank you very much, uh, Janine. And I've worked with the GD in the past, and I know they're very strong in, in building these uh, uh, data sets. Um, I think that question about ownership, uh, I would like to approach it from, from a different angle, because we are looking into and we're trying to build this veterinary data catalog where we uh, would like to see what data is out there and how can we actually access, or from the side of the union, how can we access those data and use those data uh, to develop our uh, big data uh, strategy uh, further. So when it comes to ownership, I, I fully understand that the GD, together with the farmers, can access all these data because you own the data. What are the options of making uh, these data available also to connect them uh, with other data that are collected in Europe and then to bring value to the whole union. I'm, I'm, I'm not asking you uh, to answer the question right now, but is there experience uh, within the GD that they they actually doing that and, and share those data outside that network other than with the Dutch government? Thank you. Uh, yes, um, very good question. And I think it's already included in your program as well at uh, the Decide project. Um, Herdien van, Sch van Schaik is uh, talking about it later this or earlier. I saw her name somewhere on. No, oh, correct. She will. She will be uh, later today. Yes, because that is an example of uh, uh, a project that is also using the data uh, for uh, research purposes. Um, the question was asked to the poultry association if the data on the antibiotic use could be used. Uh, for the purpose of the site, so to see if there was uh, a way to detect, um, to early detect uh, diseases and to create tools for early detection based on that data set. Um, so there's really a possibility to use that data and the farmers have to uh, agree on the usage of the data. 
and that is organized in a working group that presents uh, the sector um, like a, a representative from the hatcheries, uh, from the farmers association, and also um, someone from GD to uh, have more knowledge on the data set, someone uh, from all the different angles. So there is really a possibility um, if the farmers agree to it. I don't know if that answers your question, but. It, no, certainly it does answer my question, and and uh, thank you uh, for bringing that teaser so uh, that the participants in this meeting will stay on for the meeting this afternoon uh, by Gadin uh, van Schaik, because that's I think that's what we're all interested uh, in as well. Now, thank you, thank you again for an excellent presentation. Uh, back to you, uh, Sandra. Yeah, and I think. Um as we are running a bit out of time, um, if there are any more questions, uh, please just write them in the chat and we will come back to them in the round discussion um, after the second part. But now I will um, send you all for a lunch break. Um, we will meet here again at half past one, so you have around 52 minutes and um, then we see each other back for the another three speakers, um, Academia, um, the FDA and um, yeah. EU regulators, yeah, Laura. Um, she will um, say something about EU related Lagos. See you in nearly one hour. <laughs> bye bye. Okay, so it's um, half past uh, one. Um, welcome back, everyone. Um, I hope you had a good break. <laughs> and now we are um, fine for another um, three presentations on um, the view on the um, business use cases. So um, first, I want to introduce our fourth speaker for the session, um, and that's Dr. Miel Hostans from Utrecht University. Um, Dr. Horsten is an assistant professor at the Department of Farm Animal Health, um, focusing on herd health management in relation to precision livestock man management and also on big data in dairy cows, so um, actually far, uh, near to my heart. <laughs> Um, so, besides being responsible for uh, bachelor and master students and statistical training for PhD students, uh, his services extend to the area of herd health management and dairy cows. Um, his expertise are mainly in data science and veterinary epidemiology, in veterinary medicine and information and computing science. Um, Dr. Hostens, um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> please interrupt me if something goes wrong. I have uh, two screens at the moment, so normally that should be okay. Also, I will keep track of the time. Um, first of all, thanks a lot for the invitation to uh, to talk. Um, I'm indeed Miel Hostens. For uh, those people who have no idea of um, of um, who I am, just a little bit of background. I'm a veterinarian by design. I also I always say so. I did my vet degree in Ghent. Uh, here there were other speakers as well from the Ghent University. So I, um, I finished the PhD there, um, focusing on, on, on dairy cows. Um, but I did a, a supplemental training in uh, data science on top of what, uh, of what I was doing already in 2016. And in 2019, I, I went uh, from Ghent to uh, Utrecht University in the Netherlands. Um, and I have um, a position there uh, teaching mainly uh, students in the veterinary profession around farm animal health. But I've always had a very big uh, focus on, on, let's say, data-driven dairy science. Um, and a bit of a disclaimer, watch out. Uh, I'm mainly interested in farm animals. So you will find me between cows with students on farms uh, working with data and then uh, trying to um, uh, work with bigger farms in the world. This was Saudi Arabia some, um, some years ago, um, where I really try to focus on how can we use um, data for better uh, farm decisions, etc. Now, I would like to start by very simply showing this um, um, abstract, which was built in academia already some years ago now, 1998. And, and pro probably not a lot of you will um, know this abstract. But this, for example, was the abstract by the two gentlemen on top. That's Sergey Brin and, um, and Larry Page. And these two gentlemen, they were working in the academic, yeah, so in the academic world. And there, this abstract was rejected, in fact, by the, um, the, um, by the conference. Um, the abstract was rejected, and one of the peer reviewers wrote on the paper, I found the overall presentation disjointed. This needs to focus more on the 
IR issues and less on the web analysis. Um, maybe um, some, something starts ringing your mind because this was the abstract that was eventually transformed in what we now know, nowadays know as the Google company. So um, just a little bit of a trigger to, to say these two gentlemen were working in academia. Some academics were not able to identify that this was probably going to be one of the biggest algorithms of the um, of, of let's say the common world right now. So, what kind of people do we need in this let's say animal production um, medicine world? What kind of people do we need? to really move forward in this digital revolution? Is it academia? Is it research institutes? Is it SMEs, multinationals, some global innovators? I don't, I, I don't know, but what I would like to do with you is kind of take the journey of what I've been working in and kind of first take you into my journey for some minutes of what has happened in the past. And then I would like to have a look on what we are doing right now um, when it comes to the whole data uh, world, the big data world, um, and then look into the future. So first of all, um, let's look at, in fact, the technology lifecycle, like many people will, will uh, show you. And when it comes to precision livestock farming, that's the, the term that was invented um, already, um, I think, 2006, 2007, um, Daniel Bergman started to use it for the first time. Precision livestock farming was really a kind of a trigger yeah, at that moment. Yeah. So ever since we have um, invented the, world, the word, a lot of companies started to, let's say, look at animals, look at our, um, at our industry, agriculture, veterinary, in this kind of way. Yeah. So we would create sensors for, to monitor animals, and to give you a little bit of an idea of if, if this is still happening, yes, this is, for example, the Utrecht Science Park um, as we know it. So, and that is an entire park full of uh, different faculties. And we are here, the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine is here, and we have our own farm. And on that farm, we have around 70 cows. But to give you an idea, these are all the technologies that I have installed on these cows, which sense some part of let's say the real world of those animals um trying to work with these animals combined with the data and learn from it but to, you already see that there's an, an awful amount of data coming from these animals the promise that technology at that moment made yeah and and all data driven technologies will still make if you uh, listen to their pitches is that the technology can be used for real time monitoring of animal health and welfare yeah, it can be used for emerging disease monitoring. It can be used to monitor maybe ph pharmacovigilance yeah, and antimicrobial resistance. Yeah, it could be used if you combine it uh, with, with uh, or if you combine different data sources. It could be used as real world evidence and hence diminish the need for new animal experiments. It could be used for animal disease prevention. And eventually, many of us will, if we pitch a project, we will say it will move us towards sustainable agriculture and by the way all of them mentioned as well artificial artificial intelligence will solve everything um you feel me already joking a little bit yeah because this is of course the the technology trigger which helped us create a lot of volume of data and academia typically have focused and are still focusing on creating a large amount of volume yeah and we have done that on several uh, places, for example, on, on welfare of cows, uh, algorithms have been published, then there are apps and more sensors and even more and more and more. And right now there's an abundance, let's say, of data available in the world, which partly moves into the veterinary world, partly moves into the, uh, in the, in the animal world, agricultural world. There is an abundance in this. The volume is enormous. Yeah? Now, then came the peak of inflated expectations. And I have heard somebody already mention that today as well. I listened to the Big Data Stakeholder Forum last year as well, and I found it very enthusiastic. Whereas I was already thinking like, hmm, are these people aware about the peak of inflated expectations? But because what we see in the real world when it comes to big data is that it's quite messy. 
So they, they, then we will often refer to, for example, the Vs of big data, where, for example, I can make it very practical, and that's the velocity at which we are creating data is enormous. That can, this, this can be an email from, from, body, from somebody saying, hey, Mule, look, there's another update of the data. Here you have it. But on top, there's also the volatility aspect. Think about all of you who, who have done a PhD and try to imagine if you could redo the entire PhD analysis using the old data. Many of you maybe even have no access to that data anymore. Yeah, and in general, it is thought that data only lasts for about five years and then it vanishes. Yeah. Question is who is, is, is paying for all that data to keep it alive, on the other hand? Is it only Bill Gates who will make a lot of money because we store it in the cloud and then because of that, it then suddenly becomes big data? There's more to that. Yeah. The biggest problem that I face, especially in my world, is when we start looking at the variety of all different data sets that we have in, the, in that agricultural world. Um, it's really that heterogeneity, that syntax heterogeneity, semantics heterogeneity, we can call it, that holds the agriculture and veterinary data to really get properly used. If I'm really honest, I'm often surprised how low the level of let's say, digitalization in the agricultural sector is. There is a lot of variety in the data sources, the dimensions where we look at it, the people's budgets. I see a lot of money being put yeah, on projects where I sometimes think, damn, why are we still funding this kind of project, creating more volume instead of working on the variety, for example. But even in Europe, we face a big problem, and that is sometimes we don't speak the same language, yeah, literally. And because of that, it's difficult to work together. And then people have the, the let's say, the tendency to, to come back to their own company, their own budget, and then say, oh, we'll do it ourselves. Whereas tools exist to, uh, to work together. Maybe this sounds something very obvious, yeah, but positive animal identification or case identification, yeah, is in the real world, is not present, yeah. Although that you think that um, animals should have an ear tag, and I've joked in this one with the Dutch um, ear tag number, which is 65 on the one side and 66 on the on the right side. But in the reality, these different data sets that we see out there, the unique identification is really a problem because an animal can have an ear tag officially somewhere in the central database of a country, but once you go to the farm level and you want to work with the data from that cow, then suddenly we cannot find that animal back anymore. And then you can think, yeah, but everybody should be using the, this kind of um, ad ad identification. Well, it's not the case. It's very, very uh, common to not find animals easily in, uh, in data sets across uh, our industry. We've published some uh, ideas on that, uh, where we said, look, can we maybe predict also, for example, yeah, data quality? I've heard that be being mentioned as well today. Can we predict the data quality coming from farms, from data sets in a specific way? Um, we've done some work on that with a PhD student of mine, trying to really work on that aspect of validation uh, of the data. Veracity is, is where the data gets messy, nowadays, and, and this is typically something that we re, re, have rarely seen in animal and veterinary science, yeah? But we should so start reporting data quality much more often, yeah? Every time that you report something, um, think about what, what, what you can mention about the data quality. Maybe somebody wants to know what kind of data quality that checks that you did. Yeah, and, and this is something that I would like to, and, and then within the open science movement, this is getting more and more true. We should not focus on quantity of output, but quality of output. I still see in the academic world, people trying to focus on, uh, on, on output merely by, let's say, using this, the, a lot of data that is available right now and quickly focus on, okay, we should get this out and, and the p-values are, are below 0.05, so we publish. Ah, right now, with the abundance of data that we see, it's so easy to find significant effects. It's really about bringing strong methodologies also yeah, um, um, 
in, into the in, into the academic world, we, we need this needs to change. When we look at the real downhill of the the inflated expectations, yeah, to give you an idea, um, I, I think there's people even in the room um, from Zoetis. For me personally, it has been one of the strongest signals when Zoetis plugged um, the they plugged the 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 the, the power from a sensor technology that was very promising in our world. Yeah, SmartBow was a sensor that was placed on cows to monitor welfare, to monitor production efficiency, to, to monitor disease. And SmartBow, a company that was, was thought to be, really make it, then suddenly Zoetis didn't believe in it anymore and they stopped yeah, um, with that product. That was a very strong signal for me. And Kaintis is now in a video uh, um, uh, sensor technology that is is looking at feed intake on 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 animals. Also, the the, the plug has been pulled from that technology, and this is these are signals signals that somehow, as the entire industry, we're doing things not entirely like we should be doing it. If I go to my working field, I see this kind of situations where I have a farmer, yeah, that has three different systems on the farm and three different screens. And if you ask him how to work with this, yeah, he gets frustrated because all the, let's say, pieces of the real world evidence are in different computers, different systems, and it's difficult to get one signal out of that. And then my question, again, for the room, I see there's quite some industry um, also involved here. Are we really ready or are we really willing to maybe even share these valuable assets because I can think about a lot of companies that we feel that in the perfect world, if you would bring all this data to get, together, pharmacovigilance would be super easy, let's say. But is the industry really willing to share that valuable assets? Because what is the value if you open up a data set or, or do you give away gold, digital gold? Everybody's afraid that they would be the next Google yeah, or everybody wants to become the next Google and people are afraid really to share that asset. And then in the end, does agriculture ever get anything back from that? That's a big challenge, I think, uh, to answer. The scientific reality on top is that if, if I start publishing large data sets or let's say um, insights on large data sets, then I must admit that, and, and I'm just showing the graph for, for my own ideas to when I'm talking, but this is a publication in which we 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 published data on let's say on locomotion scores in cows and how they were behaving. But the downside is that we opened up this data set and then suddenly activists can look at it and say yes, but look now uh, there is a severe issue in the dairy industry. Yeah. So there is a downside about being very open as well, opening up a data set because people can use it for wrong purposes. I think the Netherlands is the nicest example at this moment of something which has been, let's say, also triggered by data at a certain moment. And I've translated this Yeah, at a certain moment. There was a news flash that secretly data from farmers about nitrogen emissions was passed secretly to specific governmental institutions, and they used it now to create new legislations, you can imagine how the agriculture sector looks at that from this point. So there's a, it's a very challenging thing. It, it could bring a lot of value, these data, but what if, it, if you misuse it or abuse it? If I look at my academic and veterinary reality, then I must admit some extra things that are challenging when you think about the whole digital revolution. Most of the curricula mainly are oriented towards veterinary clinicians. And clinicians per se, they don't like the data aspect of all of this. So that's a challenge on top. I'm trying now also in, at the Utrecht University, how can we bring more data-driven technologies inside of the curriculum when we have a curriculum that's already overloaded also with clinical skills if you look at the european accreditation there is very little let's say um in, in incentive to change that that direction of where the veterinary profession should go uh, towards so that's an issue now veterinarians talk to me about this a lot and then i always say 
I don't say it, I've stolen this from somebody else who said it very nicely. Veterinarians will not be replaced by PLF and artificial intelligence, but the one who makes use of it or who will who is not making use of it, he will be replaced by a veterinarian who is making use of it. And that's an important message, I think, that also in the, in the veterinary world we should embrace. Now, the question is, how do we move forward? Yeah, How do we get to the plateau of productivity? And I would like to show you very briefly some ideas about that. I think it was mentioned today as well. All of us should start um, looking into the FAIR data principles. There was an open data movement some years ago, and that was not really successful. The FAIR data movement seems to really kick off. FAIR data means that data is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And then think about this. Imagine that all the data that is published in animal science or veterinary journals, if we open it up so that it could be reused, that it could be checked by others, full transparency in data and methods would, would really bring us a lot of value. Are we setting the right example? We did a survey um, in 2021. In the middle of COVID, then people cannot do real research on farms, for example, and then you need to do some other things. But then um, Anna Meyer, she um, um, did a systematic review of how fair is the data that is, for example, published in veterinary epidemiology. And then what she concluded is that none of the data sets met all the requirements. They Sometimes they met some of it. Interoperability, so that you could use that data combined with other data sets is really a big problem. Yeah, Many initiatives are working on the data access, but let's say how it is, how it's, it's applicable at this stage, that's the question on top. So there is a lot of work here to be done. How can we just start ourselves? Because it needs to come from us. It needs to come from every one of us. Think about every time that you publish something, try to also put somewhere a data set or methodology public. Yeah, This is, for example, a data validity statement where we explain our entire methodology, including the statistical notebooks and access to the data, and we allow people to check what we have done. That's a part of the, of the findable or fair principles. The accessibility of data is a real challenge on top because I think today I've heard also people talk about some things and then I immediately start thinking, yes, this is nice. Why? Because it's an analysis that was done on a data set that is fully owned, let's say, by one person. But if we really want to move forward, then we need to move towards a situation in, in which we start combining data sets across, um, let's say, um, a company borders. It could be a data set which is co-owned by several parties. And then that's a challenge. Because you need to think about techniques that allow that data to be present at different places. Europe has brought up uh, the um, GDPR um, rules. Honestly, I, I sometimes feel that GDPR is, especially from the digital progress, limiting us more than it uh, brings value. It was, it was mainly, let's say, focusing on the, the Google and Facebooks of our world. But in fact, nowadays, within Europe, Many companies are misusing it, and then Brexit is even worse. Um, is we are slowing down our progress because we have new incentives to say, ah, we cannot share it because of GDPR. Don't let this um, limit your brains. On the interoperability aspect, I would like to mention um, a, a few projects that we are running at this stage, in which we are trying to work on um, on transmission of antimicrobial resistance across human and veterinary medicine data. So typically, normally what would happen in, in this kind of um, analysis is that one of my co-workers, um, Egil Fischer, for example, what he typically would do is he would get the data set from somebody and the data set would be transferred towards him. And then he would estimate, for example, a reproduction number of that and transmission um, rate. But what if we would want to combine all, all different experiments from different institutes to create a kind of a meta-analysis of that reproduction number? So you end up in the situation where that researcher would have to be sent all the different data sets and all the different um, 
um, um, experiments. And the data always moves to that person who needs to do the coding of that uh, analysis, that algorithm check. Now, if you work, for example, with human data, then this is very privacy sensitive and it's preferable that you do not get access to the human data. This is where right now I've um, in, um, implemented some newer strategies in which what we do is we try to keep the data as much as possible within the company that owns the data and we bring, instead of the data to the code, we start working on algorithms which are injected into the company. They do the calculation and only the result of the calculation is extracted. This is now, um, we have published this um, publicly. This is the Summer Fair project. You can find the link underneath here. There is a publication also now being, uh, it's in, in, um, in publication where we show that this methodology might work if you work with sensitive data, but you would like to really combine um, information across universities, across research institutes, et cetera, et cetera. On the reusable part, I can, I will, and, and, and finish my presentation by saying that I would advocate or ad advise everybody to really start thinking about, do you have data available that you can keep, re that you can reuse? We have done now in um, some um, uh, follow-up studies on top of public uh, data that is that I have acquired during my PhD, which is already ten years ago. But I keep on reusing that data, yeah, to really almost like milk the cow to try to get as much as possible out of current experiments that we have done, recombining old experiments. Um, reconfirming the hypothesis, but also find new insights on top of what you have done before. That's that's thinking in a fair way. I want to finish by looking a little bit into the future. Yeah, um, we need to start combining the two worlds. I think that's our brain, that's the, the our human neural network with, let's say, artificial intelligence and then neural networks, like they call it in the IT domain. Yeah, and don't be afraid of, of the combination. Um, there is a challenge for us to, com to, to work with artificial intelligence. Yeah, it will not solve everything, but it can do nice things. And to give you an idea, just this is a, a video that I can briefly show you about um, some an animal welfare monitoring that we're doing at this stage by very simply monitoring their cows on farms. Yeah and then looking at their drinking behavior and seeing how they interact with each other. This is a nice example yeah, of where data can really help yeah, in, in, um, in, in adding information to what we were, let's say, previously doing, but a lot of human work, but especially we need to work, and this is what I will uh, show in, in summary, we need to think about methodologies that can work with such kind of things that I showed just a second ago, which might sound very fun, nice to look at and think, oh, this is super, this and that. But the problem is, again, that that video is owned by a farmer, is owned by maybe a researcher. And then the analysis on top of that, that has the challenge as it is data, which is residing at a different level. So we need federated frameworks that allow us yeah, to analyze very heterogeneous data, data that is often residing at different locations, maybe different research institutes, commercial parties, governmental organizations. So these methods need to work on that heterogeneity. And that heterogeneity aspect yeah, um, um, might also be interesting because sometimes it's even not nice to bring all the data together because you cannot do it because it's too big, for example, or maybe because you just simply cannot do it. Yeah. So I think, especially from also the, the from my perspective in, in, at Utrecht University, this is a way forward that we think that is also needed from a methodological uh, standpoint. And with that, um, I'll show a picture of our two youngest uh, looking at cows within uh, the milking parlor. And I um, have, put up some of the links where you can find additional information. Um, and I hope I didn't went too much over time. Katarina just said you did, but it's okay. <laughs> no, it was a very nice presentation. Um, thanks, Emil, for that. And um, 
yeah, because it was like so practical. Um, and I also want to stress that um, most probably data ownership and accessibility um, is one of the major obstac uh, obstacles we have to um, overcome. I think the human uh, domain are working with it or are trying to overcome this problem for several years. So <laughs> I hope we make it better. Um, nevertheless, I think um, this topic is something we should discuss in the roundtable with the other stakeholders because um, we sh um, I and I think we all are interested in their input there as well. Um, I have one question for you um, because I really liked that you said um, artificial intelligence solves everything. Um, I was I was having a similar position as you in the past in, in the research and the problems we faced were artificial intelligence um, because this is like a black box, you know. Um, you you yeah. put in some data, um, if you are good, you will get this data from the data owner and you get a result. And um, do you have any ideas how we may tackle that? Um, because um, the more advanced our analytical, uh, analytics become, the less likely it is that uh, you can repeat them um, in an in, in identical way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, the thing is, artificial intelligence is often indeed called the black box. And I think that's because the people, let's say, and I, and I count myself in that as well, but we, most of us, we, we did not live in an area where let's say the entire data science was something that was normal for our own education. Young people right now, they lived in this world differently. And I think what we need to do is we need to make sure that in the education as well, that we embrace artificial intelligence, also show it to students, to new researchers, what it is. Because in fact, and I work a lot with artificial intelligence myself, and once you start understanding it, it's not so artificial anymore. There is really the possibility that you can understand what is going on in the black box and the black box can even learn you some things. The thing is indeed that people think that you will give data to that black box and it will solve everything. That's not true. We will always need humans. Yeah, we will need humans to help out um, understanding the domain, making the connections, asking the right questions, but especially, I think we need to do this bottom up from the academic world as well, where we teach new professionals how to work with this. That it's not some boss in a company that says to a young guy, now you need to do artificial intelligence within the company. Why? Because we need to do it. No, it needs to be driven by questions. It needs to be driven by really a need from the industry. And I think artificial intelligence can do a lot. I'm using it to predict, for example, the cows that are drinking. I'm using it to predict health events. We can think about pharmacovigilance. Um, you can think about really nice things, but you need especially a team of people that really understand these different aspects and then use it as a method. It's not the method, it's a method from which we can learn. Yes, thanks, Emil. And um, I think what you said, uh, like one or two sentences before, is that we need a team. Um, in my opinion, it's it's not possible for a veterinarian, or it's not likely that most veterinarians will will become data analysts in in their uh, free time or part time data analysts. And as well, it's difficult for the data analysts uh, when you work with them to explain the biological aspects of what we are facing here. Um, so um, I think what we have to stress and what also this forum here is stressing is that we have to work together. Everyone can support his aspects, his knowledge, his, his experience, and I hope together we will, we will make it work. <laughs> um, that said... We, um, it's the I, only way forward. Yeah. <laughs> That, that, that's it. Um, I'm, I'm sorry for running out a bit of time and for occupying your time with my questions. Um, with the audience, um, if there are any more questions, please type them in the chat and we will address them in the round table afterwards. Um, but now I have to um, introduce the next speaker. Um, thanks, Mir, um, firstly. Um, hear you in like an hour again. <laughs> and uh, now we'll come to um, our next speaker, which is uh, Dr. Laure Badwell. Uh, Laure is an extended co-worker from me um, from uh, the French Agency for Veterinary Medicinal Products. Um, she's also a member of the EU, EU Veterinary Big Data Team and um, she's a veterinarian by training. She worked um, in the veterinary pharmaceutical industry for 27 years 
um, where she was part of clinical and preclinical development and regulatory affairs. Um, until 2015, at this time, she was recruited by the French agency as head of the pharmaceuticals assessment unit. And there she is currently um, responsible, for example, for cross-functional projects within the regulatory affairs. Laure, the stage is yours. Thank you for the introduction, Sandra. So um, um, I have the, I'm pleased uh, today to present you the, the point of view of the European National Competence Authorities about on, uh, the two domains of interest for big, big data, which are uh, monitoring um, of uh, VMP, veterinary medicinal products availability and forecast of shortage, and data integration and analytics in the area of antimicrobial resistance. So um, uh, there is a, a lot to, to, to say on each of these two subjects, and uh, as I have only uh, 20 minutes. My speech will necessarily be rather synthetic, but we have we will have some more time afterwards at the end of the of the session to maybe to discuss it further. So I will focus on the experience currently acquired on those two subjects in France, but also in the other European uh, uh, regulatory authorities that have communicated their opinions through a preliminary survey conducted uh, thanks to the CMDV. So next slide, please. So uh, first of all, uh, about um, the, the first uh, domain of interest. Um, so we, yes, uh, so big data would be of course uh, beneficial uh, for assessing and monitoring the, the, the availability of, of uh, veterinary medicinal products. First of all, for the veterinarians, because it's important to, to know if and where a, a VMP is available in, in the Europe. And um, indeed, yes, according to Article uh, 111 and 112 of the, regulation, of the new uh, VET regulation, veterinarians are allowed to get a VMP from another member state or to use a medicinal product for if there is no appropriate medicinal product for the treatment of the animal species. But um, for national authorities, it's also important uh, in case of um, reported uh, shortage to, to have a quick access to the information about the availability of, uh, of, um, of uh, VMPs and also about possible alternatives within uh, Europe. And um, it, uh, it, it will be very useful uh, also to provide such uh, information to, to stakeholders and also maybe uh, be uh, able to anticipate as far as possible any uh, consecutive uh, further availability issues. Because when one uh, very critical uh, VMP is uh, um, is a, uh, well, when there is a shortage, then some further shortages could be uh, uh, reported afterwards. So, um, but I, I want also to, to um, let you note that there is a, there are already some European initiatives implemented in this domain, in particular through a working group that has worked on the medicine shortages single points of contact called SPOC. And this uh, working group concerns mainly human medicines, but also vet ones. So what about the initiatives which are currently implemented uh, by the European national authorities? They, they vary depending on each country. So in some of them, nothing has uh, been uh, fully done yet. But um, for instance, in, in Germany, um, we we could notice that um, uh, the the marketing authorization holders are asked to report shortage, but on a voluntary basis, and uh, but it seems that it doesn't work uh, fully well, and uh, the BVL hopes to to get the information uh, out of the European database, the UPD, in the near future, but uh, there seems some improving. Uh, uh, in this way. 
which is needed. And uh, in France, for instance, in, uh, it's also interesting to, um, to know that uh, uh, marketing authorization or orders are asked to report critical shortages of VMP and, and those presenting a critical risk. So both of them. And uh, a, a work was initiated uh, together four years ago uh, with uh, stakeholders to define uh, some uh, criticity criteria to define these shortages and also the way to communicate. And uh, today in France, ANSES communicates only on shortage confirmed as critical and validate and the, the communication which is uh, regularly given to uh, to public is um, is agreed together with uh, marketing uh, authorization holders and uh, and also uh, a good practice guide has been established uh, about this uh, this reporting and uh, communication on on short edits so, uh, but we're, we're still facing some limiting remaining yes, disparities in the reporting of information depending on the marketing authorization orders. So now next slide, please. Um, so what are the main bar barriers faced by the authorities uh, today? Uh, so we should note that for in Germany, but also every, uh, in all the, uh, the countries, um, Marketing uh, authorization orders, uh, yes, act in in a free country market economy. So some they could be reluctant to uh, disclose some informations, and it could be uh, something. Uh, it could be an issue sometimes, um, and also uh, some progress needs to be uh, made in in our uh, European database to uh, to uh, be able to get a report and get a complete information about those uh, shortages. And then to be able, to, of course, to get uh, quick access to, to the data. And uh, uh, what about the main needs um, of, uh, NC, of uh, authorities, national authorities in, in this field? Um, that would be, there would be uh, mainly uh, quick access to the useful information, but uh, not only for the VMPs, but also for active ingredients availability in Europe in order to, to have a quick and complete overview of the shortage situation all over Europe. And also at which level it occurs, if it's only on the, at the manufacturing uh, level, I would say at the marketing authorization holder level, or uh, also at the wholesaler distribution uh, level or to the market for, for the vet's use. And also to be able to better assess their impact and the possible alternatives. And uh, also it, um, the needs are, yes, to be able to, to well communicate uh, in an accurate and appropriate uh, manner. And uh, for that, um, the, the level of criticity would need to be defined and agreed with the stakeholders and also the criteria for communication as it is already defined in, in some countries uh, like uh, France. So now uh, about the, the proposed um, recommendations. So next slide, please. Um, so, the first recommendation would be to to be able to uh, have a quick access to the useful data in uh, in the UPD, the European database, and uh, but in in a, in a well formatted uh, way, and uh, that we could uh, all, not only uh, search for uh, VMP shortages, but also for active ingredients. Uh, um, shortages and and also uh, to to get uh, information on indication and animal species in in order to be able to find out quickly some alternative uh, possible alternatives so uh, and secondly because so far it seems that in the UPD uh, only temporary unavailability is is reported so it should be further documented if we uh, wish uh, 
a quicker and a more complete access to the data. And also we have to work on, on the availability of, um, of, of uh, data and, uh, and, and also that with a common work with the originators of data. And uh, as soon as uh, wholesaler or marketing authorization holders don't necessarily uh, want to share some, some data, and then we have to find together uh, the best approach and uh, as far as possible to define an agreed policy at the European level to enable uh, authorities to be uh, aware of the of the useful information and and also to be able to de deliver an adequate uh, communication to the to the stakeholders so uh, now the second about the second domain so next slide please about uh, the um, data integration and analytics in the area of antimicrobial uh, resistance so uh, in in this area the so, um, benefit of uh, big data is is clear. It's well to to be uh, able to uh, um, assess some um, connection connection links between uh, the use of antimicrobial and and uh, and also the antimicrobial resistance, and also to better assess uh, all the um, the elements with could interfere with uh, or influence the antimicrobial uh, resistance, such as uh, biosecurity at farm or farm size. And, and, and uh, Janine's uh, legal presentation was very interesting in this way to show all uh, what we could um, analyze and, and then provide uh, such uh, nice information to the to the farmers themselves. So, uh, but the benefit would be also, of course, to to monitor the um, uh, the development to better assess the development over time of the antimicrobial resistance, both in animal and and human population. So uh, through the One Health approach. And, and the current initiative of NCAs, of uh, national competent authorities. So, of course, the initiatives could be variable according to the member states con concerned. But so far, uh, as soon as we are, uh, we have, uh, we we have to to report the um, data on on the antimicrobial use in animals, and um, then a lot has already been done. And uh, we we have structured data in database on the, on the and and uh, on use in in animals, but um, and and also um, defined analytics on animal on antimicrobial cells and also on the progress of uh, on the usage, but. Uh, so far, we don't uh, yet have all the data on all the species in all the country, <laughs> I would say. And uh, I should also um, note that uh, GIACRA, of course, already provides data on uh, uh, antimicrobial use and antimicrobial resistance in Europe, um, uh, not on a yearly basis, but at the European uh, level, at least. And it's uh, very uh, interesting. So uh, next slide. Please and uh, now the barrier uh, that we are facing at the authorities is to um, um, to, to to have more. Um, uh, there there still uh, are missing links between uh, antimicrobial resistance and antimicrobial uh, use uh, data, and uh, sometimes also especially to assess the use uh, the antimicrobial use. Uh, we still have to work um, on the on the quality of data and also for antimicrobial uh, re resistance. So uh, we also um, need some uh, appropriate uh, software, yes, to analyze the collected data. And we still have some issues about the quality or the harmonization or, and the res representativeness uh, of data. And then the, the main needs uh, is to to be able to to collect and analyze more precise and detailed data according also to to time to see the progression 
of the use and, and, and the antimicrobial resistance and also to the species, age and, and region where it could be done already in that way in some countries, but not in others. And then it would uh, help to uh, get a more uh, accurate analysis of uh, the link between the antimicrobial use and the antimicrobial uh, resistance occurrence. So next slide, please. Um, then the main uh, recommendation of the authorities in, in this domain would be to um, um, to get uh, yes more information um, on the uh, occurrence of uh, of uh, antimicrobial uh, resistance and more with more details and in this way the big data would be very useful. Uh, with assessing a, a large volume of data, and uh, but there are still some uh, training to be uh, supported, and uh, to to get more capacity at the authority authorities level to to assess uh, those uh, big data, uh, those big data, and and also um, we need uh, or to, to to be trained and and uh, to. Uh, yes, to also have a uh, hardware and, and software to be able to to set up uh, an international networking and and some collaboration to better yes uh, understand the the resistance situation uh, on the, on the, um, at least on the European level and um, also to to be able to assess all the the influence and the impact of uh, possible covariates. And um, then what uh, was also noted is that um, uh, it's well we we recommend yes to uh, explore if uh, this data could actually answer uh, the new scientific questions that are not already addressed by the surveillance uh, programs. So um, as a conclusion, so next slide, please. Uh, next slide. So um, I, I, to conclude this presentation, because it's uh, uh, very global uh, on, on those two domains of interest, two of the three domains of interest. And uh, I think we could uh, sum up the, um, the, this talk with focusing on the, the three uh, levels of importance uh, to, to for improvements, and uh, as as figured with this um, illustration, um, we could say that we 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 have to uh, guarantee the first of all the data of the source the sourcing data, which will feed the the system, and uh, and then raise the importance of the quality and uh, standardization and relevance which is not always easy especially where they come where when those data come from various uh, sources and providers and um, and then uh, it needs good co co and comprehensive cooperation with the, the the data originators and secondly uh, in terms of um, analyzing all this data, then we need uh, to, to have appropriate and sustainable processes and systems. And also to define uh, together and agree and agree on uh, analytical methods and modeling and, and simulation. And uh, of course, we also need to, to some training and, and expertise, appropriate expertise. And uh, at the end, uh, for the third level at the, for big data, I would say that uh, we have also to work on uh, being able to deliver uh, accurate, an accurate and reliable analysis with uh, an adequate and regular communication. And, uh, and in this way, it will help to agree on, uh, on some shared rules to, to uh, provide the, the, the appropriate communication. So, um, 
I will end with the, those, uh, those words and uh, not to be uh, too much out of time. So, um, so thank you very much for your attention and uh, I, I'm available for any question. Thank you, Laura, and uh, for being out of time. It's just like more pressure on Hesha because she has to like get it back. <laughs> so she has to speak a bit faster. No, um, uh, question from the audience. Are there any questions for Laura? we shall um, address now. Again, um, I'm repeating myself, put it into the chat or just raise your hand. So far I see nothing. No, then um, if it's okay, Lor, um, if any more questions arise, just write them in the chat and we address them in the round table. But then we will just um, head over to Hesha. Um, she is our last but not less interesting uh, stakeholder view, or she will present our, not an, um, the last stakeholder view. Um, it's um, Dr. Hesha uh, Dujirana. Um, the reason for having her last is actually <laughs> because um, a more pragmatic, um, because she got up early today for us. Um, she's presenting the FDA point of view, and there it's quite early in the morning at the moment. So um, that said, um, Hesha is a senior epidemiologist um, at the FDA. CVM Office of Surveillance and Compliance, um, where she provides epidemiologic support um, to various groups um, across CVM, as well as uh, developing a framework for the Center's Big Data Analytics Program. And she also co-founded and um, still continues to chair the FDA Data Science Council, which um, advises and provides support to data mining, pro um, support to data mining programs across um, the agency. Hesha, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak at this year's forum. As you can see, it aligns perfectly with the work I do at FDA. And to my German colleagues who are listening to this while their World Cup match is being played, I appreciate your sacrifice. And I see that currently there is no goals at 23 minutes in. Next slide. I'm here to provide FDA's perspective on two of the use cases up for discussion, pharmacovigilance 2.A and antimicrobial resistance 3.A. Next slide. The idea of implementing a solution which compares signal detection outcomes across MAHs or sponsors, ensuring data quality and obtaining harmonized safety outcomes is an intriguing idea. And we at FDA look forward to seeing the steps EMA and others take in that direction. CVM has extensive experience in the area of veterinary pharmacovigilance, especially with the hundreds of thousands of adverse of reports that we, we have in our database, including the roughly 85,000 reports that we have received in the past year. There's been a lot of discussion today from other speakers around the quality of this data. However, I would like to share with you the potential challenges that should be kept in mind as the idea of comparing outcomes across sponsors is explored. And while we absolutely agree that the quality of data is important. I'll keep my comments more to the um, challenges having to do with the actual process. We found that various sponsors have varying signal management processes, and if and when this effort is pursued, you should consider the differences in processes, for example, the types of statistical algorithms that are used, and look into efforts that may be underway to harmonize them. Next slide. Some of the varying processes that may need to be considered. Uh, the previous slide, please. Yes, thank you. Some of the varying processes that may need to be considered and potentially harmonized include how a safety signal is defined by each sponsor and how signal validation is done across sponsors. We believe that the detection of safety signal is not the end goal of pharmacovigilance, but just the beginning. It's of utmost importance to consider how quickly sponsors are able to identify signal and determining whether it's done. It is a de novo risk. It's important to validate the signal as a true safety signal and determine what actions may be needed to, needed to mitigate the risk. Though the idea of comparing safety signals across sponsors may be intriguing, it would be, in, it would be an incomplete discussion and exercise without consideration of what happens to that signal. How is it validated as a true signal and what risk mitigation measures are ultimately rolled out in response to that signal. Next slide. There are several factors across sponsors that can significantly impact the ability not just to compare signal detection outcomes, but the ability to detect that signal in the first place. 
FDA has found that the level of sophistication in pharmacovigilance programs is quite varied across sponsors. Things that contribute to that variability include the expertise, technologies, and data that are available at various entities. This also leads to the variability in how advanced and sophisticated the tools used for pharmacovigilance and signal detection may be. To go with that, it may not be worth certain sponsors' expenditure of resources for more advanced tools if the data sets available are too small. There are different factors such as market share that may impact the size of the data set. Next slide. Some key considerations to keep in mind if and when comparing signal detection outcomes across sponsors include the size and diversity of the data set. It may simply not be realistic to expect a sponsor to have a sophisticated signal detection program if the data set is not large or diverse enough to run adequate analyses. It would also be important to consider the types of disproportionality analyses the sponsor is conducting and if it's the best option for the type of data the sponsor is dealing with. Under the suggested use case, the specifics of the analysis would need to be shared by the sponsor so they can be compared. You would want to know the VEGA level at which the signal detection analysis is being performed and whether concomitant products are being included in the analysis and adjusted for. Furthermore, signal detection is not appropriate for all types of data. For example, when sponsors are reporting on adverse events in herds, we have not yet found a practical way to use disproportionality analysis. So while we can try to detect signals in those herds, how we the advanced statistical algorithms may not be available for them. So the open question, not just for sponsors, for all of us in the field of pharmacovigilance is what are the appropriate ways to detect signal for these types of events? Next slide. In addition to the topics I just shared, there are additional things to keep in mind when comparing signal detection outcomes. You want to know the disproportionality statistical algorithms and thresholds that were applied by each sponsor and that whether they are considered appropriate based on the current literature. You want to know whether the sponsor includes or excludes adverse events from such sources such as research studies and social media and why they made that choice. And you also want to know if lack of effectiveness, medication error, and product defects are included in the disproportionality analysis that the sponsor is conducting. Next slide. As I noted earlier, the idea of implementing a solution which compares signal detection outcomes, ensuring quality control and obtaining harmonized safety outcomes is an intriguing idea, and we look forward to seeing the steps EMAs and others take in that direction. However, the idea is much easier said than done. You would need to learn about the various variabilities that are inherent in different sponsor databases, but also in the ways that signal detection is performed. It would then evolve into a discussion of, as to how to account for the variability when comparing outcomes across sponsors. Next slide. Please now allow me to transition to the second use case I'll be discussing, and that is integrating antimicrobial use data with other data sources and developing data analytic methods. Next slide. FDA Center for Veterinary Medicine and specifically our Office of Research in CVM provides several dashboards that integrate next-gen sequencing data with sample metadata and other lab-generated data. These include the animal pathogen AMR data collected by the Veterinary Laboratory Investigation and Response Network, or VETLEARN, and the U.S. Department of Agriculture National Animal Health Laboratory Network. Also included is the National Antimicrobial Resistance Monitoring System, or NARMS, Resistome Tracker, and NARMS Strain Explorer. I'll spend a few minutes explaining the data that is available in these dashboards. Next slide. In 2017 and 18, respectively, VetLearn and NAHLN began collecting antimicrobial susceptibility data on clinically relevant bacterial isolates from different animal hosts, including companion animal species. The primary goal of both projects is to monitor AMR profiles in animal pathogens routinely isolated by veterinary clinics and diagnostic laboratories across the U.S. By developing a centralized data collection and reporting process, all of these laboratories, from all of these laboratories, data can be monitored for trends in AMR phenotypes and genotypes to identify new or emerging resistance profiles to help monitor the continued usefulness of antibiotics over time and to provide information back to our stakeholders regarding these trends. Next slide. 
The National Antimicrobial Resistance Monitoring System tracks AMR in foodborne and other intestinal bacteria using a One Health approach. NARMS now is an interactive tool that allows users to explore trends in resistance to antimicrobial agents from bacteria isolated as part of NARMS. Next slide. Resistome Tracker is a tool that can be used to explore resistant genes present in the genomes of different organisms submitted to the National Center for Biotechnology Information. The isolates represented in Resistome Tracker are collected from around the world for various reasons. Resistome Tracker's interactive interface allows users to customize visualizations by antibiotic drug class, compare resistance genes across different sources, identify new resistance genes, and map selective resistant genes to geographic regions. Next slide. The final tool I wanted to discuss with you today is the NARM Strain Explorer. This tool uses data from the National Center for Biotechnology Information Pathogen Detection Data Repository, but this tool, tool allows users to track NARM's isolates from different sources that confer resistance to one or more clinically important microbial, microbial Microbial agents. Excuse me. Next slide. Thank you for giving the FDA the opportunity to join today's forum. I welcome any questions, and I hope I've kept this somewhat on time. You you get the prize today for being on time. So <laughs> perfect. And <laughs> thanks all for the presentation. Um, yeah. So um, we actually have really time for questions now. Um, questions that are just going to Hesha. Um, the uh, questions uh, and the roundtable will start afterwards. So if now anyone has something um, to ask Kesha, especially for the FDA view, um, the floor would be yours. Again, raise your hand, please. No hands, Katarina is saying. Then um, you have to ask, uh, I have. Uh, I can ask a question or you have to uh, answer mine. Um, Actually, it's it's not so much um, on on the details, but more a, a general question because um, I think in FDA you're a bit further on the way ahead um, than we are. Um, so, um, considering our situation here in the EU, um, can you give us any advice on which pitfalls we should um, try to avoid? Um, so, um, some lessons you learned, what not to do, or um, what be a good approach, for example. So I think it, the, the key is to go as, to go slowly, you know, and that there are different tools available for different um, types of data to um, start with the simplest uh, disproportionality analyses first, maybe just start, we, we tend to stick with PRR. We feel like uh, uh, for the most part, that seems to work well for um, at the data that we have. We feel that EVGM can be a bit of a mess when dealing with veterinary data. It's not as um, elegant as the analysis that are done for, for human data. Um, so I, I would say keep it simple and, and, and go slow as you roll out a program. But I think there's a tremendous amount of benefit from having a robust data mining uh, program with, you know, for such large databases. And um, I also think that there's a tremendous opportunity for us to collaborate um, amongst our databases to be able to validate signal, in especially, um, you know, once we identify the signal, one of the toughest cho chores we have is how do we make sure that it's a true signal, um, and then we can do the real hard work of deciding what to do about it after that. Thanks, um, Rick Clayton actually is, is supporting what you said. Great advice from Hesha. Keep it simple and go slowly. <laughs> and yeah, I think that it's um, what we will do. Um, but also um, do not uh, lose the focus and um, keep going on and keep going straight on um, to our goal. And um, that said, um, there is also a question from Kimil Semil. I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, could you please raise your hand and you could ask a question by yourself? And we can put you on speaker. It was, was a very nice, even if very fast talk. And um, thanks for the presentation. I'd like to ask, could you say something about data ownership and um, public availability of this data, especially of the dog data that you mentioned? I'm sorry, what was the last part, the which data? Um, it was um, the DOC, the data on DOCs, on antimicrobial resistance that you have from pet animals. I think you presented okay, thank something. You. So um, 
Uh, so I can, um, I will actually defer to my colleague, Olga Sarek, who's on the line for that, uh, specifically on the AMR data, if she doesn't mind tapping into the chat, um, something about the data ownership and public availability. But I will mention the um, pharmacovigilance surveillance data that we have, and that is publicly available on Open FDA. Um, I'll just type that into the chat. There was an effort quite a while ago to be very transparent in the data that FDA has, and we tried to put as much data as possible on the FDA, Open FDA website. And so there, it is possible to do some uh, analyses of the data that are available to CVM. Um, there's data from Center for Drugs, Center for Biologics. There's a lot of data on open FDA. We have tried to do it in a way that it's really geared toward the more sophisticated data user um, because there's some there there's some data manipulation that needs to take place and then with the and there's about a million disclaimers on there that this is all uh, passive, spontaneously reported adverse event data. And so um, with all of the biases that are associated with that type of data. So FDA is doing our best to provide as much data publicly as possible within reason. And data also, uh, Olga also noted that the data is confidential for dogs, but limited metadata is available. Thank you, Olga. Yeah, uh, I see I was unmuted. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, great. Yes, um, Keisha, you know, providing great information. Um, we, we do have some metadata available. Obviously, we make sure that um, confidentiality uh, is kept and so, um, you know, there's no information about the owner, about the dog itself, but what is available is um, the location of the isolates um, and the state uh, where the isolate was collected, um, the, the, the date when the isolate is collected, uh, but, you know, the breed, the owner, the town, uh, that's something that's kept confidential. And, um, you know, that's one of the main ways um, to make sure that the veterinarians will feel comfortable with providing the isolates uh, and the metadata on those isolates. Uh, and we had a lot of discussions with the veterinary diagnostic labs that are providing the isolates and that metadata to make sure that data confidentiality is kept um, as a way to move forward um, to receive those isolates and be able to test them. I hope that answers the question. Thank you, yes. Olga. Tomorrow is a major holiday here in the US, so I appreciate Olga calling in today. I know almost all of my colleagues are out today. So. <laughs> no, we, we thank you um, very much for being here. Um, there is one more question from uh, Catherine. Um, I'm not sure, Catherine, do you want to go online or shall I just read it out? Because it's, um, or as I, I'm, I'm just asking the question. Um, Hesha, um, what is the FDA's view on the use of on farm data for pharmacovigilance? Is a question. Thank you, Catherine. My old friend, Catherine, who we've worked very closely with on um, a lot of issues related to signal detection. Good to hear from you. So I, I can't say we have a very sophisticated view on this. Um, again, I think the we're not, we don't have a good precedent on what to do with this type of data. So, so much of the companion animal pharmacovigilance has come from, you know, experimenting with the, what the human side has already done. And so I, I, I can't say that we have a, um, a view per se on how best to use that farm data. I would welcome Catherine to turn it around and to hear your thoughts on where would where should we start as uh, not just FDA but as regulatory and uh, regulatory authorities in general who have access to this type of data in terms of pharmacovigilance. Or to ask a more provocative question: Is it appropriate at all to ever use pharmacovigilance tools for on-farm data? Catherine, if you raise your hand, we can put you on speaker. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, and thank you, Hisha. Um, no, I was very keen on, on getting your point of view um, on that because 
it's, it's a discussion we are having here uh, internally at the, the BBL and then also with, with the European colleagues in general. And I think it's very difficult to use the on-farm data for pharmacovigilance. So I was wondering how, how your view is and if maybe you are already a step ahead of us because it is very interesting data. I have worked with data loggers in the past, but I, I, I see difficulties for the pharmacovigilance area. So I, I was just wondering your take is so thank you yeah I, we haven't found a, a, a solution of yet and, and i wish we had because you know there, there must be some sort of way and i think it would be have to be completely novel and not used and I, I don't think there's any other example that we can follow for this type of data since it is so unique and i think we're going to have to find a, a solution ourselves and we just haven't gotten there yet thank you for that question well, thank you, Hesha. Maybe that's something we can do in the future. Thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, um, then I have to thank all of you, Catherine, Hesha, um, for this, this talk. And um, I think now we are exactly in time to head over um, to the round table. So um, all speakers from the session from the um, before uh, lunch and afterwards um, are now um, connected again and are open for questions. Um, and perhaps for some discussion, um, I would like to introduce um, first question. Um, actually, it's not mine. It's um, from from James. It was asked in the morning session after uh, Rick Clayton's um, presentation, and it already triggered some discussion in the chat. Um, but I think um, it was so interesting that every one of us um, should participate and um, should um, get it. Um, so um, the question that um, that uh, James asked is: uh, once landed with a new VET regulation, so when we uh, when we um, finish all these problems we have at the moment, or these hassles um, that are there, and which additional tools or data sources should be prioritized. Um, he gave some examples like data mining, EVVET, um, data capture from VET record systems, or from social media. And um, so um, the question was initially to Rick, so perhaps he could give a first um, impression on his opinion. Um, but um, we would be also interested in the other um, stakeholders and also in the, in the audience. Um, what is your view there? Rick? Thank you. Uh, yes, I put some answers already in the chat so you can see those. Um, but you'll notice from my presentation, one of our prioritized areas was the uh, business use case 2D. And the reason for that is because it brought uh, a level of automation uh, to the way that uh, signals are detected in, and analyzed. So. Uh, for us, things that help to bring efficiencies, consistencies, and reduce workload, in our view, are to be prioritized. Um, obviously, um, processes that help to improve safety are critically important. Um, but if you, you ask for a strictly uh, business view, then it's reducing the workload because we have a lot of uh, quite a high workload on farm divisions at the moment. Um, I also made a comment about uh, data from social media, and uh, although I'm not an expert, my view is that it's probably not the most reliable data, but it could be a source of flagging up um, something that would then need further investigation to validate. But I'm not sure I would really prioritize that. Um, it might be better to go first for more reliable sources of data, such as and medical records, vet records. Thank you. I have to thank you. Um, um, this is Heisha, if I can please chime in. Okay, yeah, perfect. <laughs> I was asking you something. Thank you. So so, so I, I see the medical record data and, and social media being completely opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of data quality, of course. And so we've done quite a bit of um, consulting. Uh, we've had kind of a small short-term contract um, having companies come in and use their social media um, algorithms to test for signal detection. And we found for the most part, we haven't found anything in social media mining that we didn't already know about at FDA. And so I think that the, we haven't just, it's not for now um, with the current tools out there necessarily worth the bang for our buck in terms of using social media as a mechanism for signal detection. Um, we do have a small pilot with Banfield Test Hospitals here in the U.S., and so they see about 8 million pet visits per year, 
Um, they have a really sophisticated medical record system. And so we do have a, um, a memorandum of understanding with Banfield, FDA does, to be able to validate signal on their medical records if we find something that we're having difficulty validating ourselves in terms of whether something is a true signal. And, and we think that that has much more uh, potential for giving us um, good data versus social media does. Thank you. Thank you to both of you. Um, we have another hand raised from Kat Sterling from Zoetis, um, another um, um, view from the industry. So um, Kat, the stage is yours. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you well. <laughs> okay, perfect. So I saw this come, question come in. I'm not a PV expert, but I did ask our PV experts and I would echo what um, FDA Nisha just said about social media. Um, we do have an obligation to monitor our own social media, so it is something we do. Um, but from the feedback I'm getting is that we certainly don't have any evidence that um, something that's sort of seeing in social media is not something we're seeing through other routes, so that's certainly not a priority. When I did ask them, they were very much in line with the data mining and keeping that PV vet definitely something to priority. And that goes to what Rick was saying about tools that help us do this in a more efficient way. So that's certainly something that is of interest. And in the context of uh, vet medical records, um, the feedback I have is that there are initial efforts ongoing with a number of vet schools looking at that, but it needs significant effort from an AI and machine learning point of view to make any sense of the unstructured veterinary information to be able to use it in an efficient and easy way. So it would require quite a lot of academic investment first so that we can get away from simply reading case histories, which isn't a very efficient way of of dealing with it. So you would with vet records, they would need to be a way of structuring the information that makes it easier to mine that data and is then resource intensive to look at. So um, to the question of priorities, the data mining tools for even that is certainly the, the priority from an industry point of view. It very much goes to what Rick was saying about pro so providing or developing tools that make it easier and more efficient to look at the data and analyze the data. Um, thank you, Kat. Um, we have uh, one more uh, comment in the chat from David. I don't have a last name, David. Um, and um, perhaps if you want to elaborate a bit more, um, please raise your hand and we can put you on speaker. Um, it's about um, that uh, clinic data are actually the holy grail um, that we want to access and I can, uh, can support it a lot. Um, but also between the weakness of prescription and um, administration. So David, if you may be available, that would be perfect. Hello, sorry, uh, David Killett, University of Liverpool. Uh, so yeah, we, we do a little bit of work in this area using the, the SAVSNAP first opinion electronic uh, health records database. Um, and yes, I suppose my, my sort of general point is that really my experience would to be to see this data as supplementary to the kind of spontaneous reporting systems. Um, it can have a theoretical uh, benefit in terms of being able to actually estimate the incidence of adverse events. Um, that can be quite challenging in unstructured data, both because the description of the consult can be unstructured, but also the actual the way in which the prescriptions are described itself is unstructured, which can make it more difficult to estimate uh, incidents and then things like weights, for example are recorded, but they're not necessarily recorded on every consult. So it can be a little bit difficult to estimate the dose per day or you know, per unit time. Um, and then the second sort of uh, consideration that I have from a kind of clinical point of view is obviously if someone rings up and reports uh, an event, you can actually ask them whether the dog was receiving or cat was receiving the product at the time the event occurred or contemporaneously with it. Whereas when you're looking at the EHR data set, sometimes that information is specifically included, but often it isn't. So you, there isn't a kind of assumption there that prescribed equals administered, which is untestable in, in many circumstances. 
Um, so thank you for that comment. And um, when I was um, listening to what you were saying, um, what do you think? I, I hope it's okay to ask you a question. What do you think about an e-prescription? Um, because we were talking about beforehand um, that I think the colleagues from Ireland are already um, addressing this topic. And um, by using such a tool, um, it would be much more easy to um, to align or, or to, to harmonize how a prescription has to be done and um, what is included and uh, would also prevent any um, prescription out of the scope of a product. So um, perhaps that would be a possibility um, for the future. So um, what is the, your opinion or the Hesher perhaps? Um, or um, yeah, what is the opinion on that? What David is writing, yes, I agree. <laughs> Um, what what was the was the veterinarian's view on on that topic? E prescription. Perhaps um, Despuina, are you with us? Um, oh, okay. Um, Despuina is not not on view. Okay. Yeah, someone else who has an idea about it or wants to share his opinion. If not, it's not a problem. Just <laughs> just thinking about it. Okay, so um, we have no hands raised um, and no comments from the chat. So um, I, oh, we have we have a big comment from Mil. So Mil, could you two Mil? Okay. Ah, James. Okay, then um, perhaps we will just address this one. Um, James, could you connect again? Raise your hand, then we can put you on speaker. Now you should be on. Hello, can you hear me? Perfect. Hello. Brilliant. No, I'll, I'll read it out because it's easier because I think I tried to formulate it as well as possible. Because you stated that it, and warned us that big data is naturally very messy. And so I thought, should we be investing time in making our current data that's available or data sources more structured and harmonized? So I think even a number of speakers have touched on this of harmonizing structure and data so it's uh, more, more accessible. And one example that we've kind of talked about within the EU is maybe potential of generating a standardized template for the three text case narratives that are found in adverse event reports in the Union Public Vigilance Database. Because I thought we thought that if we had more structure to this narrative, um, then there, it could facilitate the uh, the AI data mining tools that are sort of developed in the near future. And obviously, as as um, has been mentioned as well as in, this could have benefits even in the meantime to facilitate facilitate our manual assessment of these case analysis because they are diverse and varying and I think you know, a structure may help. Um, I'm just wondering if if we should be investing in time in making the data that's available in our systems more structured at this point in time, especially the free text zones in these areas. That's all I'm trying to get at. Thank you. Rick? <laughs> ah, Mia, so, sorry, sorry, my fault. Yeah, no, <laughs> I wasn't, sorry. I was not, uh, I was uh, muted. Um, the, the free text is interesting. Um, my head would say, okay, imagine that you could standardize it. Yes, but that's always better. But the thing is that you need to start with something. And my first idea would be maybe if you have a, a large data set of free, Free text. I would start by um, using natural language processing to see if you can mine the existing free text, extract, let's say, the most relevant parts from that, and use that as input for the the structured um, um, forms. Because maybe you're, yeah. I would do it in steps. Another way. So keep using. I would so use the unstructured data first to try to bring structure and then use that as input for the structures. But don't don't wait for that. So I would definitely use the, the free text as well to give you an idea um, to uh, referring to my field. At a certain moment, we had a, a tool um, with which we were monitoring farmers when they were talking about animals. So we instead of uh, using, let's say, a WhatsApp function over which they were chatting about their animals. We looked at very simple how a uh, uh, tool, and then we monitored what they were saying about the animals. And when you then start using 
um, natural language processing, on top of that text, you can quite accurately predict what disease they are talking about. So then you could kind of say, hey, guys, are you talking about this kind of disease about this animal? And then they could simply add yes to that. And then via that way, you get a little bit of structure in the data set. So try to combine the unstructured with, with, with the move towards the, the other. That would be my um, thoughts on that. James, does it answer your question? Yeah, he says thank you. Um, uh, the same topic, um, I think um, Eric de Ridder um, from Elanco, um, he wrote some comments in the chat um, and uh, it seems that um, it would be good to address it in, in, in speaking. Um, so perhaps, um, Eric, if you would raise your hand, we can put you on speaker. Now you are on. Okay, perfect. Yeah, the, I, I would be relatively aligned with what the colleague Mill said earlier, that uh, there is a problem with having structured data to do narratives, because you will actually lose part of the data because people will not be able to fit it in. And part of the data, people will try to fit it in where it actually is wrongly labeled. So you get like wrong metadata and you get actually like data loss. That is a big issue there. So I, I would be inclined to indeed say, keep free text available, try to get metadata in as much as you can, but do not limit people because you will lose information and you will get wrong information. Neil, would you? I would agree with that. Answer? Yeah, I yeah. would completely agree with that. Yeah. So don't, especially, the, my fear would be that people invest too much um, in switching entirely from unstructured to structure and to find out that people love the unstructured way and then eventually you end up nowhere. So um, that would be my advice as well. Thank you. I, I would say ex exactly the same and could support it as well. Um, we have also a hand raised from Rick. Um, Rick, I think the stage is yours. Thank you, Michelle. I appreciate being allowed in because I wanted to make a small comment here as well. Um, we do, of course, have uh, the standardized list of terms from Vedra, which um, really helps to uh, make the pharmacovigilance data searchable. But I, I think my, my main point is let's keep it simple to start with. Uh, we have um, radically changed pharmacovision systems in the EU. We really need to learn how that's working and how, uh, and how it works in the future before we start trying to uh, build more sophistication in it. Um, now, I, I'm not a pharmacovision expert, but the, the thought nagging in my mind is um, we are supposed to be picking up important signals. And if we have to do data mining to such a sophisticated level, um, what, what signals are we searching for? The signals, I would hope, uh, would be reasonably evident uh, anyway from uh, normal analytical systems. The, the other um, thing that really struck my mind, particularly in the presentation from Laura um, in the survey with CMDV, was the extent to which, of course, people want data. Um, so there was requests for this data and that data, et cetera. My concern there is, ha have you got the people to look at it? We, we are swamped with data, and I'm told that national authorities are also uh, stretched a bit for resources and time, just like companies. Um, so I think we need to be a little bit careful about swamping ourselves with data if we uh, haven't actually got the resources or the systems to do anything with it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you as well. Um, I was just thinking that um, uh, Janine, um, because you are also um, quite an expert in um, messy big data, <laughs> perhaps um, you could give us your input from yeah, your stakeholders point of view. Okay, then um, no problem. We are just spontaneous here, you know. <laughs> so um, I have um, uh, there is a um, comment in the chat box from uh, um, Thomas Hebera from BVL. Um, perhaps he wants to uh, to address his topic in speaking. 
Um, if you could raise your hand, then um, we can put you on speaker. It would be perfect. Thomas, you, you can so much, unmute you. yourself. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I can. Yeah, thank you so much. No, I just wanted to add something because I feel that the discussion, in my view, turns probably into a certain direction which is, uh, well, we shouldn't go anyway. So we shouldn't be talking about uh, whether or not we are using any kind of data that is available, but how to use these data and to find any, well, uh, of course, way uh, how to use these data. Of course, I agree with Eric that it is difficult and there's a lot of data out there. We have, of course, limited resources, but this shouldn't hinder us in just establishing new methods. And uh, well, as I, I, as I wrote, we, we have a new legislation right now. We have no PSURs, no renewals any longer, so we have to rely on signal detection only. And the question is how we can uh, finally facilitate all the data that's out there to be introduced uh, into our system. And the, the issue is, of course, as has been mentioned uh, uh, very precisely, that, of course, the quality of data is very, very different. And, of course, we have some data out there which uh, needs to be mined anywhere is, uh, with, with uh, AI still to be developed. But nevertheless, we, we shouldn't uh, probably uh, stop using these data or even try to use these data because we have a lack of resources because this might be changing. And I fear that we are right now at the beginning. Of course, I'm very happy about the presentation from FDA so we can learn from each other and uh, maybe you have some solutions that we are uh, currently searching. So thank you so much for giving us a chance to, yeah, and, and, and the pleasure to join us even on the celebration day. Um, th thank you. And um, Hesha has raised your hand. Um. Thank you so much, Thomas. I, I would like to challenge a few things that Rick said and, and, and echo what Thomas is saying here. I think that um, there have been enough examples, especially on the human side, of data mining and uh, sophisticated disproportionality methods under uh, uncovering signals that we would not have found manually. And it really has to do with the sheer volume of data, um, especially for us regulatory authorities that we're dealing with. And also for this issue of having resources for, to be able to do pharmacovigilance, I think that that's part of the, um, the benefit that we have seen at FDA, that we are never going to have enough people to be able to read 85,000 reports coming into us every year, but we do have um, I would say at this point, a really nice way of being able to say that we have looked at all of those 85,000 reports, whether they be from a data mining run, whether they be from um, reading the individual reports if they're a serious um, adverse, or adverse event or a death report. And so um, it's something that we were not able to do just five years ago to be able to say for the um, events that were not as serious coming in that we couldn't somehow look at those events. And now that we can say with confidence that all 85,000 reports are touched by FDA, whether it be through a statistical algorithm or from manual review. And um, that has, we're never gonna have the resources to do it any other way except for using some sort of sophisticated um, AI mechanism. Thank you. Thank you, Hesha. Um, Again, having a look on the time, <laughs> um, I will hand over for the last question or for last comment uh, to Ivo. Um, he asked me um, to put him on the floor. So push him. <laughs> Ivo, thank, the stage is yours. <laughs> thank you very much. No, I, 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 I had a few questions at the very beginning of this question and answer session, and now I've got many, many more. So uh, let me first ask, uh, thank all the speakers because I think this was an excellent session uh, with a lot of different angles on, on, on big data. Uh, I, would, I would like to provide a few comments. First, uh, going back to what uh, Rick Clayton uh, put in the chat uh, at 10.31 to be exactly, asking about uh, the uh, EU health data space, whether it should be separate for VET or uh, we would include it in there. I think what we should aim for, Rick, is, is, a, is a separate one, uh, even though ideally uh, the data should be combined also to have that one health approach. I'm, think, uh, I'm afraid that otherwise we would be lost in translation, but certainly something worth of being investigated. And also your remark about the agricultural data space uh, that is planned is much appreciated. I think 
that would be too limited uh, to, to farmed uh, uh, livestock and not, so, not necessarily take into account all the other uses of uh, veterinary medicinal uh, products. Listening to the discussion uh, uh, that we just had uh, and when um, Sandra tried to prompt uh, uh, us to give a comment on e-prescription, I do think, and actually I'm convinced that e-prescription, uh, you know, mandatory uh, in the union in a standardized way could be a, a really excellent way of supporting pharmacovigilance, uh, monitoring the use of antimicrobials, monitoring sales, uh, looking at shortages, um, all that, uh, because it, it would help us in, in directly linking what we see with actual products that are uh, being used and the, the animals and the animal owners. So it would make, if properly uh, designed, uh, you know, th those analyses much easier. 10 years from now. I'm not saying that we can do this next year or even in the coming three to five years, but it certainly holds a promise uh, for the future. I do agree with, with, with Rick on this remark on pharmacovigilance that, that um, possibly you know, data mining, etc., would be uh, overshooting it uh, when it is uh, about the, 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 uh, trying to detect you know, the signals that should be evident. But where I do see big data in relation to Pharmacovigilance is possibly in a different area. Big data, and it is called big data for a reason, allows us to combine different uh, data sets and allows us to look at, uh, for example, combinations of medicines that may create problems in the field where the single use of these individual medicines does do not uh, create any problems. Um, it, it, it allows us to look at other cofactors possibly even environmental cofactors uh, in, in some of the adverse effects that we may be looking at. So for me, that is an area where I think uh, in the future uh, we find big data, for example, in relation to, uh, to pharmacovigilance. I would like to compare it, uh, the development of big data and, and, and how we are going to develop real use cases and, and how we have to deal with the big data because I recognize all the the, the points that Mule made here as well um, to um, DNA sequencing. DNA sequencing, uh, when I uh, uh, was a student uh, not 40 years ago, uh, DNA sequencing was something which was very laborious. Even the analysis was very simple. Um, we, 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 we really were at the very beginning of what can we do with DNA sequencing. Nowadays, you can sequence a complete genome uh, in uh, a matter of uh, hours, and you can you can and you can do better analysis on it. You can compare it indeed in databases with uh, other sets of genomes. If you look at that field, how it has developed, I imagine that big data will develop um, in a similar way and um, has already developed to some extent. But it is always about asking the right questions, uh, and only that will provide you with the uh, with the right uh, with the right answer. So, with that, and and without uh, asking specific questions to anyone, uh, I would like to give back to you, Sandra. Please. <laughs> Thanks, Amol. They actually made my job a bit easier because uh, the last ta uh, task for today is to give a conclusion from my side. Um, but I think um, Ivo gave um, like half of the conclusions I have on my written notes here. So. Um, Unfortunately, we don't have more time for the session, so I want to thank the stakeholders, but also the participants um, from the audience for your input and uh, for the points you made. Um, I think we all have heard some very good ideas and also got some tasks for the future, um, how to further um, uh, shape this process and um, also that perhaps some incentives are needed um, by different um, stakeholders or by different data providers. Um, so to summarize um, just briefly um, what our ideas or what our conclusions may be is that um, we need to adopt um, a sustainable work plan, um, a more detailed work plan um, for the implementation and um, for the prioritization of um, the use cases we presented today. And this should be um, driven by needs and by also by the wishes, um, for sure, from the stakeholders. Um, I think um, in the next years, or in the, in the hopefully not too far future, um, we should um, try to set up a multidisciplinary platform um, to 
further um, mobilize um, the stakeholders to um, facilitate the interaction um, to integrate um, one health um, into our big data strategy and um, yeah to, to further um, um, drive the implementation of, um, of um, yeah, our action plan so the most hurdles we have to take are the data requirements so on the one hand, um, we have the problem with uh, dependent and independent data um, to organize this data, uh, so data governance. Um, we have um, the pro we have the task to identify and um, access uh, data sources, but um, actually, Ilaria, we are already working on it. So <laughs> um, we have the problem with the control of the quality of data um, we need to tackle somehow. And um, then the independent analytics and the statistics. Um, so Emil, um, I think, gave us a good overview on that topic. So um, overall, while this all sounds um, like a lot of work <laughs> and quite high hurdles, um, I think um, we can le learn from our colleagues, um, for, uh, um, for example, from the human division, but also um, from the way over, over the ocean, from the FDA colleagues. And um, I think together with all the stakeholders, um, we are in this together and we are shaping this process. So um, the task we have is to do it together and um, everyone can give his input and um, yeah, then we will see what we will reach together. And I think we can reach quite a lot in this topic. And um, so my last sentence is actually a citation um, I like quite a lot um, that says, um, a new era doesn't come from nothing. New thoughts, values, and methods will be established after overcoming various hurdles on the way. So um, nothing saying it's easy, but um, yeah, we will do it. <laughs> That said, um, now I can send you to your coffee break. Um, actually, it's more like an espresso break <laughs> because <it's laughs> we are a little bit out of time, as always. No, um, we actually want to start again at half past. Um, so I'll buy it on the agenda. It's saying 15.40. We just want to um, address 15.30. So um, see you back in 15 minutes time. <laughs> Okay, we're uh, back again, and uh, welcome uh, for uh, the last session uh, of today, uh, which has the uh, illustrious title, The Big Picture on Big Data. So I hope we can really provide that uh, for today. The, the, moder the moderator of uh, today's session is uh, Dr. Katrina Sterling, also known as Kat. Uh, and, and Kat graduated from the University of Edinburgh with a degree in virology before doing a PhD in veterinary immunology at Purbright Institute, and then spent four years as a postdoc at Purbright working on DNA vaccines for foot and mouth disease virus and African swine fever virus, before joining UK Veterinary Medicine's directorate. And then after two years at the VMD, she moved to the dark side to Pfizer Animal Health, now Zoetis, focusing on regulatory affairs, and she's currently director of regulatory affairs focusing on companion animal vaccines. And I, I can only say, uh, Kat is a, a very valued colleague. I uh, always appreciate the discussions that we have. So Kat, uh, you've got the floor. Please go ahead. Thank you. So um, this last session is titled The Big Picture for Big Data. But actually, I think having the earlier um, presentations, etc. So I was just saying that I think this so while this session is entitled the big picture for big data and was intended to give us a view beyond the regulatory context i think what you'll see as you listen to the speakers is actually a lot of what they're going to talk about while outside maybe the current regulatory context actually much of this work is things that will have an impact in a regulatory context whether it's around understanding the use of medicines or the way in which we use medicines or the need for medicines or the impact our medicines are having in a, in a wider context, whether that's around antimicrobial resistance or, or other factors. So we've got some great speakers lined up. Um, we're going to start with um, two colleagues from EFSA. Uh, we have um, Konstantinas Karaskavalopoulos and Mirko Rossi. So Konstantinas um, is currently working within EFSA's chief scientific office as a scientific project coordinator and the team that supports EFSA's preparedness for future risk assessment requirements by advancing um, scientific themes and fostering connectivity and partnerships across member states and other EU agencies. Prior to joining EFSA, Costas worked on GMOs within EFSA, and before that he had an academic career as a researcher in molecular and cellular biology and biochemistry. And Mirko, um, again with EFSA, 
as a doctor of veterinary medicine with a PhD in epidemiology and control of zoonosis from the University of Bologna. Um, he also received a doctorate in genetic biology from the University of Helsinki. Um, his background is in genomic epidemiology of Campylobacter bacteria and other food producing pathogens and is currently a scientific officer at EFSA in the, within the unit of biological hazards and animal health and welfare. And he's currently managing the EFSA One Health whole genome sequencing system. And they're going to talk to us about some of the things that EFSA has been doing in the context of big data or data analysis. So we'll go to Konstantinos first and then Mirko. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. I hope you can all hear me. Okay, so yes, uh, thank you for the opportunity to come and join you here today uh, and present some information on what uh, EFSA is or will be doing actually to advance its capabilities on how it deals with data in general uh, to perform uh, its risk assessments. So myself and my colleague Mirko uh, would like to present to you a few, a few examples actually from uh, EFSA's work. Uh, focus on the use of omics. So I see here we have moved already to the to, to the next uh, slide. So fine, okay. So just a bit of general information to start with. So as outlined, it's uh, in its 2027 strategy. EFSA will uh, is and it will, will be working towards enabling a wider access uh, to and broader exploitation of data and analytics in order to increase its risk. Uh, analysis capabilities. EFSA uh, therefore is aiming to enhance and collaborative data governance together with member states and other agencies uh, to um, make use and integrate actually new data streams such as omics to improve on elements, uh, for example, on data uh, quality, interoperability and usability in line with the One Health approach. In addition, uh, another aim is to draw on artificial intelligence uh, enabled analytics and technologies. Uh, such activities will be supported by novel data services uh, and data products uh, that will be developed using uh, collaborative uh, digital platforms aimed to be delivered, uh, in fact, in a One Health uh, EU ecosystem. Next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, so just uh, coming now on to examples. Uh, an important uh, uh, area uh, where EFSA is actually making substantial in investment is to promote the use of non-animal methods, so-called new approach methodologies, for chemical risk assessment instead uh, of the classical in vivo data. To support this vision, uh, EFSA recently uh, completed a project to develop a roadmap for action uh, in this area to help define its priorities. Using NAMPS instead of in vivo data uh, studies uh, holds enormous potential, uh, in fact, uh, not only to reduce the use of animals uh, in regulatory studies, but actually to also enable a more informative, more precise, mechanistic risk assessment and therefore truly understand what uh, causes adversity. A challenge, however, uh, with using NAMPS is that no single NAM method can actually provide the needed information. So, in fact, different kinds of data need to be combined to reach usable conclusions. <clears throat> uh, thus, uh, EFSA is actually working towards devising approaches uh, to, for the generation and integration of NAMS data coming from many and several uh, different types of uh, data sources, some of them possibly being classified as big data, an example there would be high content, high throughput screening, uh, which can then be combined with in silico, in vitro uh, data, omics, uh, epidemiology, and where possible human biomonitoring bio data. And of, of course, a challenge then being uh, to integrate uh, those different types of data um, and uh, also incorporate the existing in vivo information that is available which can still be useful with uh, the ultimate aim of, of uh, uh, concluding um, on safety using more precise risk characterization approaches. Similarly to, to EFSA, I would like to just mention here, uh, as far as we're aware, EMA, EMA is also promoting the use of uh, NAMS 
in the area of medicines in line with its regulatory science strategy 2025. Next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, so staying on on the NAMS area um, and based on the outcome of the roadmap for action that I mentioned before, six areas were actually prioritized as needing further scientific development. And for three of these areas, if you just please do one more click. Thank you. Okay. For those uh, three areas, adverse outcome pathways, toxicokinetics, and data integration approaches, already uh, a few projects were uh, launched this year to produce NAMS data and methodologies, uh, and of course, to integrate those, uh, those data. Um, one uh, project that I thought uh, I should highlight is, is that uh, in the area of data integration, a, a project was launched last year, uh, due to be completed middle of next year, uh, on actually using artificial intelligence methods for data search, extraction, harmonization, and integration. Thank you. Please, the next slide. Okay, so the second example um, is uh, the, the one on uh, advancing uh, on the use of omics uh, and associated bioinformatics methods and the project uh, to develop a roadmap for action on this topic as well will soon be starting and which aims to explore the use of omics in several EFSA domains. Examples uh, include the further use of whole genome sequencing data uh, in either currently applied areas, such as foodborne pathogen outbreaks, and uh, Mirko will tell you a bit more about that later, and also uh, extended to other areas such as animal and plant health. In addition, another aim is to facilitate the use of other types of omics data, such as metagenomics, metabolomics, including multiomics approaches, for instance, to identify novel biomarkers. Uh, it is aimed that uh, several challenges actually uh, will be addressed, hopefully, at least to some extent, uh, for example, on data generation, collection, and storage, including the implementation of um, on the FAIR principles of data. If you just do one more click, please. Thank you. Okay, in addition uh, to, to the roadmap, a number of complementary projects have actually been launched um, very recently to either generate multi-omics data or to exploit the wealth uh, of omics data in public databases. And with that, uh, that, I would like to thank you for your attention. I will now pass the floor to my colleague, Mirko. Thank you. Thank you, Kostas. So next slide, please. So um, I'm going now to show as Kostas introduced uh, a application that we are doing at the moment in EFSA, um, an example of our implementation and how we are using this uh, uh, new technology, well, it's not really new, but this technology in our normal risk assessment. Uh, next slide. So for who is not very aware about uh, uh, the use of original sequencing in auto investigation is a uh, a very powerful uh, is a keystone for auto investigation, not only in foodborne outbreak, but in, uh, also in hospital settings. And uh, as you well known, uh, with the pandemic and the uh, COVID, so is a way that we we do for performing uh, identifying a variant uh, which causes the outbreak. So this application in foodborne uh, outbreak is very valuable, as based on a recent press, is estimated an annual nearly uh, 400. $500 million uh, of, uh, to, um, to save um, a public health agency compared to a, a, a just $22 million investment. So it's very effective also in the point of view of uh, public health benefit. Uh, uh, several challenges uh, for its application, uh, mainly, uh, mainly political um, and, and which need required the quite complex technological implementation. So the challenges are uh, the cross-sectorial interaction, mandate to move between, for example, food sector and public health sector, the comparability just data, the, the availability in time manner, so it's important to have the data in a, in a, in a time that is usable for the outbreak, and of course the political barriers for sharing. Next, please. In 2017, as an ECDC, I received from Commission 
an initial feasibility study mandate, uh, which had been published in 2018, uh, and the mandate was aimed for investigating possible implementation um, strategies for applied WGS secrecy data collection and use at European level. During that time, EFSA identified several uh, strategic elements to be taken into account, which are listed on the right. In particular, what is um, very relevant are, of course, uh, the IT architecture of the environment we are working with, uh, the transparency, uh, the new changes in transparency in the, in the, regu in the regu uh, general food law, the engagement with the member states to overcome political issues in sharing, the uh, correct controlling of the data ownership and uh, of the data confidentiality. Next slide. For that reason, uh, uh, in 2019, FCNCC received a full-up mandate uh, with the actual uh, required for an implementation. Uh, in this mandate, the requests are asked to produce two ind independent interoperable systems, one also in CDC, one also in EFSA. Uh, and this system, this system are uh, uh, each responsible for the collection of their own remit in the, uh, for WGS data from food, feed, animal environment for what concerns the EFSA system and the human data from a CDC system. But the two systems need to be interoperable. They need to be uh, able to uh, exchange typing data and the epidemiological data on demand uh, for allowing joint microbiological cluster of human and human food and pathogen isolation. Next slide. This is a, a, a cartoon of the current implementation. Uh, on the top, you see uh, um, the representation of the EFSA system on the bottom, the CDC system. What is relevant for you to understand is that the two systems are uh, specular. They, they produce the same type of result in the same uh, data model and same data semantic. Uh, they are independent in interacting with their own data providers and, uh, and managing their own identities and the way the people can access to their respective system. But the two systems are interconnected each other to um, um, Machine, machine to machine protocols to allow a constant and supervised and non supervised, non human supervised data sharing. Next, please. The objective of the system are to collect genome profile from foodborne pathogen in the remit of EFSA, so food, feed, animal, and related environment, with the final aim to build database of genomic profile which is support uh, the foodborne out of investigation. And hypothesis building. For that specific objective, the member states are invited on voluntary basis to submit data to the system. Um, the, second, the second main aim is uh, to uh, be supportive in its CDC during the auto investigation. Um, and that is uh, um, somehow uh, supported uh, uh, real time investigation. And this is also supported by the general food law, which is uh, um, impose the member state to participate in providing data in case of this type of events. And the third point is that we, we should develop uh, uh, as much as possible user-friendly interfaces um, a good protocols for allowing our data provider to interact, with, uh, to interact with our system and to collect the maximum of the added value that we can offer to them. Next slide, please. So here, just to tell you the type of data, I mean, the, 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 uh, the aim today is discussing about how we use data for performance assessment, in particular, how we manage uh, in our uh, presentation big data. So it's, they are not really big data in an actual current sense, but uh, definitely are big files, which uh, uh, we're collecting. Uh, we're co collecting uh, what we call raw sequence reads, so the sequence uh, that have been produced directly from the machine, sequencing machine what we can uh, simplify calling FASTQ, just for you for, for understanding the next slide. We are um, transforming this FASTQ in uh, typing data through an analytical pipeline, which is represented by the tube. And this typing data is very light, very small compared to the original row sequence reads. And in addition to that, we uh, um, um, enrich the data or the experimental data by uh, uh, providing uh, uh, to the system also ep epidemiological data, which are the information related to the food, feed, and animal sample from which the pathogen isolated linked to the genomic profile originated. Next slide, please. 
So here is like a little cartoon. So we have uh, uh, two uh, ways to, to collect this type of data. So this EFSA, which is represented by this house, uh, uh, has in his house the, uh, by co the computer resources and the bioinformatic uh, tools to digest the FASTQ data. So what we ask uh, the, uh, the member state to transfer the FASTQ, so the regional raw reads to our house. Uh, next slide, next, if you click, then uh, that will transform uh, through the WGS portal, which is our, our application. Next. This will transform that in a typing data where we store it in our database. Next slide, next click. When uh, uh, we also design a way to move the, the pipeline to uh, from our uh, premises to the member state premises, just to uh, distribute in open resource, in, in open repository, our bioinformatic tools. Uh, next slide, please. That will allow the, uh, the member state on their computer resources to transform the FASTQ in uh, typing data. Next. Which is then be possible to uh, automate through a programmatic submission directly to our database. This is, of course, these two models of data submission are uh, available both to our member state, which is can accommodate a different level of uh, um, development, member state level, on the possibility to use this type of uh, uh, big data, but also uh, reflect the way that we can um, uh, ensure different way to manage this type of. Uh, uh, let's call it big data, although it's not uh, extremely big. Next slide, please. Um, but in EFSA, we are doing uh, uh, several other um, intelligent use of the data we are collecting from member states. Uh, we perform a lot of digitalization, uh, and uh, we are using that uh, for performing our risk assessment, uh, but also for offering to uh, the public the possibility to uh, browse our, our data. The first example with the next slide is uh, uh, we are digitalizing and preparing uh, um, story maps and dashboards, for example, of uh, foodborne outbreaks data that the member states submit every year to EFSA in the, in the framework of our uh, annual zoonosis report, or as you call it now, One Health uh, report. Uh, in this case, we can uh, um, uh, optimize and maximize the use of the data the member states share, offering the opportunity to the public uh, to uh, browse and compare through the dashboard uh, the different, uh, for example, the source of the outbreaks, uh, the dis different distribution of the food type uh, across the years across the member states. Next slide, please. An ex another example of uh, the use of uh, multiple uh, source data um, which include, uh, if not directly, for example, the use of WGS is uh, uh, what is what is well known by our colleague in is the YACRA uh, report. Uh, the YACRA report integrates analysis of antimicrobial consumption, uh, AIMR resistance in both animal and human. Um, and this is a classic example where multiple source of data and big data in terms of um, uh, multiplicity type of data need to be analyzed in the chest can produce high, high relevant uh, results for uh, uh, supporting risk managers and risk assessor uh, in the future and in the context of AMOS, of course, uh, in new developments of uh, pharmaceuticals. So next slide. I guess i done. So I leave to, to the chair the floor. Thank you. Thank you both. Really interesting two examples there. And I think the first one, uh, with, particularly with concerning NAMS, the, the timing is, is very good right now. There's a lot of um, exploration of trying to progress these forward much faster and sharing of data and expertise and use of big data in this context between different agencies and different industries is, is certainly something that's very topical right now. And I think we have a lot of opportunity there. And at the same time, Mirko showed you at the end, the examples of where the WGS, the whole genome sequencing and all of this data analysis within EFSA links back to what we're doing in the medicine sector in the context of antimicrobial resistance and the way in which we're using antimicrobials. And in the future, it may also help us understand the potential positive beneficial impacts of alternatives to antimicrobials. So I think we have time to allow one quick question from the floor if anybody has one online, if we see any hands. I don't see anything in the chat. 
Katerina. We um, have a hand raised by someone named Georgia. I'm going to unmute you now. Go ahead. Thanks, Sherry. Georgia, do you, need, ahead, do you want to ask a question, Georgia? Or you just no, 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 no. Unfortunately, it was a mistake. Not a problem. Thank you, Sherry. Okay. In that case, let's move on to our next presentation. We're going to hear from a, uh, the World Organization for Animal Health, so WOHA, previously OIE. Again, it's a double presentation. So we hear first from Lena Awadi, um, the veterinary epidemiologist working for WOHA. She's got 11 years' experience in international organizations related to these surveillance reporting, epi analysis of animal health data, and uh, health information systems and data management. Uh, and she's currently contributing significantly to the management and modernization of WOHA's World Animal Health Organization information system, and is currently involved in the data integration activities. And also from Dr. Andreas Garcia Campos, um, again a veterinarian, is a PhD in veterinary parasitology, um, previously worked for the HPRA in, in Dublin, um, and he's now he joined WOHA in 2022, so just July in the summer, and his mission is to contribute to the scientific excellence and integrity of WOHA activities in alignment with strategy on AMR and prudent use of antimicrobials. So again, two different aspects from WOHA of the ways in which they're looking at data and data analysis. So Melina and Andreas, take it away. Thank you very much, Kat. Um, so I'm going to start this presentation. Uh, I'm going to, um, so I'm going to uh, start the presentation on the World Organization for Animal Health and talk about the current data analytics experience. And also, we're going to talk about the future direction to travel. And as uh, uh, Kat mentioned, it's going to be a, a presentation made with uh, Andres um, um, in the second part. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so we are going to divide this uh, presentation in three main parts. So first, a quick introduction on the organization and also um, what is our mandate and what we are, where we are in terms of digitalization. Then we'll take you through two successful stories uh, in terms of uh, digitalization in the organization. So the World Animal Health Information System and the Animal Antimicrobial Use System. And then um, we will uh, also say a word of, about the future direction of travel. Next slide, please. Next slide. So the World Organization for Animal Health, as you can see on this slide, is um, an organization that is almost uh, 100 years old. <laughs> now it was founded in 1924. Uh, and at that time, it, uh, it had a different acronym and a different name. People know, some people know the organization as OIE which was the former acronym and the current acronym being WOA. Um, uh, currently, the organization, which is an intergovernmental uh, organization, has 182 uh, members. The headquarters is in Paris. We work uh, with uh, many partners, uh, One Health partners uh, in public health, environmental health, uh, trade, uh, and other uh, type of partners. We also have 13 regional and sub-regional representations uh, in all the continents. And um, WOA works with reference centers for its expertise. We have experts in 300 uh, reference centers, laboratories of excellence and research centers across the world, more than 300 uh, of them currently. Next slide, please. So the main mission of the organization is to improve the animal health globally. And to do that, we really have a variety of different activities related to animal health. And for this, we manage a lot of data and we also analyze this data. So um, the major part of the data is really the management of data provided by the members of the organization, by the countries. And this has been done since its creation with a mandate that was provided by the members 
and that are based on standards of the organization. So we currently manage a lot of data collected to many different ways. Um, as we said, we have information systems in place with periodic reporting from members, and this is probably the majority of data that we manage. But we also uh, manage data that are coming from surveys. We also manage data that are non-official coming from epidemic intelligence systems and other source of information. When we manage all this uh, data, uh, what is very important for the organization is the data confidentiality aspect, of course. And um, also, before we really start to take you through the different system, I would like to highlight that we don't really manage big data, um, but we manage databases with global coverage. And also, the last point I would like to highlight on this slide is that the digitalization uh, of the data and of the systems in place is currently one of the main strategic objectives of the organization. So there is a plan that goes until 2020, 25, to really implement digital transformation in the organization through a WOA data strategy. And this is a strategic objective. Next slide, please. So uh, for the successful stories, I'm going to start with the example of WAHIS, the World Animal Health Information System, uh, before uh, leaving the, the hand to my colleague Andres to present uh, Animus. So about WAHIS, uh, thank you. Um, uh, before we go into the details, maybe I should say that the, the organization has a long history of collecting and sharing disease information and data. Um, as I said, the organization was created in the 20s, and uh, it was alre already at that time there was a um, data collection uh, process in place. All was done with paper, as you can imagine. We have tons of archives of the papers collected uh, since then. In 1996, we had the first digitalization of the data with a system called Handy Status. And then in 2005, we launched a more modern system that was called World Animal Health Information System, known as WAHIS. Since 2005, there has been already three rounds of modernization of WAHIS. Uh, so you see, this is really uh, this has been a lot of uh, a lot of work for the organization since in creation, and it's always work in progress, never ending. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to quickly present WAHIS. Here, we um, the WAHIS aims at collecting disease information. So this is the, the logic of the system. So the data first come from the field actors that see outbreaks on the field. And then this information is shared with official national services at the central level. And the official national services are the services in charge of a trans of um, notifying this information to WOA through WAHIS. And we have um, a constant dialogue with the official national services so that they can do this activity of notification. Um, after it is notified in WAHIS, we have a step of verification of the information submitted. And also we conduct, conduct some complementary epidemic intelligence work to uh, verify the data. And then once it's all clear and verified, then it becomes uh, publicly available. It is published online. And you can see, so in this chain, there are several verification points. Next slide, please. Uh, in WAHIS, there are three main modules at the, uh, in, the, in the conception of the system. So there is a disease early warning module with alert messages for exceptional events. There is a disease monitoring module um, that collects information for 120 diseases twice a year through a standardized report. And then there is a module of contextual information where countries can provide data about the staff that they have for veterinary services, the laboratory capabilities, animal population, biomass, and other topics. And so the um, countries that are members of the organization, they have the legal obligation to submit all this data to WOA uh, through a dedicated uh, reports um, and structured uh, system. 
And what you can see is that the, all the modules of WAHIS are interconnected uh, because the uh, information is related between the different modules. Next slide, please. So this is how the public interface looks like with all the validated information. You can uh, access the public interface and look for the data as submitted by the members. So really each report separately, and you can uh, see separately the different types of report. Next slide, please. And users can also go to the analytics section where it takes the data from the report and present, presents them in aggregated formats with more visual tools, maps, graph, table, and also with extraction functionalities by topic. Next slide, please. So uh, yes, this is a, um, uh, an example of the extraction functionality where users can extract all the data that is in the system in table format in Excel files or CSV with some guidance to read the data extracted. Next slide, please. So um, considering this, WAHIS is really one system in the ecosystem of systems for uh, animal health. And really, uh, what, how we see things is that systems have different scopes and processes. So this results in specific limitations and added value for each system. Of course, the best picture of the reality is obtained by crossing databases and uh, information in these systems. But WAHIS is an essential source of information for other systems. And um, it, it, so the, the scope of WAHIS is really official data official data provided by the official uh, national authorities. And we know, we, we know that this data are uh, taken in other systems and republished in other systems. So really the impact of our work goes beyond the di direct users of WAHIS uh, system, it's, uh, uh, but also it goes to the users of other system um, uh, using this data. And also the other way around, other systems, they publish other kinds of data, like non-official data. They are of primary importance for us because we use these systems to cross-check information that we receive through WAHIS. So at the end, this internal connection between systems and the data exchange is really essential for analysis and informed decision makers. Next slide, please. Um, and this will be my last um, my last word on WAHIS. So just to give you an idea uh, for about the impact of, of WAHIS data and how it is used. So um, uh, these are statistics taken in November 2021, I think. So there were at that time there were um, uh, more than uh, 24,000 papers. No, sorry, so more than uh, 2,400 papers citing WAHIS in Google Scholar. Um, there were more than 46,000 pages, Google pages sitting WAHIS in Google. We noticed that really for early warning, other early warning systems uh, for animal health uh, publish a lot of data taken from WAHIS, for example, uh, systems of uh, FAO, like Empresai or other systems. And uh, we also see that um, uh, from the monitoring information that we collect, also this information is sometimes is, is republished in other systems, like for example, ProMed, that is another informal uh, uh, system of exchange of information uh, between the community members. And here we saw that 18% of their posts were based on WAHIS data um, for the scope, uh, the time range uh, indicated on the slide. Next slide, please. And the other way around, so what we do in WOI is we also look at all the information that is published in all the other uh, sources. And um, we use this information to contact official authorities when we detect a gap in official reporting. And at the moment, we can say that 10% of the alerts that we publish uh, are, um, are published thanks to this uh, complementary uh, work that we do for epidemic intelligence by contacting proactively official authorities to report. Next slide, please. And now I will leave um, uh, my colleague Andres continue the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Lina. Uh, yeah, I'll continue with the second successful story, which is the animal antimicrobial use database. So next slide, please. This was, the origin was up from 
the resolution given in 2015 during the 83rd and 84th uh, general session for our members who decided that it was a need to collect data annually on the use of antimicrobial agents in food producing animals with the aim of creating at the end a global database. So the, a new way of collecting this data was started and a questionnaire was made based on our terrestrial animal health codes and animal, aquatic animal health codes, which are our, our ways that, where our mandates are collected. So the questionnaire started in 2015 in an Excel uh, spreadsheet uh, format. Next slide, please. So this Excel file collected mainly qualitative data, qualitative data meaning the in-country situation about the collection of antimicrobial use in their livestock and also collected quantitative data. Now, because each member has different capacities and different methods for collecting, three options were given depending on the complexity and the data available for our members. So you can see option one, it just included the option to give the antimicrobial agents and the type of use. When we say type of use is what is for veterinary medical use, that means control prevention of treatment, or what it was used for growth promotions as in, for some of the members, gro uh, growth promoters are still allowed to give. There were other two, option two, which included the same information, but also the possibility to include the group of animals. And the third option, which included also the routes of administration. So since the questionnaires were launched, we have made eight rounds. The eighth, the eighth round was started, was launched last month. And from that, we have at the moment six reports in which 157 members have participated in the last round. As you can see on the graph, this participation is uh, globally ac uh, across the world. Next slide, please. And this is some of the information that could, we could get from those uh, from the sixth round. Uh, the seventh round is at the, at the moment uh, under assessment. So, but I, I wanna give the idea, the, I wanna show you in terms of the participation of the type of reporting, this has been increased from 2015 to now, 2020, we can see from 130 that at the beginning was only participating. Now we are around 157, 160. So the, that gives like shows the comfort that our members have to start participating, to start sharing the data with WOA, even though they still the owners of this data. We also have the complexity of the details of the reporting, we can see an increase, as you can see on the bottom right side, left side, in 2020, 70 of our members were able to make a reporting option three, the meaning giving more data, as opposed to the beginning that were only 29. And these rounds also allowed to start analyzing trends on time for the global quantities of antimicrobial agents and as you can see, these trends from 2016 in blue, as opposed to 2018 in green, we can see a generally decrease in the use by uh, kilograms of animal biomass. These are data that are normalized according to the animal biomass, which is collected from our WAHIS uh, digital platform. And finally, I'd like to show you uh, from 2016 to 2018, we can see a decrease of the use of antimicrobials. So there is around a 27% decrease in the use of milligrams of antimicrobials per kilogram of animal. So that means our members are starting putting measures in place. But this also helped them to start analyzing what are their situation and what other possibilities they have to implement to reduce the antimicrobial use. So next slide, please. So this is collected at the moment from an Excel file, but last month, the new round was launched and we were happy to say that this was transformed to a more global database. So now each member have their own, uh, can log in to this database and can interact, with, uh, interact and see and make their own analysis. We have a video here, but unfortunately because of time constraints, we won't be, show the video at the moment, but this video will be available for all of you to see at, um, 
at your best convenience. But if you could press the next slide, please. This is what members could find, and this could be also available for the public in the future. So you will be able to see the amounts of antimicrobials used in all these animals in a professional way. And for members, they won't be able to only not only see the data based on the region, but because they are logged in and there is a very strong data privacy uh, security, they'll be able to analyze this information by their own to make decisions and regulatory of, of policy making. So we consider this a very successful and members that they don't have this uh, platform on their own in their governments, they are able to use it on their own benefit. So next slide, please. So this was our example for Animus and because of the successful uh, experience with Animus and Wahis, we started to make a new progress or new di directions of travel. And this is a new program that we want to start. We are piloting for the global information alert system for substandard falsified veterinary products. So if you could press next slide, please. So our members recommended WOA to start initiate a program similar to what WHO has in their, uh, for their members. And this is a platform whereby sources of data, these are veterinarians, farmers, manufacturers, national competent authorities can submit any reports or suspicions of confirmed substandard or falsified products to WOA so that we can have a global perspective and we can send different information of alerts to our members to bring awareness and to see whether they need some capacity uh, support at some extent. Uh, next click, please. So we have launched a pilot phase which we aim to get information on the in-country situation related to the veterinary products quality and also receive feedback. So at the moment we launched this pilot in 2022 to 14 countries that are highlighted in this map. Um, next slide, please. And we collect this information based on two maybe uh, spreadsheets. Again, we're starting with the basis and then we'll get more complex uh, platforms. But we started with a baseline questionnaire submitted once a year just to get the in-country situation in terms of if there is a re legislation in place for author uh, granting registration of products or market uh, monitoring or surveillance, access to a laboratory, traceability systems in place. And we also have the immediate notification form which is submitted at any time uh, there is a suspicious of confirmed substandard or falsified veterinary product. I won't go in details about the details that we collect on those. Uh, next slide, please. But this is a pilot we launched in 2022 with 14 members using a spreadsheet. But by next year, we intend to increase the participation just to refine and customize the system better to know what's required for in the future platform. Next click, please to make a more global database that could interact with other platforms that we have at WOA at the moment, as, as the Animus explained before, or the or PVS, which is another platform that we use to test or to monitor uh, veterinary services in our members. We also want to have this platform interactive with uh, international organizations like WHO or World Customs Organization, but this is not, uh, is, more organizations are more than welcome to, to express their interest and we can discuss that. And we also want to have private and national competent authorities interactions for in, in this. And finally, the use of new mobiles or applications that could detect or help us in the detection of substandard falsified products that will be very beneficial. So ne next slide, please. Just to conclude this summary, so WOA Digital Transformation as a part of WOA Data Strategy, we are working on that and we think we are getting successful and I really encourage to continue EMA to this strategy that they have uh, because it's uh, very important to continue in that way. With official and validated information provided by WOA members, WAHIS reinforces its role as the reference database for animal diseases, including emerging and zoonotic diseases. WAHIS database data gains value through interconnection and combination with other external data. Public interconnectivity to be developed in the coming months, they will come. 
Animuse is the most comprehensive global database on animal antimicrobial use up to date, providing real and comparable data over time and across regions. And finally, these inspiring stories and guahis and animus leads to the development of other projects in, to cover our world members' needs as for the global information and alert system for substandard falsified veterinary products. So next slide, please. So that's all for me. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for your attention and like to thank the EMA for giving us the opportunity to come here and talk to you today. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, really fascinating information. And I think what you can maybe start to see in a, an industry point of view, certainly in the global context, is that information like this helps us understand the needs for medicines, um, the areas to target, the impact our medicines are having, and um, to, along with the antimicrobial use, the, the areas in which there are opportunities for alternatives and to understand where the re real needs are. So a lot of this information goes to what Rick was saying earlier in the presentation around where, from an industry point of view, data can help drive this investment decisions, decisions we make about the products we need to develop, where we need the type of products, and the, the, the where they're needed, but also, as Lena and, and um, and we're saying is that we give us opportunities to find areas to understand the impact of our medicines and also the decisions in which policymakers are making about use of vaccines, for example, to help reduce disease burden, etc. So all of this information is really useful in a broader One Health context for both industry and for policymakers. Um, I see we had one question in the chat. Um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to read it out. It's from Keisha asking, and I think this goes to Lena. Um, so you mentioned in your presentation that you say you don't really manage big data. So the question is, how does your organization define big data? And it's a good question because we talk about this a lot, is what is big data? And to me, sometimes actually just data is a, is a better description of it, but Lena. Yeah, thank you. Um, actually, our organization does not have at the moment a definition of big data, but, um, just in the in the general perception, just if we are talking in terms of size of databases, um, I uh, like our our databases are are really manageable, and the reason why is because what we are what we are uh, asking to countries is to provide data that are coming from the central official level. So usually this data is already aggregated at the country level or administrative division level, and also in terms of time is uh, aggregated by year, by semester, or by month. So therefore, our level of granularity is, um, is not uh, uh, so detailed most of the time. So it makes more aggregated uh, data that are still manageable in a, by traditional tools and that are not really in terms of size, uh, tremendous big. <laughs> Thank you. Um, at the end of the time, I have a few questions chat. in writing at the end of the story. So we'll move on now to um, another project. We're going to hear now from um, Professor Kerian van Schaik from the University of Utrecht. So um, Professor Schaik um, graduated from Wageningen University as a, in veterinary epidemiology and did a PhD in introduction of infectious disease into dairy farms. Um, she's worked around the world in the US and in Chile and previously with the Royal GD as the head of the epidemiological group. Um, and she's now currently at Utrecht University, uh, focusing on surveillance activities and other improvements in quantitative methods for risk surveillance. And since 2021, um, July, she coordinates the Horizon 2020 project called Decide. Um, I'm not going to tell you the detail because she's going to talk to us about the Decide project right now, and it was mentioned earlier. So go ahead, please. Thank you, uh, Kat, for the, for the nice introduction. I hope everybody can hear me properly. I, uh, I'm going to introduce the DECIDE project to you, a project about data-driven control and prioritization of endemic contagious animal diseases. Um, sorry, next slide, please. Uh, the project uh, started indeed uh, over a year ago in 2021. Uh, it will run for five years in total, and cur currently there are about 80 people involved in this project from 19 partners in 11 uh, different countries and all the different partner institutions are presented in this slide and it's a variation of, um, of 
governmental organizations, non-governmental organizations, universities, um, um, and management uh, uh, programs. So uh, it's a nice combination. And the idea of the project is, next slide, please. Um, to develop data-driven decision support tools and workflows that enable farmers, veterinarians, and other animal health and welfare managers to improve control of prevalent endemic contagious animal diseases. And that based on a multidimensional burden of disease metric. And this la uh, latter term, multidimensional burden, uh, I will explain a bit later in the presentation. In this uh, DECIDE project, we will focus on young and growing animals. So that's pigs, uh, broilers, calves, and also salmonids. Next slide, please. And we focus on the gastrointestinal and respiratory tract infection of these animals, of the, the terrestrial animals, because those are the main causes of production losses and disease in these animals. And for salmonids, we uh, look at specific endemic pathogens that are uh, related to growth reduction and mortality. And uh, the definition of endemic diseases in our project is that it's infectious, so they may spread between animals in a herd or maybe even between flocks, have the highest impact, and that's uh, the choice of gastrointestinal and respiratory tract infections, um, and lead directly or indirectly to antimicrobial usage, medicine use, etc., and negatively influence the value chain of animal production. Next slide, please. The overall concept of DECIDE is, um, please, is that we are first, um, um, just one click, that we are first, uh, one, we want to develop decision support tools based on data. Next click. And we do that by um, trying to find out what do farmers and veterinarians want? Eh? What do the stakeholders want when they make decisions about treating or not uh, for endemic diseases? So there's a work package five on social science. Click please. Then for this data driven decision support tools, of course we need data. And we are mainly using existing data, but also uh, new center data. Um, and the whole project will be about data variability. Can we share data in a national context or in an international context to be able to develop decision support tools that can not only be used in one country, but across countries in the EU? Then next, click please. Uh, there's also a modeling part in the project, package two, in which we create early warning systems based on this data. Not just that one animal gets uh, infected, but can we already predict that there's an infection going through a group of animals? Can we say something about the risk of disease spread within the herd or maybe even between herds? And can we then decide on which control measures uh, reduce this spread best, cure the animal best, so what is the ranking of these control measures? And for that, uh, a click please, uh, we also need to know uh, the economics around these control measures. And what initially is the disease burden and the economic impact of this disease? What is the impact of this disease on animal welfare is an important uh, pillar in our uh, project. And can we then rank diseases based on these economic and welfare impact and can we then see what control options do, what they cost, what the benefits are? And this all needs to be aggregated eventually in these uh, data-driven decision support tools. Next slide, please. So the overall structure of the project is that we have a work package for each of these um, technical parts, and data work package, data science work package, modeling work package, um, the decision support tools, work package, economics work package, and stakeholder work package. Uh, on top of this, we also have data leaders, because we said to be able to uh, really uh, develop tools that are useful, we really want to do that in practice. So we have a data leader for poultry, Jacques de Witt, for pigs, Kim Scales for cattle, Bart Pardon, and for salmonids, Ritz Bang Jensen. 
So these are the people that need to make sure that across all the work packages, we develop tools that are going to be used in practice. Next slide, please. So just briefly going through the work packages, it all starts with what farmers and vets want. So there's a work package on the implementation and behavioral strategies for animal disease management. Next slide, please. And uh, what is often done is that uh, we ask farmers what they want, bottom-up approach. And when farmers are not aware yet of the newest innovation, they may say, we want more horses, but they don't know that there is already something like a tractor that exists. So you could also provide these farmers with the innovations that you foresee, which is a top-down approach, uh, but then they may not think further. So what we plan to do is, next slide please, in our project is to ask farmers what they need. And what do they need to get the best products and the most sustainable uh, production process? And that hopefully will lead to innovations, concepts and prototypes that we can develop in our project. Next slide please. And we will do that with living labs an approach that guides the planning, execution, evaluation of uh, tools through the different phases of the tool. Concept phase in which you're still exploring what is possible, um, a prototype phase in which you have a first prototype, and an innovate phase in which you innovate the prototype further or develop it further for, uh, in a real life setting. So this leveling lab approach is our leading uh, approach within the design project. Next slide, please. Then, of course, we need data for our um, data-driven tools. So um, we need to identify which data is available. We need to characterize this data, and we need to acquire it and maybe combine it from different sources. Next slide, please. So the objectives of our data science work package is to explore the different approaches for data access and data usage to support animal health by um, uh, to assess availability and suitability of data to develop a common ontology. So we have to combine different data sets. You need to know what the meaning of all the variables in the data is. And we use the, the name ontology uh, to combine these different data sets. And to develop and test uh, alternate approaches for data access and define best practices. Next slide, please. And alternate approaches for data access, maybe Mil Hostens has already discussed this a little bit today, is that, of course, you have the regular approach of direct data sharing. That will be the default approach as well within the site, which we already started. Uh, but then there is also an option to centralize data and then exchange it between different uh, from different sources or even bring the model to um, the data provider uh, so that the data doesn't even leave the provider at the farm or the, the organization that creates the data but the uh, the modeling is all done at the site and then the results of the model are sent to a central database so it's code to the data instead of data to the code. Next slide, please. In work package two, we will develop methods for data analysis and modeling to provide early warning signals, but also to create um, risk, um, a trans the transmission, the, the risk models for transmission. Next slide, please. So the tasks, in uh, work packs two are about uh, multivariate and multi-level dynamic monitoring models. Those are the models that generate um, early warning signals based on, for example, uh, temperature and humidity data, feed intake data, water intake data, and a combination of data may indicate that something is wrong with your pigs, or with your birds, or with your uh, calves. Uh, we also develop disease-specific mechanistic models uh, to simulate pathogen spread and syndrome occurrence, uh, which we can do uh, use to rank 
uh, disease treatments as well. An inference algorithm needs to connect these two types of models and to make it possible to use them in a decision support tool. And eventually yeah, what this modeling exercises will do is create warning systems um, based on these two models um, that will give farmers and vets information about what to do in what case. Next slide, please. Then about the multidimensional burden of disease metric and the prioritization of interventions. Next slide, please. In this work package, we closely co collaborate with the GBETS program, the Global Burden of Animal Diseases program, which is led by Jonathan Rushton, and Jonathan is also a co-leader in, in this work package. We will determine the multidimensional multi burden of disease in the sense that we are not only going to look at the economics, yeah, which is most part of GBETS, but we also look in, the, uh, in weighing the welfare of the animals in this uh, multidimensional burden and um, and of course the use of medicines or antimicrobials yep. preferably we want to reduce the the, um, the use of antimicrobials or only use the proper ones and um, so uh, even though maybe some uh, use may be effective it might still be a, a negative burden because we are worried about um, resistance by using this medicine. So we'll look at loss and expenditure frontiers of the causes and the risk factors of the diseases, the current levels of allocation of, of, um, of medicine, of vaccinations, the additional costs and benefits of interventions and interventions in the broad sense. So next to vaccinations or medicine, also management changes improved biosecurity in a herd, etc. And eventually we want to say something about the relationships between health, diseases and welfare. Next slide, please. And all this has to be integrated uh, in data tools, in decision support tools. Uh, next slide, please. So we have the data. Click, please. Um, we have the models. Click, please. And from the models, we get information. Click, please. And this information can be in different forms. It can be a dashboard. It can be a signal. It can be a notification, which goes to the users, which are the vets, the farmers, or other health managers. They make decisions on what to do, and um, and together they evaluate the treatments in the herd. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, and then to concluding remarks. Um, the DECIDE project is really an integration of science with practice. We have uh, several universities and groups that can produce sound science. But we also want to create innovative tools for the different uses that we foresee and which are mainly the farmers, the vets, and other animal health managers. We will prioritize diseases and control me measures, which can be useful also for policymakers and research agendas. And when we rank infectious endemic diseases, you may be able to see where, where more efforts uh, need to be made. Because in our, uh, we believe that still, uh, the, the limitations of animal production are more related to this infectious and endemic diseases sometimes here in Europe than for, um, for other uh, sort of diseases. We want to rank interventions and optimize them from a welfare perspective, from a medicine use perspective, so a multidimensional burden of disease. And eventually, of course, we want to help in better control of endemic infectious diseases, which is an important pillar of sustainable animal production especially in young and growing animals that we are focusing on in the DECIDE project. Next slide, please. Thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions for clarification if needed. Thank you. Um, I don't think we've got time for any questions right now, but... Sorry. 
Um, I don't think we've got time for any questions now, so we'll move straight on to Professor Cook, who's our last speaker. Um, so our last speaker is Professor Alex Cook from the University of Surrey. He's head of the Department of Veterinary Epidemiology and Public Health. He's a veterinary epidemiologist with more than 25 years experience in international in, um, livestock and governmental situations and development projects. Um, his research interests are primarily in epidemiology and control of zoonotic diseases, especially through born zoonosis. And he's going to talk to us today about the VHive project. Um, Alex, over to you. Kat, thank you very much. And uh, thank you everybody for hanging on to, to listen to my um, presentation. Um, I'll go reasonably swiftly, so maybe there'll be a little bit of time at the end. Uh, next slide, please. So I just wanted to acknowledge at the outset that the work that we've been done, uh, been doing has involved a, a large number of people from different institutions and that we've uh, also received generous funding, particularly from Zoetis, who are a partner in our VHive, our Veterinary Health Innovation Engine um, initiative. And, and those people come from many disciplines, um, but a lot of data scientists, a lot of programmers, a lot of social scientists, and um, that interactive, that uh, multidisciplinary facet of working is an important part uh, of what we do. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to start off by kind of saying, well, well, OK, what's the problem? Why do we need all this data and this information? And uh, I apologize that this might seem a bit basic, but I thought it was a good idea just to start from the beginning, as it were. Um, and really, my position is that, well, animal health, as we know, is very much a spectrum from, from healthy to diseased. And any individual animal's place on that spectrum um, influence its its quality of life. Um, if you are um, stressed and unhealthy, then your quality of life, your animal's quality of life is not as good as it could be. And so vets, along with lots of other animal health professionals and animal keepers as well, our role is to protect that health and to intervene effectively when necessary, primarily, of course, for the benefit of animals, but also very much for their keepers and, of course, for wider society too, depending on them, for example, for food or for traction or indeed for, for company leisure and um, pleasure. Um, so if we think about that at a population level, what can we learn from big data? Well, we're looking for evidence about the frequency of disease, its occurrence, things that impact it, the, the determinants and the consequences. And we want to know that because we need to prioritise conditions for action and we need to design and test appropriate interventions, both medical and non-medical. Of course, at the individual animal level, we can uh, aim to monitor health and to detect the earliest deviations away from health so that we can return that individual to normality and enhance its well-being. And in the case of farmed livestock, this may be considered at the level of the group, the pen, the shed, the herd or the enterprise, as well as the individual within it. However, as we get busier and busier and as people's um, demands of their time become greater. Those individual animal keepers may not have either the experience or the time to be sufficiently sensitive to those early or mild changes in health. And that's where digital innovation um, can come in to, to assist us. So here we are, we're in the 20th, 21st century, uh, the dawn of this digital revolution, the fourth industrial uh, age. Um, yet I think it's true to say that animal health lags behind several other sectors in terms of adopting the opportunities that come both from data and from digital innovation. So much of what we do in our team is to think about how we can use innovative data collection devices and how we can apply artificial intelligence and machine learning in order to deliver step changes in the way that we manage animal health, provided, of course, that these innovations are indeed adopted. Next slide, please. So um, over the last uh, two, three years or so, what we have been uh, developing is what we call our Data Innovation Hub for our Animal Health, DIHA, and we think of it in terms of a data ecosystem. We think that there are, are many people, um, whether that's member of the public, whether it's government sources, laboratories, et cetera, et cetera, who have data about animals or about the conditions uh, around those animals. And what we aim to do through DIHA is to provide an ecosystem, to provide a platform wherein those data can be shared in order to derive new data intelligence. And we're very much looking, therefore, at how we can um, take different sources of data, be they commercial, be they private, or be they, be they open. Use iDiha as a, um, a platform for integrating and uh, application of research tools in order to derive new insights and uh, new uh, evidence that, again, goes back to the partners with whom we, we share these uh, in the first place. Next slide, please. So the principles we put together in terms of creating DIHA were firstly that data must be secure, 
Secondly, that it must be managed in order that the quality uh, is, is, is contained and sustained. It must be authoritative, so we must know what it is, where it came from, and um, that it is, it is appropriate. Uh, that the platform itself must be user friendly so that we can um, upload, share and find information within it. That data sets can be standardised for ease of use, understanding and interoperability. Uh, and finally and crucially, they must be useful. Uh, we're very much not in the business of hoovering up any data that might be out there in the hope it's useful one day. The data that we access and the questions that we ask are determined in advance. And through DIHA, we seek to provide those solutions. And I'll give three quick examples um, towards the end of this, this, this talk. Next slide, please. So absolutely, data quality has to be um, a, a top priority. And therefore, when we're looking at the uh, opportunity to uh, access data to, to enter into DIHA, we need to think about things like completeness, about uniqueness, about the consistency, the timeliness, the validity, and the accuracy of those data. Next slide, please. It's also essential that we understand the um, legal and compliance uh, aspects of managing these data and thinking about from uh, DIHA's point of view, both in terms of what that means as, as a platform user, um, somebody who may have um, be thinking about personal data and the legal basis under which those um, data are being accessed. And therefore, we think about seven key principles there, that of the, the lawfulness, fairness and transparency of our data, the limitation of purpose. So again, we bring in data in order to answer explicit questions. Uh, the minimum amount of data that is required to do so in order to drive that accuracy to ensure that we have adequate and sufficient storage uh, to allow those things to, to take place and to uh, assure again the, the data security, the, the integrity and confidentiality of those data in order that we can be completely accountable to, um, to our users in terms of what happens with them. Uh, and then in terms of data sets, we can think again, basically of personal or non-personal data, and again, the legal framework um, within which these operate. What it means in the end is in order to ensure observations, um, observance of all of these uh, statutory requirements, is that we create um, non-disclosure agreements and data sharing agreements that are explicit to each piece of work that we undertake. So it's very much not about it being a free-for-all within this platform. It's about uh, very secure and uh, carefully managed access for individuals and companies and others engaged in research with us. Next slide, please. So um, in terms of technology, uh, DAI has built on uh, a Microsoft Azure ecosystem and uh, our catalog includes uh, semantic metadata in order to make it easy to search for related da data sets. We have um, uh, very tight access control so that data that is placed into that uh, uh, ecosystem is only accessed by those who, who have approval to, to, to do so. Um, we've developed a 10-step a process, which I, I won't go into for the sake of time here, to identify from the first um, step at which we think a set of data may be appropriate for use, right the way through to the point at which it's integrated. And this enables us to think about building common uh, data models uh, and uh, a common format to, to make it easy to use these data together. Uh, and we use these in order to create pipelines that will um, generate the new insights for which we, we are seeking. Uh, and as I said before, very much done this on the basis of, of contracting each activity conducted within, within DIHA. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I won't go into this in, in a huge amount of detail. It's got a lot of similarity to um, the kind of things that uh, our colleagues from, from, from WOHA and uh, the DECIDE Consortium were, were talking about, uh, about earlier. Um, but essentially, it, it, it comprises um, thinking about the, the activities that occur within uh, the, the data system, uh, the software, if you like, the, the internal workings of that system, and then finally, the physical location of those data and how we assure that there is um, adequate exchange and security between all of those moving parts in our, in our system. Uh, next slide, please. So in summary, uh, if you could click, yes, uh, what, what it is, DIHA is firstly a vision to realize the benefits of a trusted, bespoken global animal health ecosystem that will deliver knowledge, insights, and products and services that improve the well-being of animals, people, and the planet. A vision's got to be uh, aspiring uh, and looking upward. So that's overall why we want to do this thing. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry, click, please. So in terms, first of all, what do we give? A web presence with a secure portal point of entry. Next click. 
uh, a no-code platform for ingestion, storage, access, and analysis of data, and we're acting as an aggregator of both private and open data, both curated and analyzed. Next, please. Um, but very, very core to all of this is the people, as I said at the beginning, a multidisciplinary team of core individuals who can in deliver the intelligence insights and click new knowledge uh, for animal health, one health and societal benefit. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry. Next point, please. So in facilitating interdisciplinary research skills and development within our own university, uh, including ourselves in our School of Veterinary Medicine, but also really importantly, our colleagues in the Center for Vision, Speech, um, Speech and Signal Processing, uh, which has a very, very strong, hundred strong um, uh, machine learning team. And of course, our colleagues uh, in, in Zoetis. Next slide, please. So I wanted then to just give you three quick uh, different kind of examples of some of the things that we've been engaged in. Um, and this goes back to where, where I started, thinking about we need to have um, evidence of, of need, we have to know um, evidence of impact, and we have to understand what's going on uh, in that wild world out there. And this is a project we did looking at uh, pruritus in dogs, uh, in collaboration both with uh, Zoetis and the kinship group um, within Mars, using a collar-mounted wearable called Whistle. Uh, which is used to um, look at the behavior of the dogs with which uh, that, that have this uh, monitor on, on their collars. We think this is reasonably big data. We have over uh, 4 million records of activity data, um, more than 126,000 uh, uh, clinical records from vets going into uh, Banfield hospitals in the US. Um, we use this to um, create more than 300,000 uh, alert data, and we had information in total on more than 24,000 uh, dogs, although only a subset of that were, were required. Next slide, please. So essentially what we did is that uh, we looked at um, a set of data from, um, from dogs, which initially uh, no intervention was happening at all. It was simply uh, uh, around about um, 6,000 dogs that were followed through time. And uh, amongst those, we looked for signals of behavior that indicated pruritus. And uh, what we discovered was that um, in that period of time, there were about 2,700 2, of these dogs where um, the, the itching that we could see on the monitor was not actually detected by, by the owners. Well, we, we know that indeed this, this behavior was associated with pruritus because at the, the center line there, uh, we switched on an algorithm. Um, so the owners were now alerted when itching behavior was being seen amongst these animals. And following that alert, there was an eightfold increase in um, submissions or, or the seeking of veterinary care amongst those animal owners, and this resulted in a rapid increase in the prescription of antipruritic drugs, which uh, clearly we, we hope and anticipate will have brought about an improvement in the animal's well-being. Next slide, please. So overall, that analysis of big data from the real world out there um, demonstrated firstly that this device does, in, does indeed provide an independent and quantitative measure of the degree of pruritus. It further indicated that some 40% of dogs that were afflicted were not detected by their, their, their owners and that the alert enabled or motivated those owners to come and seek veterinary care and that those treated dogs duly responded to therapy. So these big data provided insights on disease occurrence. And indeed, we can think about how similar um, approaches could be used to capture information about the efficacy of treatment on this or other particularly chronic disorders in companion animals. Uh, next slide, please. So the second um, case study I wanted to talk about quite quite quickly was to, to illustrate um, use of, of, of data from a completely different domain. Uh, and we've been uh, interested over the last year or so to look particularly at the idea of gaining insights into um, evidence that we gather through social media. Now, social media is a big and messy place. Um, there are thousands and thousands of, of things that people have chosen to share out there on a whole variety of different websites. And trying to, to pick one's way through it is, is quite a challenge. But to my, our mind, the reason for doing this is that it provides a unique insight into owner perception. What are people telling each other about their cats? Not what are they telling the vets and not what are they saying in surveys? So whilst there are all sorts of biases in terms of the people that choose to say these things, the one thing that it doesn't have is the bias of um, an, an observer or a researcher asking questions that they have thought of in the first place of those people. 
And we use this information to get some ideas into um, what the, the patient pathway and perspective was on, on flea eye and puritis this time, or on, on cats. And the, a few common themes that came up from looking at this were things like the fact that owners recognised that there seemed to be no standard treatment, that owners were very frequently frustrated because they didn't know the cause of their cat symptoms, um, that they felt there were poor outcomes with a wide range of different medication, and there was a lot of seeking for advice and for um, uh, other uh, uh, home remedies, etc., that might be used, and that frequently, uh, despite attention, um, symptoms continued to get worse. And we can also see that this had uh, an impact on what we might say about the emotions and the state of mind, uh, both of the cats and the people around them. So the cats were disturbed, they were upset, they weren't behaving normally, and that caused a lot of worry and concern to, to, to their owners. So by having a, a snapshot into owner perception, the important part of this, I feel, is it demonstrates something about the, the, the demand and the need, a, a bit like the bottom-up approach um, that Professor Van Schaik was talking about earlier. And that information can be fed into understanding a variety of things, such as, well, are treatments doing what they want? Um, are clinicians, veterinary clinicians, asking people the right questions? And how are we sharing information and addressing the concerns of this owner population that's out there? Uh, next slide, please. Um, again, perhaps uh, with, with more commonality with um, the matters that were just being discussed with, the reside, with respect to the, the DECIDE consortium, um, we're also working at the moment um, in a consortium with SIUC and um, with um, uh, two companies called Robo Scientific and, and Innovent, again in collaboration with Zoetis, to uh, look at um, health of growing pigs. And basically what we're doing here is we're using two technologies. Um, we're using... Um, 3D cameras that are suspended permanently over the pens of pigs uh, in the study, and we're also um, using a what you might call an electronic nose, which is uh, designed to detect um, explicit and specific um, volatile expired um, gases in, in expired air from the pigs in order to uh, identify uh, syndromes or pathogens that may be involved. So we're using these basically to look at ab aberrations in behavior and aberrations in the um, gases surrounding these pigs in order to make um, early detection of disease ahead of the time that it could be done by the, by the stock person. Um, we are at the moment implementing this on uh, two farms in UK as a um, we've gone beyond proof of principle, but to make sure that it operationally um, works in a variety of different pig environments, and then we'll be implementing them on a number of, uh, of different units um, that belong to a large integrated enterprise in UK uh, in year two. Uh, very much looking at, um, let's have the next slide, please. Yeah, very much looking at how we can take these different sources of data, and of course we'll be taking production data um, from the farms as well, onto our DIHA platform um, in order to then uh, develop machine learning algorithms and predictive analytics to notify uh, risk of early disease. And then we'll be creating a dashboard uh, that will be used to alert the, the farmer and, and their vet uh, in order to share that evidence with them. And of course, the, the key part of this is that the early detection is only going to be useful if it allows early intervention. And if that early intervention leads to things like reduced antibiotic loss um, and improved animal welfare, uh, going forwards. Uh, next slide, please. So um, in summary, then, um, our experience in terms of, of, of using data, using our DIHA platform, is, is that firstly, we have to think very much about what is the value? To whom is this analysis, to whom are these insights going to provide something meaningful? And what are the parameters that enable them to, to um, validate this? So Really, we can think about the volume, the quantity of data that we've got that informs decision, the velocity, how quickly we get it, the variety, the number of different sources we can, we can uh, derive it from, and the veracity. And if we can meet those four Vs, then we meet the big uh, five, fifth V, which is ensuring value and ensuring our projects to del deliver that to the relevant stakeholders. Last slide, please. And with that, I'd just like to uh, thank you very much for, for your attention. Um, there are more information available on the um, on the web, and also a quick plug that we are doing um, a, a webinar for uh, people across the globe to know some of the opportunities for interacting with the whole of the animal health community based around the Surrey area in the future, if anybody wishes to look at it. So thank you very much indeed for your time and attention, and it's been a pleasure and a privilege to be with you this afternoon.
Thank you, Alex. And I think your last slide was actually a nice wrap up of that, because for me, one of the big questions about all of this area of data is what's the value of it and what are we going to do with it? Um, I, you know, I think in a in a regulatory context, in an industry context, in a One Health context, that is the, the question for all of us is what are we going to do with all this data and how is it going to help us deliver on animal health, welfare, impact on disease, etc. Um, I know we've had a few questions in the chat, which some of the colleagues have answered online. Um, Katerina tells me we can, we've can we got time for a few questions. We can run over by a few minutes. So I might see if anybody would like to raise their hand and ask a question live actually as a first step. If not, we'll go back to what we've got in the chat. So is there anybody on the phone in the room in the EMA who would like to ask a question to any of our speakers? If so, please raise your hand. We don't have raised hands, so you no raised hands. Chat. So let's let's take a, back, a look back through the questions online. So I I saw that one of the first ones we had um, where are we back through the chat. <laughs> um, right. So we didn't have any initially for the EFSA colleagues. Um, uh, there was first one from Rick for um, Dr. Campos as to whether the um, Animus um, data is it use data. Or currently only sales data, so that's for our Wuhan folks. Yeah, thank you, Kat. I will. Uh, yeah, I should have clarified during my presentation that for the moment the data we have are collected from sales and imports to the countries, and the reason of that it was first of all to ensure we could collect as many as much as many data as possible at the moment because we we could see the difficulties for getting this information, but this is something. We are working on trying to get field data. So at the moment, WOA is identifying those countries or members whereby there are some research or monitoring programs to detect antimicrobial use in the field. And we, WOA is ensuring that this data, it's that focal points, that these are the points that report to WOA are aware of, the, of this so that the information can be provided in the near future. So, you know, it's work in progress, but I think we started very well doing the uh, antimicrobial uh, use from imports and sales, but then moving forward to field data. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Rick, does that answer the question? Did you have, want to ask anything further? Yeah, no, that's that's perfect. Thanks, Kat. Great, thank you. Um, the next one was another one for, for Woha, this time for Lena. Um, uh, the notion of epidemic intelligence um, and the question was to, uh, could you briefly describe what epidemic intelligence is and the main tools you use it for? Um, I know you answered in the chat, but I think it's useful for everybody else to hear the answer. Thank you very much. Yes, so um, epide epidemic intelligence can be defined as the systematic collection, analysis and communication of any information to detect, verify, assess and investigate events and health risk with an early warning objective. So I think it goes back to um, also the last presentation that we have that now we are in a world where we have a lot of data already collected by a variety of systems, especially on, 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 the, on health, uh, on health events. And what we're trying to do is always um, prioritize the information for early warning. And really, it's for decision making on policies about prevention and control. So this is the, really the goal and to avoid disease spread, of course. So what we are doing in WOA is part of the epidemic intelligence is, at, is really uh, performed by the countries themselves because we have this early warning system where they can spontaneously send uh, alerts that are then published uh, publicly and sent to other countries to alert on exceptional events that constitute a risk. And in parallel, we also in WOA perform some complementary uh, activities. So we're looking at uh, other types of in information circulating on the web and also information that our networks have, like our network of uh, expertise, the reference uh, laboratories network, or WHO, FAO, other international uh, intergovernmental agencies that they have, and we share constantly information. And uh, we also do um, uh, internal assessment of uh, prioritization of the information and, and um, risk uh, rapid risk assessment so that we are able to detect um, an, uh, events that require early warning. And um, 
uh, and all these processes are documented on the website. So I posted the definition and also the the links to the to the explanatory uh, web pages. And and so this work that we're doing in WA is really um, done at the organization level, but also um, we do it at the what we call the quadripartite level. So us with WHO for the public health uh, side, FAO that is complementing our uh, information for the animal health side, and uh, and then we also now involving UNEP. So it's the um, United Nations um, uh, organization responsible for environmental health. So they are also able to detect early signals there. Voilà. So there's a lot to say, but uh, <laughs> voilà, you can contact me for further information uh, if you, you want. No, that's a great explanation. Um, uh, the next question we had was for Professor von Schaik as to whether or not the Decide project or the University of Utrecht were working with WOHA on the global burden of animal disease assessment. Um, so I, Lena could maybe comment as well, but Professor von Schaik. Yes, I also answered it in the chat. Yes, we do. We are uh, a collaborating centre for WOHA uh, in the GWAP pro, um, programme, and we are currently carrying out um, a case study on dairy cattle. Not a collaborating center um, is the Norwegian Veterinary Institute, and we, they do a case study on uh, salmon. Brilliant, thank you. And I think all of these things are a real nice examples of how that integration of these different data systems and data sources are useful, and um, they're useful for policymakers, for the OIE, the FAO, etc. But they're also very useful for us as industry to help us understand what the needs are for medicines, how our medicines are being used, and where we can do better in the use of medicines and to go to where Professor Cook was talking at the end, also in, in the companion animal space around the decisions that veterinarians are making in terms of prescribing decisions, when to retreat, etc., which can all improve the way in which medicines are used and hopefully the efficiency of, of the way they work. Um, do we have anything else? I didn't see, Katerina, I think those were the main ones in the chat that I could see. Um, Correct. Obviously, all the presentations are going to be available for everybody. Um, if so, I think we're probably good to hand back to you guys in the room in Amsterdam for a wrap up. But fantastic presentation from everybody. It's been fascinating. And if, if nothing else, I think it shows us the huge amount of potential from big data, and the huge amount of work ahead of us once we get through the, the initial challenges of the new legislation. But it, it clearly, you know, to the questions that were asked at the start, industry. I don't think we need any incentives to engage with this. It's, it's just uh, what are the right targets right now for us to work with? And there's a huge potential opportunity there for everybody. Oh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Kat, for for that and, and for excellent uh, uh, chairing of that uh, last session. Uh, we're overrunning a bit, but uh, uh, I think that's OK. Um, and then to me, the thankful uh, uh, task of trying to summarize today and, and, and look back at it. And in fact, uh, uh, you did it already, Kat, by saying, you know, it offers great potential uh, and, and let's continue on that road. But I, I would like to say a bit more than that. Um, going back to the, the, the first stakeholder meeting that we had last year, where we, um, where we invited people from, from all sides um, trying to bring an appetite to everyone to really say, you know, this look at what we what people are doing on the human side with big data or on totally areas that were not related to veterinary medicinal products. I think this year uh, we were able to put together a program focusing indeed on um, really veterinary science, um, uh, disease control, uh, looking at use cases for medicine. So I think that is that's really showing uh, the, the progress. Today was really more about trying to present to you the use cases and what can big data offer us really um, in that regulatory uh, framework. I, I take note of what uh, uh, Rick said in his presentation that um, we are in the middle of the implementation of the uh, VET regulation uh, and that uh, it may not be the right uh, time for the industry to invest heavily in this, but actually it was the the new veterinary regulation that triggered the thinking uh, about looking at big data in the sense that we are collecting uh, quite a lot of data there and it would be really a waste if we would not put those data to the best use possible and start thinking about how can we connect the data um, and how can we uh, 
uh, optimize also data quality in UPD pharmacovigilance systems, uh, collecting data on uh, antimicrobial sales and use. Um, this is all, uh, we have to do it anyway, so uh, we have to think also about how, how can we make the best use of it, and I think big data there is absolutely what we need. So I think overall since last year the awareness on big data has increased and, and the coalition of the willing uh, is, is growing uh, and, and with today's event we, we've, I think, I hope we've strengthened stakeholder engagement and the collaboration and we appreciate the very active discussions. Uh, it, it's always difficult in a remote uh, situation because we all know that most of the discussions do happen during the coffee breaks and we're missing that aspect right now. So hopefully in the future we can bring that aspect to these meetings as well. Um, in session two, we heard important benefits and applications of data as examples guided by practical use cases, but also some areas for further reflection and, and the challenges that, that, that we identified already last year that, that need to be overcome, like data ownership, infrastructure, interoperability, uh, expertise within the network, uh, lack of resources and conflicting priorities and incentives. But I don't think that should stop us from keeping looking at, at what we can use uh, the increased amount, increased amount of available data to generate more and better evidence for regulatory medicines. And I mentioned that we will uh, set up a program um, that will uh, try to establish a data catalog to get a good overview of where the data are sitting, who has ownership and how we can uh, use those data. And in fact, today, Already, we have seen some of the examples of data that are more or less in the public domain or that could potentially be shared uh, and that could be used for uh, uh, the, the regulation of uh, medicines. Session three uh, included interventions from uh, UN international organizations showing how collection, integration, analysis and communication could support animal health and welfare and, and also uh, uh, public health. So the data landscape in animal health is increasing fast and, and we need to ensure that our regulatory decision-making model adapts and is prepared to overcome these the challenges that we have identified. We need to embrace the opportunities for data-driven, evidence-based, robust decision-making that will underpin innovation, as mentioned by Rick as well, uh, for the development and authorization of all market safety and effectiveness monitoring in medicines in a rapidly evolving data and, and analytics landscape for the wider benefit of animal and public health. And, and, and Peter Arlett's presentation this morning clearly showed how that is advancing at a very fast pace on the human area. And, and I think we should look at that and not copy it, but use uh, whatever uh, we can see there and, and bring it to fruition on the veterinary side. Um, the, uh, I, would, I would like to... Uh, a quote from the, the Big Data Steering Group, uh, uh, the following, uh, saying, we must not disrupt a functional regulatory model, which is delivering robust and proven secure decision making, which is, I think, what we have. But equally, we must not be afraid of change, which, if managed and implemented appropriately, will ensure that the EU regulatory system is ready for the challenges of the future. I, th I think that's a, that's a message that I that I want to share with you uh, now, I think it's important. I think um, with all that, um, I would like to thank the speakers, the moderators and the audience for active participation and useful contributions uh, for the discussions. Um, looking forward, um, we do plan to try and summarize today's meeting and see if we can uh, bring it to the public domain, either by publication on our website or possibly in, in, in a journal. I think it's worth uh, sharing what has been discussed today, um, supplementing uh, the discussion of last year. And obviously, uh, this is not the second, uh, well, it's, this was the second uh, meeting, stakeholder meeting, but it implies that there will also be a third stakeholder meeting for which already I would like to uh, invite my neighbor here to uh, chair another session, which she did perfectly well. Um, so we plan that for uh, towards the end of next year. I hope we can, can make that and keep you informed on how this uh, field is progressing and, and hopefully really uh, 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 
bringing uh, to the table then achievements um, that we will realize in 2023. And with that, uh, I would like to close this meeting. Uh, again, thanking you all and wishing you all uh, a very happy afternoon. Thanks a lot.